Yeah, I got practice on. Um, Check one, two. Check one, two. Check, check. Check one, two. Test for Supervisor Mitchell. This is a test for Dr. Christina Galley. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, boss. Oh, yeah. This is a sound check for AT and T. Can you hear me? Sounds good on this end. Great, thank you, John. This is a challenge check for Dr. Ferrer. Can you hear me? Yes, this is a uh, uh, sound test for Dr. Ferrer. Can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. This is a sound check for Kevin McGowan. Can you hear me? This is a sound check for Sherry Todorov. Can you hear me? Hi, good morning. This is Sherry. Thank you. Good morning, Sherry. Sound check for Emilio Salas. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, hi, good morning. This is Emilio. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Mr. Salas. Thank you. 
Good morning. Yeah, and I'm by the way, I'm having a little bit of a, an issue with my system, my docking station. So I may need to um, call in from a different device if we can't square it away in the next few minutes. Okay, noted. Thank you. Good morning. This is sound check for Supervisor Kuehl. Good morning. Here's my sound check. Check, check, check. Good morning, Supervisor. Thank you. Thank you. This is a sound check for Kevin McGowan. Can you hear me?
background check for the Spanish translator. Can you hear me? Sound check for Supervisor Barger. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can good morning. You hear me? Yes, Supervisor. Good morning. Thank you. Are you sure? Can you really hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> I was just checking. Thank you.
Happy New Year and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, which is being held remotely. Today is Tuesday, January 11th, 2022. Please note that Supervisors Solis and Han will not be in attendance today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take roll to confirm attendance. Please unmute your mic and get ready. Supervisor Kuehl. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'd like to make it very clear to those watching, I'm not wearing a mask because I'm completely all alone in my own house. Um, and good morning, and I'm here. Good morning. Thank you. Supervisor Barger. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year to you both. Chief Executive Officer Fisha Davenport. Present. County Council, uh, Rodrigo Castro Silva. I'm here. And Executive Officer of the Board, Celia Zavala. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, if you'll join me as I lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please stand and place your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As indicated on the posted agenda, we'll be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. The Executive Office of the Board received 50 written public comments for today's meeting, and as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act's requirements. We'll continue to receive written public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, set matters, S1 and S2. Item S1 is a report by the chief executive officer as appropriate department heads as necessary on the status of the American Rescue Planning Funding and consideration of necessary action. Item S2 is a discussion and consideration of necessary action on the public health order related to COVID-19 as requested by the chair of the board and the status of COVID-19 vaccine. On page three, special district agendas. This is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. Item 2D is a recommendation to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of tax-exempt multifamily housing mortgage revenue bonds and an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $25,600,000 and a taxable multifamily housing mortgage revenue bond and an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $10,700,000 to finance the site acquisition, construction, and development of a 90-unit multifamily rental housing development to be located located in the city of Los Angeles. Item 3D is a recommendation to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance, sale and delivery of tax-exempt multifamily housing mortgage revenue bonds and an aggregate principal amount not to exceed uh, $20,258,943 and a taxable multifamily housing mortgage revenue bonds and an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $6,616,874 to assist Mercy Housing California LP to finance the site acquisition, construction, and development of a 68-unit affordable housing project in the city of Long Beach. On page 7, this is the agenda for the Regional Park and Open Space District. On page 8, Consent Calendar Board of Supervisors items 1 through 20. On item 2, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On item 3, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. This includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item four, Supervisor Mitchell requests to revise the appointment to sanitis Sanitation District Number Nine by appointing Supervisor Hahn instead of Supervisor Kuhl. Also on item four, Supervisor Hahn will be abstaining from the vote on the appointment for Sanitation District Number Nine, and Supervisor Barg will abstain from voting on the appointment for Sanitation District Number Seventeen since they have a personal financial interest because they would receive a stipend for serving on these districts. On page six, uh, on item six, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be held. On item 11, item 13, and item 18, these include revisions as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 21, administrative matters, items 21 through 63. On items 39, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 44, 
This includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On items 61A and 61B, Supervisor Barger requests that these items be held. On page 45, ordinance for introduction. On page 46, separate matter. Item 65 is a recommendation to approve the issuance of a short-term bond anticipated notes in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $55 million to finance acquisition of various equipments through the county's capital asset leasing corporation. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you. Moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Barger to approve these items. Such will be the order. We'll now take public comment for all agenda items. Executive Officer, please read the call-in information that was provided in the agenda and explain the speaking rules so members of the public who are calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-336-4437 and use participant code number 136-6786. To repeat, please call 877 877- 336-4437 and use participant code number 136-6786. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 and follow the instructions. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which agenda items you wish to speak on. We will allocate 90 minutes for public comment on all of the items. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on an agenda item, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on a topic or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speakerphone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. You can now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Mr. Interpreter, you may have yourself muted. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Okay, moderator, may we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Eric Previn. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. I'll do both. Uh, I'll address several items, including 3, 5D, 61A, a uh, whole list. And then I'll also give a general public comment. So how much time will be afforded? You have two minutes and 45 seconds. How much time? Uh, 45 seconds for all that, for the, including my general public comment? Yes, please begin. How much time? 
you have How much two time minutes, will I have? And you have two minutes and you have three minutes. Now you have two minutes and 31 seconds. Okay, I appreciate that. Jesus, I mean, what you, very rude after taking a nice holiday. Wow, unbelievable. Really, really bad. But okay, let's move forward. 61A, I was wondering why we're sticking the Mark Anthony Brown versus County of Los Angeles, with Los Angeles lawsuit on the green sheet, which means supplemental agenda with very little time to study it. This was the FBI informant who the sheriff from 2011, 2011. So nice try, but a million dollars? Wow. I mean, that's like Sachi Hamai money, and she didn't even file a claim. So I appreciate that. Let's get some good legal advice, okay? That would be a good area. And where that was decided was up in the claims board. Claims board is comprised of Arlene Barrera, the John Namo replacement, who is the auditor controller who has not been able to locate Skip Miller's invoices by multiple requests, Adrian Byers, longtime county counsel, and Steve Robles, who's the risk management guy, a very decent man who is extremely hemmed in by the way the CEO and the county council limit access to public records are important. Like, what is Skip Miller making? He's the guy who's conducting the on its face absurd lawsuit that should be handled by in-house county council, obviously not. We've already paid him one point X million. Now he's staying in for another round with a guy who is leading the lawsuit for Vanessa Bryan, who used to work at Munger Tolis Olson, Sheila, the great county law firm. This is almost like an inside baseball to make Skip look like they, of course, Skip's right. The sheriff's department and the, the idiots who took pictures have dealt with it. It's done. There's no ongoing trauma. She never saw any of the images, but why are we paying Skip to manage this? Absurd. He's totally conflicted. Anyway, um, moving on, 290 grand for the retaliation discrimination by the sheriff's department lawsuit. It's a different one. Uh, Carrie Kouser. And then you've got, if I can, it's just an endless supply of dirty little settlements. I find it very, very upsetting. Um, and I also see on this agenda a lot of on-call. Let's go to the panel of firms where this is squelched to small business participation, FYI, okay? And everybody knows it. And I want to just draw your attention to the, the one where you're looking curiously, uh, Madam Chair, for a way to handle RVs in, quote, hotspot areas. First of all, don't like referring it to Excuse me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Diana Sale. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you address on general public comment. Let me begin. Um, I was told that the general uh, public comment for the realignment of the prison system would be today. I don't have an agenda member, I'm sorry. So it's a general public comment that I'd like to make. Um, while the state and the county is reimagining the criminal justice system, what that means for the citizens of Laverne is that you're reimagining our community and our homes. Now, this camp that you're proposing to turn into a level four prison was put in years ago before the homes in the area were built. And we, at the time our home was built 20 years ago, went to the facility to understand what type of juveniles and what type of crimes they had committed would be in our backyard. And now what you're proposing is to change that on us. And we have built our community based on what this camp Excuse me, proposed. your time has expired. And it next speaker, please. Our next participant is Andre Zinbeck. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And also, if you'll be addressing a general public comment, you may begin. Yes, good morning, supervisors. This is a general public comment uh, with an associated kind of history lesson. Uh, myself, uh, Tanya, the wife, and a 97-year-old elder parent with the, that is Alzheimer's patient live in a small horse community in the unincorporated area of Chatsworth. That would be Supervisor Barger's uh, area. Uh, we had one way in and one way out up until the last rainstorm, and now we have no way in and won't, no way out. So um, all the families up here uh, are basically trapped with no way in and no way out of their houses. Now, this can all be traced back to a 1999 um, 
agreement between the county and the Toll Brothers that was developing all these multi-million dollar homes to limit access to the east way out and then restrict our access, which we did have at that point, to the west. So at that point, that leaves us with no way in and no way out of our property since we're restricted by this 1990 agreement uh, to the west. Excuse me, your um, time has expired. Next yes. speaker, please. That's not true. Our next participant is Aurora Pedro. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I apologize. Aurora, one moment. Your line did not open. You are open now. You may begin. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. I'm calling um, in support of item number 13 to support Indigenous families and children engaging with Department of Children and Family Services. I am the coordinator of the Center for Indigenous Languages and Power at Cielo, an Indigenous women-led nonprofit in South Central that works jointly with LA Central and South American Indigenous communities, particularly around expanding access to services and information by reducing language and cultural barriers. Today's motion is, historic, is a historic step for LA County toward recognizing and addressing the long unmet needs of Indigenous communities who often struggle to access services because of demographic miscategorization and inability to obtain vital information in their spoken language. Yella wants to extend its gra uh, deep gratitude uh, to the leadership and partnerships of Supervisor Solis and Han, and we look forward to working with this board and the entire county government to ensure that all residents, regardless of their language or background, can access the services they need. Yosh, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Izzy Mancada. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, um, good morning. I'm Izzy Mancada. Um, I will be speaking on, on number seven. I'm a young leader with the LA Opportunity Youth Collaborative. And I am here to show support on item seven. Thank you, members on the board and Supervisor Berger for putting forth the motion. I was a foster youth and it was hard for me to get my my documents and it made it really hard to get a job and other things. So this motion holds them accountable for their change, for their charge. Once again, thank you for the board of supervisors. Have a great day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. I'm Roy Humphreys. Uh, items will be 2 in uh, general comment. Uh, item number two, the Carson uh, uh, sewage spill is tradition. Sewage spills along the coast have been an annual event for decades. Item 15, Human Trafficking Prevention Month is a cruel joke. As a sanctuary county and a sanctuary state, you are the five queens of human and sex trafficking with Gavin Newsom as kingpin. 45, as uh, related to the traffic regulations in the unincorporated areas, the CHP has requested renewal of the radar enforcement search without which they cannot enforce the speed until they reach in the residential until they reach 65 miles per hour. County uh, James Yang, said speed match, which is clearly third world, uh, Roland Heights meeting last night. We uh, note supervisors and others use the term uh, people of color, of course, never to pander. We note that uh, Hispanics have been the dominant ethnic group in California since Cortez. It is said that Hispanic students can't pass tests because they are racially biased. Hispanic leaders from Sacramento to LA say they need special treatment. As to Afro-American students, I will leave that you to invite William Harrison, 40-year teacher of low-performing schools in living in uh, Walnut. Uh, then we have the uh, Asian Chinese who are born or 
come to this country, learn English, take any and all tests in English, and blow the academic curve to a puff of smoke. Now they suffer a second Asian Chinese Exclusion Act at universities and colleges. We have met the enemy, and he is us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Janet Martinez. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and if you will also be addressing on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, good morning, supervisors. My name is Janet Martinez. I'm calling in support of item 13 to better support Indigenous families and children engaging with the Department of Children and Family Services. I'm the um, co-founder and executive um, vice executive director at Comunidades Indígenas de Liderazgo, Cielo, and we provide um, language access to Indigenous communities, and we feel that it's very important given the new data that we've come out of our uh, findings, where we see that there's a linguistic diversity in Los Angeles that is not currently being met. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Joy Ori. Please state the uh, regular agenda items you are addressing, and if you'll also address some general public comment, you may begin. Thank you. I am addressing general public comment today. As a resident of Santa Clarita, I'm extremely concerned with this board's upcoming decision of where to house the DJJ males. Let's face it, these are not young children, these are young men. The least disruptive option for their care and supervision is to use Barry J. Nidorf and put in place enhancements to support the LA model. The most disruptive option is to use the outdated low-level camps in Santa Clarita and Laverne. These locations are not safe for the incarcerated. Escapes happen, and these locations are not safe for surrounding family neighborhoods. The October 1st report of the California Board of State and Community Corrections specifies the renovations needed for Barry J. Make it a win-win for the incarcerated and the residents and communities of Santa Clarita and Laverne. We remain opposed to using outdated facilities close to family neighborhoods and communities. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kimberly Green. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, my name is Kim Green and I'm calling to make a general public comment about the Secure Youth Treatment Facility site selection process. I've reviewed the Pro Probation Oversight Committee's scorecard and found errors in their assessment of Camp Page in Laverne. On their criteria having to do with proximity to family, Camp Page, which is 49 miles on average from youth families, is scored the same as facilities that are 18 to 27 miles from families. Camp Page, whose nearest bus stop is three and a half miles away, is rated the same on access to public transportation as facilities that are less than a half a mile from a bus stop. On fire hazard, Camp Page sits in a wooded area with single road access that's burned before, yet it's rated the same on fire access as facilities and areas that haven't burned and have multiple points of access. I'm very concerned that these scoring errors are masking serious flaws with Camp Page and Laverne, and I'd like to get them fixed before a final decision is made. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Tim Hepburn. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing and whether you address some general public comment. Let me begin. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. Um, you have a decision to make uh, very soon regarding the permanent SYTF DJJ Youth Facility, Laverne, Apple Ball page sites have been put on a short list for your consideration. We respectfully ask that they be removed off the list for consideration. We have as a community for decades between David and Margaret, Leroy Haynes, and Apple Ball page have been helped hundreds of girls and boys become good contributing individuals to individuals society. We feel that to change what Apple Ball page was designed for is not for the better of the DJJ youth. We better serve the Barry J. Knight, our facility. They currently have a SYTF DJJ youth there now. This is a closer facility for their resources, family services. The site would be cost effective for modification as it currently serves these youth. This would be a perfect site for the new goals of the commission and DJG oversight for the new reimagined image of the juvenile justice system. Thanks for your consideration on this very important issue to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Robin Carter. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address some general public comment. You may begin. 
This is under general public comment. This is Laverne City Councilwoman Robin Carter. I'm voicing my opposition to converting Applebaugh Page Camp into a secure youth treatment facility. Our Laverne community stands strongly together on this topic. I believe that you should invest in Barry Nightoff Juvenile Hall because the DJJ youth are already there. This is the only option with the least disruption to the continuity of service and programming. The county must renovate night off so that it's suitable to combine minors as declared by the California Board of State and Community Corrections. Renovations and changes are already identified and documented. Transforming night off at this time is an effective use of valuable resources that meet state requirements, including the state's new requirement for the county to house DJJ youth. It's a better use of our taxpayer funds. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Dale Coleman. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing and if you also address on general public comment, you may begin. On the general public comment to Dale Coleman, <clears throat> sometime soon the DJJ will ask supervisors to vote on a location to house what will ultimately be upwards of 150 youth offenders up to 25 years old who have committed violent crimes, including rape, arson, armed robbery, and murder. We ask the board ops to transform the Barry J. Nordoff facility to fulfill this mission. The state of California has mandated that the county must renovate Nidorf regardless of the outcome of this decision. By selecting Nidorf, you provide consistency for the incarcerated youth, eliminate most transportation issues, and make the most effective use of taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Odelia Romero. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing, and if you also address some general public comment, you may begin. Uh, good morning. My name uh, is Odilia Romero. I am calling in support of item number 13 to better support indigenous families and children engaging with the Department of Children and Family Services. I am the executive director and um, co-founder at Cielo, an indigenous woman-led nonprofit in South Central that works jointly with LA Central and and South American and Indigenous communities, particularly around expanding access to services um, and reducing the language and cultural barrier. This motion is historic step for LA County toward recognizing and addressing the long unmet needs of indigenous communities who often struggle to access services because of the demographic miscategorization and inability to obtain information in their spoken language and because they, uh, we often get confused by Latinx and because there is an assumption that anybody that comes from south of the imposed borders speaks Spanish and that is not true. Cielo uh, wants to extend its deep gratitude to the leadership and partnership of Supervisor Solis and Han and we look forward to working with this board and the entire county government to ensure all residents regardless of their language, background, legal status can access the services they need. Excuse me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one and zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para decirse la punta, si, si uno lo ha hecho, presione uno luego cero en este momento. No presione uno luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Our next participant is David Goldstein. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you, supervisors. This is general public comment. As a resident of Santa Clarita, I am also strongly supporting the choice of the Barry J. Nidor facility as the best location for the placement of the DJJ population and strongly opposing further consideration of Camp Scott and Scudder. The data that has been presented is clear in this regard. Camp Scott and Scudder pose significant environmental risks to its residents due to its placement within high wind, high fire, and flood zones and frequent loss of power issues. Camp Scott and Scudder is also extremely remote and would further isolate the population from their community, which has been stated as an important component of the rehabilitation. 
I urge you to remove Camp Scott and Scudder from further consideration and make the data-driven selection of the Barry J. Nidor facility as the most appropriate facility for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Irene Vasquez. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I'm addressing item 17. I am in favor of the resolution to declare January 28th Professor Juan Gomez Quinones Day because he was an extraordinary public educator and civic leader. He had a strong sense of respect for human life and civic society. He believed that people working through organizations could improve the conditions of life for the most vulnerable. His early analysis of higher education and K-12 education led him to commit a life to rethinking and reforming public education. Professor Juan Gomez Quinones had a prodigious research and scholarship record. His formative role in the co-implementation of the Chicano Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA grounded Los Angeles as a center of study for Chicana O and Latina O peoples. He encouraged and supported hundreds of leaders in the areas of electoral politics, health, education, business, and the arts. He spent his life paying homage to the greater east side of Los Angeles. The biggest lessons he left all of his students and friends were never give up hope, never leave things to chance, and never give up hope. Thank you, supervisors. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lily Brainerd. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And if you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, um, Supervisor. My name is Lily Brainerd, citizen of Laverne. I strongly uh, oppose DJJ location will go target to uh, uh, Camp Patch in Laverne. Because uh, I get through all those meetings and then some missing information is about the fire risk. On the website, National Fire Protection Associates, that area is red, it's not yellow. It's a very big fire potential. Think about the young, young juvenile come here, include Austin. Who's going to take the responsibility if something happened about white fire? We even heard about the resident in that area, they said insurance, Wi-Fi insurance couldn't really uh, qualify. So it will be a very, very extremely big risk for fire risky. We, we demand the request safety report for the fire in that area. So, and then also the budget to this program to go to real service, not go to the update of uh, all facilities. That's the tax dollar. You don't go to a 20, 20 million dollar, go to update to a uh, yell. That money to go to really service to support the young, the young juvenile. So, Excuse me, your time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Teresa Bouchard. Please state the agenda items you are addressing today. And if you will address them in public comment, you may begin. Yeah, good morning. I'm addressing public comment. I'm speaking, speaking regarding Camp Scott being transformed from a probation camp to a maximum security prison. As a resident of Santa Clarita since 1984, in the past 18 years in the neighborhood next to the camp. I feel it's pretty irresponsible to put this facility in a residential neighborhood. According to the scoreboards, Camp Scott scored the lowest possible score on fire and flood. We would require many improvements to house the youth. Also, it would be dangerous not only for the residents, but the staff and inmates if evacuation is required. Both Key Canyon is one road in and one road out. There are three schools in the radius of this location. Also, the school bus stop at the camp driveway is where the kids got off the bus to walk to their homes coming from school. We can all agree the system needs fixing. It would be more beneficial to the inmates and staff to invest in improving Barry J. Nidal. It is much easier for families to visit and the staff are already well trained. Camp Scott is miles from the nearest freeway and the only access to the camp would be through local neighborhoods. Excuse me, your time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Pam Barry. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and if you will address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. I am, uh, this is public comment, general com uh, public comment regarding the secure facilities. Um, the scorecards that were released recently, uh, key points I'd like to make is that the scoring cards are flawed. Uh, Laverne Applebaugh Page is in a severe fire risk 
according to LA County maps, but they were scored yellow versus red. Uh, many of us in the uh, area adjoining that area, about a mile or so away, we can't even get new policies for fire. Transportation is three and a half miles to the nearest bus stop uh, up a steep hill. So Adam Bettino mentioned twice shuttling up the steep hill, and that would make it red, not yellow as scored. Uh, distance from the families and support system, also incorrectly scored. It is not equivalent to the other locations on the list, but is at the farthest extreme eastern end of LA County. I highly recommend using Barry J. Nidorf as it is already uh, closer to the families, less disruption. Uh, they've got all the services nearby and far less use of, of taxpayer money. Excuse uh, me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Genevieve uh, Chabrel. Please state the regular agenda okay. items you are addressing with your address in the public comment. Yeah. You may begin. Yes. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Please Hello. begin. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Please yes. begin. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Hello. Yes. This is Dr. Genevieve Chabrel. You know, it's time that you try to reopen to the public. It's unbelievable that you are still close to uh, to the public, and you are violating the Brown Act right and left all the time. So I have research very concerned, and that needs to change. And uh, I just hope that today you seriously think about at least meet every week, not every other week, and to reopen to the public. Take care. I hope that everybody is fine, but we need to move forward. Bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Cody Hunanian. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing, and if you'll also address on general public comment, you may begin. Hi there, I'd like to uh, submit a comment for uh, agenda item 14. Uh, my name is Cody Hunanian. I am the executive director of the Student Debt Crisis Center. Uh, we have about 2 million supporters across the country, and we have about several hundred thousand here in the state of California alone. And uh, I want to put strong support for agenda item 14, an awareness campaign uh, for federal and state student loan forgiveness programs. We educate and organize millions of student loan borrowers each and every year. Uh, and for years, we've watched as the Department of Education and Servicers have failed these borrowers. Until recently, SDC and a few allies uh, solely filled the gaps of these fees and accessible resources. Uh, today, there are new credible voices, including state and local governments, who can fill in the gaps with additional information. Uh, this proposed awareness campaign um, would assist tens of thousands of LA County residents, and we support it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Allison DeLuca. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm here to voice support of agenda item number 14, the awareness campaign for federal and state student loan forgiveness. My name is Allison DeLuca and I'm the executive director of the Southern California College Access Network. We're an alliance of 110 organizations supporting the college and career aspirations of low-income, first-generation students of color. Together, we work with directly with 150,000 students and families in LA County. Every year, tens of thousands of our students are graduating from college and entering the workforce. A large percentage are seeking careers where they can give back to the communities. In some cases, they're returning to their organizations that help them go to college to pay it forward for the students coming after them. Others are becoming public interest lawyers, social workers, and city and county employees. However, they are often entering these fields battled with student loan debt. Despite good intentions, the pathway to access public student loan forgiveness to date has been a complex maze riddled with sinkholes. Staff members of our organization who are versed on federal processes have tried numerous times to make it through the process without success. However, Excuse me. There's an your time has expired. The level, and this is next speaker, huge please. Opportunity for us. We our next participant is Jamie Cruz. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. 
Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm providing general general comments support of agenda item 17, proclaiming Professor Juan Gomez Quinones Day on January 28th. This proclamation will acknowledge the educational and community contributions Professor Gomez Quinones made throughout the county of Los Angeles. He was beyond a towering figure in the field of academia. For over 50 years, Professor Gomez Quinones was a distinguished professor of history at UCLA and one of the few tenured professors at that time during his initial hiring. He, re he retired in honorable status in 2019. Gomez Quinones, Professor Gomez Quinones made a tremendous impact on the lives of youth and university students by promoting higher education, emphasizing the importance of ethnic inclusivity and serving as an extraordinary role model for people of color. Professor Gomez Quinones committed his life to serving others, specifically those who are on the margins. Kindly support proclaiming Professor Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones Day on January 28th. He deserves this day and more. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Bruce Groff. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> uh, my name is Bruce Groff and I'll be commenting uh, on the uh, general public uh, comment uh, piece. I'm a resident of Laverne, and I highly oppose the relocation of DJJ uh, incarcerated population into the two camps in Laverne. I'm at short walking distance from both camps and very familiar with the area. I wrote uh, an email to the board last night uh, 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 highlighting the issues with safety for the workers, uh, and the incarcerated at those two camps, should there be fires or other emergencies, there's simply one very small road for access. Uh, and I think it puts all those people in danger. You increase that population, there's more people in danger. The other thing I want to address, which I haven't heard anybody mention, is the elephant in the room, which is what happens to our property values? They're going to tank. Uh, uh, knowing that there's a full prison it, it, hundreds of yards away from from our community. I, I, I think it's outrageous to, to consider uh, Apple uh, Bow and, um, and the other camp um, when we're such close proximity to, to residents uh, and uh, schools, parks, and whatnot that uh, will be negatively impacted by a decision to put more people in those camps. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jason Gibbs. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, I'll be speaking on general public comment this morning. Good morning, Chair Mitchell and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Jason Gibbs. I'm the Mayor Pro Tem for the City of Santa Clarita. I want to express my support that the population formerly under DJJ supervision be placed at Barry J. Nydorf Juvenile Hall, where renovations to enhance rehabilitative treatment are already planned and which will ensure the greatest level of stability and continuity in service. Additionally, I'd like to also express my support for Campus Kilpatrick to be used as a permanent facility for the population formerly under the DJJ supervision, in addition to Barry J. Nydorf Juvenile Hall, as Campus Kilpatrick offers a non-institutionalized environment and programming to adequately rehabilitate those who are in greatest need of rehabilitation. Both of these facilities will offer this population the resources needed to rehabilitate and become productive members of society. Thank you for your time and consideration of my comments and have a great day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Dr. Alvaro Huerta. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. I'm speaking on item number 17 and general comment. I'm Dr. Alvaro Huerta, I'm a Cal Poly Pomona faculty member and a fellow at Harvard University. 
Uh, I'm speaking in favor of item 17, proclaiming Professor Juan Gomez Quinones uh, day on January 28th. I would like to thank the supervisors, especially Solis, Supervisor Solis for introducing this motion. As eloquently stated by my colleagues, Juan Gomez Quinones was a towering figure in the Mexican American community. He was a warrior, scholar, activist. He was a trailblazer. Uh, we're talking about someone who grew up in Ball Heights, uh, like I did in the 1950s and entered UCLA as a freshman in the late 1950s and later receiving his master's and PhD at that same prestigious university. During his graduate years at UCLA, he was able to draft or be the lead author in El Plan Espiritual de Aslan, El Plan de Santa Barbara. I could go on and on and encourage everyone to, to read the proclamation, but at the end of the day, Juan Gomez Quinones was our warrior. He was our prince. He defended the Mexican American community in a time where anti Mexicanism is rampant. We need more people like Juan Gomez Quinones. We need the young people to see that someone that looks like him was able to become a tenure professor at UCLA, was able to write books, was able to write poetry, was able to support and be a family man, a family person that supports immigrants, not as people that are strangers, but are people that who are familia. In terms of general comments, I would love for the Board of Supervisors to not only recognize Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones for January 28th on his birthday, but also to name libraries after him, to name buildings after him, to name streets after him. We need more people of Mexican origin to be recognized officially by the county, by the city, who has the city also proclaimed Juan Gomez Quinones by the state and the federal government. So Excuse me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. In, in our next participant is David Matthews. Please state the regular agenda items you will address today, and if you will also address on general public comment, we may begin. Hi, it's Dave Matthews with the North Harbor Gateway Chamber of Commerce. I am commenting on agenda item number three on the consent calendar, addressing the RV encampments during COVID-19. Uh, we are in support of agenda item three with Holly Mitchell's uh, office. We as a chamber have been working with Holly Mitchell's office. Prior to that, it was Mark Ridley Thomas, uh, his office, St. Joseph Center, Compton Century, and uh, Compton, the Compton Sheriff Stations from Century and Compton, the CHP, LAPD Southeast, Gardena PD, Union Pacific Railroad Police, LADWP Security, La Sahopix, Harbor Interface, LA County Fire, and LA City Fire on the complicated RV uh, situation. We mainly work in the unincorporated LA County area known as East Gardena. The complicated boundaries here have created the perfect black hole for the criminal activity. As a chamber, we've housed 17 families who were living in the RVs over the course of the last year. Businesses are being negatively impacted and are now all working together to find solutions. I would ask that you include LA County Fire and LA City Fire uh, included in the process. They oftentimes are the first responders to someone having a medical issue in an RV or a fire being set. Excuse me, your time has uh, expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Don Hutchinson. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and if you will be addressing a general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, it's a general public comment on the youth camps placement. Um, I live in North Laverne, and addition, nobody wants that close to their house, but. I hear 14 youth need to be moved. What's the maximum that can go there? I, I haven't heard that number because I know it'll grow because of the soaring crime that we have here. It's hard to trust public officials. I mean, Mayor Garcetti and Governor Newsom endorsed George Gascon. He's gotta be the most disliked guy in Southern California, the no bail jail. You turn on the 11 p.m. news and it's a horror show with the murders and pursuits, smash and grabs, shootings, follow homes, gangs, et cetera. So this facility needs to be placed in a rural area because these, these are gonna be some bad kids. It's already hard to put somebody in jail. They release people for all kinds of things. And now they're talking about um, you know, releasing uh, armed robberies, kicking them down to misdemeanors if there's no injury. So please um, 
find a rural spot for these that needs more money than get it from the state. They're the one that's pushing this down our throats. Excuse me, your time has expired. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press 1 and 0 at this time. Do not press 1 and 0 a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la junta, si uno lo ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. We have our next speaker, please. Our next participant is Danita Bilchamp. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. This is for general public comment. I'm extremely disappointed because no one from the POC, DJJ, JJRBG has provided any type of written or printed documentation explaining the reimagining program to inform the surrounding communities with their objectives and goals for these youths. POC Commissioner Mr. Lewis stated that it, quote, take a village to help raise the youth. How can we invest our time, effort, labor, and love when we know nothing about this program? I would also like to point out how he villainized the Laverne residents as NIMBYs and that is far from the truth. City of Laverne currently has three locations that assist and accommodate these types of youth. David and Margaret Home for Females, Haynes Leroy Boys Home, and currently the Afroball Page Camp, which is used for lower level offenders. Our city has done much for the improvement of juvenile lives and forced the remaining 707B level four offenders to be housed within our city, is asking the city of Laverne to carry the water for the entire Los Angeles County in regards to the permanent housing of these youth and adult offenders. At what point do the other better suited existing locations become a viable option. Why were the residents of Santa Clarita not villainized and called NIMBYs when they made the same exact comments pertaining to their neighborhood and safety? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lucy Hahn. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and with every, whether you will address on general public comment, you may begin. Uh, good morning. Please approve item three, requesting an RV encampment report back. This is Lucy Hahn from community nonprofit Friends of the Jungle. I'm a 15-year resident of Playa Ray. Yesterday, we dropped off 500 letters with wet signatures to Supervisor Mitchell. These constituents are pleading to have the RVs moved away from Bologna Wetlands Ecological Reserve. We have over 70 RVs that are parked on Jefferson Boulevard and Playa Ray and destroying the wetlands. People living in their RVs bathe and defecate in the marsh. In March, the RV caused a five-acre fire, uh, five fire in the wetlands. Firemen were not able to get to the fire hydrant because an RV was blocking it. In August, four people were shot here. Having the RVs here is not safe for anyone, including the homeless. It seems there's a meth lab in one of the RVs as well. Nature classes are no longer held here because it is too dangerous. Public rec recreational spaces are declining in our urban environment. Please help us preserve our wetlands for all to enjoy. Please approve item three. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Tracy Gonzalez. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. I'll be speaking under general comments as a Laverne resident to oppose a Camp Afrobot page being reimagined under the Secure Youth Treatment Facility. As you've heard many of us state already, this facility, while being rated higher than others in some areas like fire hazards and community proximity, is not acceptable. For the safety of the young adults and staff you will house there when there is a fire and our community of families are very close as well, closer than your own report state. I urge you supervisors to, to direct your staff to look into these flaws if you are going to use them to make your decisions. The probation department said they were anxious to select a, to select a facility so they can shift their focus on reimagining the programs, but don't let incorrect data and a rush to make a decision make it a bad one especially when you already have a facility better suited in Barry J. Nydorf already at your disposal. We are a passionate community and we will continue to speak and make sure you're aware of the issues with the facility, uh, Aprobot page that are being incorrectly laid out to you, uh, supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eric Harris. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address a general public comment. You may begin.
Eric Harris, your line is open. You may be muted on your side. You are open to address the board, sir. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Gilbert Ivey. Gilbert Ivey, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on regular general public, public comment. You may begin. Thank you and welcome. Um, thank you for welcome to the conference. Um, flat out, case to the point, Mary J. Nordoff, Juvenile Hall, is the one that should be chosen by the county for the juvenile justice youth and become an example of transformative youth justice in Los Angeles County. The youth already there. It supports and provides continuity to their rehab. It offers reimagination dollars that are there for a facility that's already there and secure, and it's a better use of taxpayer funds. It's the best long-term strategic solution that helps the most youth, not Laverne, and I even joined my brothers and sisters, Santa Clarita, neither there. Mary J. Nidor is the place to go. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Donald Harlan. Please state the regular agenda items you will be addressing and if you will address on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, my name is Donald. I'm here in Los Angeles. Uh, I wanted to, I have several agenda items and general public comment. Uh, first of all, uh, agenda item number 1D. Uh, I would really look at the uh, contracts the county is making, the contracts you guys have with uh, different companies. Uh, they're related to political candidates and organizations and businesses in other states that are robbing us here in California. Uh, we guys really need to hold back on making contracts and deals like that. Uh, I would really take a look at some of these companies. Uh, they're, they're a real problem. Number 2D, uh, vacant land. There is no vacant land in the United States or California, none. Every inch of land is owned by somebody. Number 2D, 14533 Lenart Street. There is no such thing as vacant land. Who's doing that? Uh, uh, I'm a little concerned about them doing construction and for 3D, I'm a little concerned about them doing construction in Long Beach. Uh, if they're selling bonds, or whatnot, there's a lot of uh, illegal construction. Number 6D, LACDA does not need any sanctioning. Number 7D, um, you know, I, I'm a little worried about LACDA uh, getting too much power. There's people in there trying to uh, construct on other people's property illegally. Uh, people in there that are power mad trying to uh, uh, sell things that don't belong to them. Uh, they re we really need public attention, public scrutiny. The LACDA really needs public scrutiny. Um, and uh, they're, they're trying to uh, declare open spaces. There's no such thing as open spaces. Every piece of property is owned by somebody, but they're not interested in that. They just want to build themselves an apartment building. Number 21, um, there's, a runaway, there's a problem with runaway housing in Palmdale. Uh, uh, over there in Palmdale Boulevard. Um, okay, uh, number 24, 26, 28. Uh, number 28 especially, online auctions. Uh, you guys got to be careful about the county and doing online auctions. You know, they don't even form the owner of the property or whatever's going on. There's just some fool in the government over there trying to sneak out auctions, trying to sell people's property behind their back. There's a real problem. You know, uh, they, there's no secure transactions. You open the county assessor reports and it says the, it's been modified. There's a warning. It says somebody in the county tried to modify this. It doesn't say, uh, uh, you know, you guys, you guys did secure transactions. It says normal transactions. So online auction sales, that's a big no-no. There's a, something really wrong. People doing internet real estate, uh, they just minted a thousand new millionaires. And now they're all going to get unemployment. They, they have a big pyramid with the billions of dollars. Excuse where me, your time has expired. Real estate to Next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press 1 and 0 at this time. Do not press 1 and 0 a second time or you will be removed from the queue. 
You will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no la ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from line of Donald Harlan. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Next speaker, please. And next we're gonna to go to the line of David Aber. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm David Aber. I'm a senior who has disabilities and I have been a, had my civil rights violated by both the fifth district supervisor, Catherine Barker's office, as well as LACTA, L-A-C-D-A. The non-compliance and the non-accountability. They've acted in bad faith and they continue to trample on my civil rights. So, uh, Medina Johnson Jennings, as well as Tracy Mann from LACTA, and Tyler Cash and Anna Maradian from uh, Supervisor Vargas' office, uh, also her staff in Lancaster, who have repeatedly violated my civil rights. I've left 30 messages for the supervisor over the past year, and never received a call back, and this is no longer acceptable. It's time for the non-compliance and the no accountability to stop. This is bad faith and I'm tired of not getting straight answers. Um, as recently as the 20th, uh, Fifth District Supervisor's Office has promised to do things. They don't even return calls. Excuse me, your time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thanks. Our next speaker will come from the line of Sue Fisher. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Sue Fisher. I am commenting on um, general comment regarding Camp Scott and Scudder. My home is an investment in our lives so that we may not be dependent on anyone. It also needs to be a safe place to live, especially as we age. That is the reason we brought our children to Santa Clarita. We have rights when we purchased as we purchased it. The prisoners have their rights, however, from the comments I have heard and seen written from them, we are they feel we are uninformed. We are very informed. We have made hundreds of informed decisions in our lives and thus landed where we are. When one makes an error, you have to look it in the face Correct your error and move forward and take whatever comes with it. Let me say that the problem is not ours to drop in our lap in the middle of our neighborhood. I don't disagree that they need a new plan to have a way to move forward. That is not our job or my job. I have done my job and many of my neighbors have done those. Move those who have made grave errors in their life to a safe place for all of us, a good place that is developed for them, possibly Afaba, and let them learn to live among themselves and take care of their own environment. Teach them to take care of what they have now and then move forward. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Linda Disrosiers. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, this is Linda DeRosia. I am former um, resident of Laverne and now live in San Dimas, I strongly recommend that you remove Camps, Offenbach, and Page. Uh, this does not, this will not uh, be tolerated. And use the Barry J. Nydark Juvenile Hall location. That makes the most sense from a program and financial point of view. And also it benefits the youth for the entire commitment time, not just for a short period of time. And it's the best long-term strategic solution. And also the property values will definitely go down. Buyers will not buy homes located in a community with facility that houses convicted violent offenders. That's a reality. Like it or not, the harm you will do will put our residents and nearby communities at a disadvantage to continue to live as we do now. The conversion of these camps will make it a financial hardship for the residents. So 
So please reconsider, remove the cans from the list. We think your goals without impacting the families that worked hard to obtain what we have now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come to the line of Lita Summerand. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, good morning. I am commenting on general public comment. Uh, I have a son who is a client with Arcadia Mental Health. My son is homeless, living in a car with congenital heart disease and other serious heart conditions, along with mental health. My son has family support to assist with his wellness. The facility refuses to provide the correct level of care and to include the family as a support system. Last speaking with the therapist, his comment was, do what I have to do. So I'm coming to the board for assistance, and we would appreciate your assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from line of Susan Carrazzo. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, hi, I'm calling uh, to comment on general public on the youth facility in Laverne. Um, I just want to echo all the other people that are opposed to it. Uh, bus stop is too far, freeway is too far. It's a fire area. There is a narrow road going in and out. Uh, the area has changed from a farmland and citrus trees to a residential. There's hike trails. And I think the city of Laverne has already done a lot to help youth and uh, to put another burden on the, on the city and to put people or these people that would stand at Bill 823, juveniles convicted of murder, arson, and other serious crimes can be housed in this facility is dangerous to the local community. And I appreciate and thank you for listening to me. And it's submitted with and, and respectfully. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from line of Tina Henry. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'd like to just discuss general comment, please, regarding the camps in Laverne. Um, I agree. I think it's a very bad idea to put these camps in Laverne and the residential areas, the fire areas, and one way in and one way out. No one has mentioned the kids that live in that area. I grew up in that area. And as a kid, it's pretty scary to be out front playing or in and out of your home and getting an alert or a message or a knock on your door that there's been an escape. I think um, it needs to be rethink, uh, rethought about. I think it needs to be reconsidered. Um, I think that Laverne is definitely a no. It does affect the way the kids in the area grew up back then in the 80s. But I also think now that you want highly violent criminals who are not kids any longer put in that area, I think it'll be a very bad mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And as a reminder to address the board, if you've not already done so, Please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la junta, si aún no la ha hecho, presione uno luego cero por este momento en este momento. No presione uno luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Joe Gibaldon. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is uh, Joseph Gabaldon and I reside in Los Angeles County. I'm calling in to address some public comment regarding the site selection of the proposed final Department of Juvenile Justice facility and where I wish to express my support of the choice for Barry J. Nidorf. This existing and currently operating location can most effectively and efficiently serve the community. I ask those making this decision to focus on the reimaginative opportunity at Barry G. Nidorf to make this the transformative youth facility required by all in Los Angeles County. Additionally, it's more central location in the county and a more commercial and not resident occupied location 
will serve the whole best. It provides the ease of access to the facility in the community by both mass transit and multiple freeways sitting adjacent uh, to major highways being the five and the 210. This very important criteria makes it an ideal choice to serve not only those to be housed at the facility, but their families and the support services required for their success. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Jason Vasquez. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm calling to address item number 14, the Awareness Campaign for Federal and State Student Loan Forgiveness. I'm speaking from the perspective of a young professional who works at a nonprofit. Currently, 3.86 million Californians have some forms of student debt, and 53.4% of student loan borrowers are under the age of 35. Uh, I think it's, it is imperative that every eligible Californian is aware of federal and state student loan forgiveness programs. It's, it's ridiculous that a lack of awareness is leaving millions of dollars out of the hands of California employees. These programs were created to provide relief to those who choose careers that focus on giving back to their community. Um, so LA County, and one last thing, LA County employees deserve to know about their loan forgiveness options. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker comes from the line of Gloria Mitchell. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Dr. Gloria Mitchell. I'm the founder and I'm going to speak on general public comment. And I am the founder and program manager of Joy Youth Services, which has a DBA of Mini Shell, which is a house for homeless women. I'm concerned that these women have been homeless and we got behind because of COVID and we were denied rent debt relief. And so I'd like for someone to take a look at what is happening with housing people who are only where the only the owner gets uh, rent relief as opposed to those who are actually doing the work. And so I'm really concerned about that. And I'd also like any help that we can get to make sure that we keep some of them from putting tents around uh, City Hall and other places downtown, because this is ridiculous. So thank you very much for allowing me to share. And so please consider those who are not homeowners, but who are helping to clean up these streets. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Jennifer Simpson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Jennifer Simpson. I am addressing general public comment in regards to Camp Applebaugh Page here in Laverne. I've lived up in this part of Laverne over 42 years with my husband and family. And I agree with the You've had a wonderful group, our community, you can see very respectful and very educated that this is not the appropriate place to put a high security prison. Our community, um, when they built this prison, everything north of Golden Hills Road was on wells and leach field septic systems. And I do not believe that this camp has even upgraded into the sewer system, into the city. So the cost of developing something even larger up there is prohibitive. Uh, it also I put I attached in a public comment to you our city's uh, wildfire prevention program and it shows the maps of all the fires that have happened around the area and it is probably one of the most unsafe places to put a lot of youth and people there is only two very narrow roads out so the cost and the location would be very prohibitive to have this there. Also, um, your neighbor, Stevens Ranch, they've tried for 30 years to try and improve and build in their area, and they've been denied. Excuse me, your time and has expired. Next speaker, please. Make it through LA County. Thank you. Our next speaker then will come from line of Stephen Laird. He states the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Yes, good morning. My name is Stephen Ward. I'm addressing a general public comment. Uh, I would like to speak like the other residents of Laverne on the secure use treatment facility locations. 
I'm very supportive of the county's efforts to reimagine our youth rehabilitative efforts. I think that providing these folks with uh, treatment, therapy, education, vocational training is great, uh, but we do need to prove, <clears throat> we do need to select the most appropriate facility. My belief that Camp Kilpatrick, where the county has poured more than $50 million to reimagine, is the most therapeutic setting that can provide the greatest services to these youth. Uh, I, I do believe we do need to take into account that uh, as a possibility, and I would support uh, Camp Kilpatrick as the permanent location for the secure youth treatment facility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Oscar Canales. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Oscar Canales, and I would be speaking on item S2 and general public comment. In regards of the COVID-19 vaccine mandate, I would love to address the board and say the distrust, the distrust that is with the lack of transparency with the United States and the public. U.S. officials have acknowledged that there have been dozens of similar experiments in the United States studies that often involve making healthy people sick, an exhaustive review by the Associated Press of Medical Journal reports, and decades of old press kiplings found more than 40 such studies. At best, there were a search of life-saving treatments at worst. Some amounted to curiosity-satisfying experiments that hurt people but provided no useful results. In the vet, in, they will be compared to well-known Tusky syphilis study. In that episode, United States health officials tracked 600 black men in Alabama who already had syphilis but didn't give them the adequate treatment, even after penicillin, penicillin became available. I want to uplift this and say that it, it is reoccurring right now. People are being subjected to either work or get a vaccine. And these are happening in areas of large indigenous and people of color, as you have reclassified us in not only Los Angeles, but New York and Chicago. And this is very upsetting that this is occurring. I would love to be general public. Um, I would love to be able to speak on how for a very, very long time, we have been shunned out from, the, from being able to speak as it was mentioned, and I come from South Los Angeles, and there is no other translation for people. You either speak one language or another, and they do not take into consideration all the people that have been here for generations and generations that don't speak the language. Also, I would love to address all the concerned residents of, that are calling us in Santa Clarita, and Laverne, I would love to let you know that I am one of those children that spent time there. And it is very heartbreaking to see that we are still living divided on these issues of where to place these people. These people are human beings just like yourselves. Don't allow these divisions to blind us, but to be able to unite us and to be able to help the people that for so long have been used, experiment among and have not been taken into to account. Please, me. I urge the your, board to please take this into consideration. Excuse me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. A reminder is to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. If you now press one and zero a second time, you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Next speaker, please. Our next participant will be Teresa Torrance. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Okay. Um, I am commenting on item number three, Supervisor Mitchell's motion to address the unregulated RV encampments throughout the city and ask if this be treated as an emergency situation. 
the large and very unregulated RV encampment in the Bayona wetlands along Jefferson Boulevard, as well as the unregulated encampment on Culver Boulevard under the 90 freeway uh, in District 11, and all other unregulated encampments around the city is a serious health and safety hazard for everyone in the community, including those living in those vehicles. Uh, people living in the vehicles are leaving their waste and dumping septic tanks and some drug paraphernalia on the protected Bayona wetlands. Um, as a previous caller stated, there are no more tours or public um, use of the area. Um, there have been numerous trash and other fires, most notably the large fire back in March of last year, which scorched five acres of the wetlands, killing plants and the species of the wetlands and threatening homes and lives uh, when LAFD could not access a hydrant due to an RV blocking that was not able to move due to a dead battery. Um, many workers whose jobs it is to monitor wildlife and do maintenance in the wetlands now hesitate to go to the side of the marsh near Jefferson Boulevard because um, they feel unsafe. Uh, the area is not safe as residents have witnessed some of the RV dwellers tampering with city electrical boxes to try and tap into the electricity. Um, and there has been high crime in the area. So we hope that the city swiftly sets up proper RV campgrounds in areas in the county that can accommodate such campgrounds to include sanitation, washroom, and other services. So I highly urge the Board of Supervisors to um, uh, to enforce uh, and work with uh, Supervisor Mitchell's motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from line of Harry Fisher. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'll be speaking on uh, general comment in regards to Camp Scudder and Scott. Uh, geographically speaking, uh, this is in a high uh, wildland fire zone in which there have been uh, fires in the past few years that have required evacuation, as well as the flood zone directly downstream from Bouquet Canyon Reservoir. Uh, recently with the uh, rains, uh, there was flooding on Bouquet Canyon and mud rock slides. Bouquet Canyon is a rural two-lane road, north and south, with limited access in all directions, as well as the previous fire that took out the Vasquez Canyon Bridge. Uh, this is not a suitable location for this in, uh, endeavor. There are other locations uh, that have been previously mentioned that uh, are more supportive. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And Chairperson, at this time, we have no further parties in queue. Thank you very much. To ensure that we allow the full 90 minutes for public comment, the call-in line will remain open until 11.10 a.m. We'll take any other callers that come in by that time. We thank you for your patience and stand by. We've got about 10 minutes. Other callers have now called in. Operator? Thank you. Yes, our next participant will come from the line of Kristen McGuire. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Kristen Richardson McGuire, speaking in support of the Student Loan Forgiveness Awareness Campaign. I'm a resident of Covina and Executive Director of Young Invincibles, the nation's largest young adult policy and advocacy organization. We, along with Student Debt Crisis, Next Gen California, Student Borrower Protection Center, and Consumer Reports, have worked tires tirelessly and successfully to bring consumer protections to California borrowers by co-sponsoring the California Student Borrowers Bill of Rights and the Private Student Loan Collections Reform Act. Student debt impacts almost 4 million Californians, many of whom are LA residents. It's important to localize outreach efforts so that the tens of thousands of borrowers right here in our county are aware of forgiveness programs available to them and how to utilize them. We wanna thank Supervisor Solis and the other supervisors for bringing this very important item forward. If you need any assistance, please feel free to utilize us as a resource. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker, please. Our next speaker comes from the line of Sandra O'Dell. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I'd like to make a general comment regarding my opposition of the Department of Juvenile Justice Youth Facility in Laverne. The location in Laverne would be in a high-risk fire area and within a dense community of neighborhoods. I support the DJJ Youth at the Nidor Juvenile Hall that makes sense fiscally and program-wise. Uh, renovations and changes are already documented at NIDARF 
and transforming the night earth is an efficient use of valuable resources that meet the state requirements. It is a better use of the taxpayer funds. And night earth can not only serve those in the facility, but it'll also their families due to its more ideal location. I ask that you please remove Laverne from your list and place night earth as the first choice location. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Kathleen Newton. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Kathleen Newland. I'm addressing a general comment, Paige Affelbaugh, Camps in Laverne. I have two questions. Uh, number one, what is the staff to inmate ratio going to be? And what level of security will this camp be if it is changed? Uh, we are owed this an these answers. Um, what level of security are they going to have? Uh, we oppose the facility being in Laverne to begin with, but I think that we are owed these answers. So staff to inmate ratio and what level of security? Minimum, low, medium, high, what level? Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker comes from the line of Jeanette Song. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is Jeanette Stone and I am speaking on general public comment. I am speaking in, um, in affirmative for using Barry J. Nydorf Juvenile Hall as the DJJ Youth Post adjudica Adjudication not just pre-adjudication, which is now the case. Uh, there are several reasons for that. Um, they're already there. Um, support and continuity. Um, they also make sense fiscally, but more than that, most youth in our juvenile justice system, not just JG, DJJ youth, spend years in the Barry J. Nidorf, as opposed to months when sent to the county camps. Selecting Barry J. Nidorf benefits the youth for their entire commitment time, not just for a short period of time. It's the best long-term solution that helps the most youth. Most youth. Uh, we already have a list of the changes that need to be made to that particular site. So it just seems to make sense that it would be the least disruptive to these youth to have a consistent place to be that imagines all of the things that we wanted to do when we voted for these things. So um, we're very um, passionate about this, that we want these youth to have the best experience. And I've listened to all the calls about all the people who have talked about the programs that will be available and that's extremely exciting. And I think what we need to do is put it in a place where it's close to um, transit and close to um, the people who will be visiting them, as well as a facility that we already know what we need to do to it. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Nikki Diekman. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'm Nikki Diekman. I'll be commenting on item number six on general public comment. I am a resident of North Auburn, and I'm vehemently opposed to having um, Hanch, Camp Page selected and in favor of Barry J. Nidor. Um, one of the things I was reading in the print report says that nearly all the camps are on the outlying areas of the county, often cutting off youth from their families and community support networks for the duration of their confinement. Another thing that's pointed out in the PERT report is the lack of quality community-based services and genuine community engagement, saying that it's a significant issue within the probation department. Um, as far as I'm aware, there have been no cooperation with our public services, fire, police, city, or any employees. One of the things to consider is the lack of public transportation to this facility and 
um, how far it is from Los Angeles and the location of probation officers that would need to commute for work, as well as families that would be visiting these youth. Currently, the camp supports grades seven through 12. Our understanding is that it will support ages 18 through 25. And this would include violent offenders in the neighborhood. I have three young children, ages 11 through 15, who regularly traverse the trails, ride their bikes, and engage in school activities at the local golf course and the trail. This would be a detriment to them as well, and it would affect their ability to enjoy the services outside. One of the other things that's been mentioned multiple times is the fire zone and the fire hazard. We as a community have not received any paperwork or any documentation, and it's almost impossible to find online about the reports that identify whether this particular location is suitable um, based on all of these conditions. I, as Excuse a me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. All right, thank you. Our next speaker then will come from the line of Katrina Del Valle Thompson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Katarina Del Valle Thompson, registered nurse, SEIU 721 director, speaking on behalf of David Green, president of SEIU Local 721. And I wish to speak on agenda items S2 and public comment. Please begin. Good morning, supervisors. We represent LA County's 7,000 registered nurses and 16,000 allied health workers of the Department of Health Services. For 20 months, we have been on the front lines of this pandemic. We are heroes and sheroes, but we are exhausted and overwhelmed. The California Department of Public Health new guidance allowing hospitals to force COVID positive nurses and others to treat patients is outrageous. We are tired of hearing state public health agencies and hospital managers call public workers essential, then turn around and treat us as disposable. Omicron is raging. LA County is ground zero. If LA County insists on accepting the CDPH guidance and forces COVID positive nurses and others to treat patients without proper safeguards, they are inviting a public health disaster. At a minimum, the county must limit hospital access and visitation, cancel and reschedule non-critical elective surgeries and procedures, allow COVID positive workers to isolate and recover, ensure paid sick leave is extended beyond the current expiration. Finally, it's time to recognize that years and years of short staffing and county departments is coming home to roost, not just in health services, but DCFS, DPSS and others. We cannot short staff departments contract out work to private corporations and depend on nurse registries and traveling nurses and expect to weather crises like these. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eric Harris. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. I will be speaking on items number three and general public comments. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Eric Ades, and I'm the Senior Manager of Homeless Systems Change with the United Way of Greater LA and the Home for Good Initiative. On behalf of UWGLA and Home for Good, I am glad to express our support for item number three, the most in addressing recreational vehicle in cabins during COVID-19 recovery. Uh, people experiencing homelessness in RVs face unique challenges, including risk of break-ins and victimization, and RVs used for long-term shelter often lead to habitability risks fire dangers and operational breakdowns. Specific strategies and solutions are therefore necessary to outreach to and engage RV dwellers and ultimately connect them to safe, stable housing resources. One of these solutions is the expansion of designated areas for RVs, including safe parking, which we called for in our 2020 document, the street strategy for LA County. In this plan, we also call for strategies to incentivize safer vehicles through replacement, repairs, and buyback programs. To be clear, RVs can provide critical shelter in a jurisdiction that lacks sufficient housing and shelter resources. Any solution for uh, the challenges presented by people experiencing homelessness in RVs should be person-centered and never lead to criminalization or coercive displacement that only further complicates someone's housing status. 
Therefore, we are encouraged that this motion calls for the identification of best practices and data so that we can be sure that the urgent need for strategies to address RV homelessness is met with evidence-based, trauma-informed, and person-centered solutions. We ask the board to swiftly advance this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mr. Chair, there are currently no additional speakers in queue to address the board. Uh, again, to allow for our full 90 minutes, we'll wait until and keep the lines open until 1110 in case any other callers choose to call in. So please stand by. As a reminder to address the board, if you've never already done so, please press one zero at this time and then do not press one zero. Second time, you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no la ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Our next participant is Andre Zimbeck. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Again, this is general public comment. Uh, first, I want to say listening to all these serious problems, my my heart goes out to all these people. And then my, my prayers go out to the supervisors that are trying to solve all these serious problems. But I'm, what I'm calling about is our one, again, our one-way access into and out of our property was washed away by the the last rainstorm. So we've got uh, four families up here in the Fernand Falls area that are trapped with no way to get groceries, obtain medical care. I have a 97 year old parent. We have horses that we need to feed. In about two weeks, people are gonna start running out of food with no way to get additional groceries. So we need some, we're almost in the crisis mode right now. We need some help. Uh, we're doing all we can, but we need some government help to try to solve this issue. It, all dates back to 1999 when the county vacated our access to the west to the toll brothers and the, and the people that were building all the the homes in the area so i'm reaching out again to supervisor barger and i want to publicly thank one of her assistants jason marcuda has been very helpful and also diane aranda who are the only people that really have really shown any empathy and uh, try to help us out everybody else in the county planning department of building and safety has been almost rude to the point of uh, not helping at all. We understand it's our responsibility to maintain our roads. We can't even do that. If we close our one way access in and out, we have no way to get in and out again because of this 1999 agreement. So if excuse me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Here and visit, that would be our next participant is Kelly King. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Kelly King and I wish to address item 14, the awareness campaign for federal and state student loan forgiveness. Thank you to Supervisor Solis for this incredibly important motion. I lead post-secondary programs at the California Community Foundation, including the largest community-based scholarship program in LA County. The California Community Foundation applauds and supports this motion. Existing student debt relief opportunities for government and nonprofit employees are not well known and full of confusing requirements. This has become a broken promise to nurses, teachers, firefighters, and nonprofit staff to serve our community. Through an awareness campaign as proposed by this motion, we estimate that tens, and thousands, tens of thousands of Los Angeles County residents may realize hundreds of millions in loan forgiveness. Yet without your actions, we worry these programs will continue to be unknown or inaccessible. Thank you again to Supervisor Solis and to the board for leading on this topic and recognizing the critical contributions of public servants in our region. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is James Fleetwood. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address the general public comment. You may begin. Uh, general public comments. <clears throat> I'm James Fleetwood. I've been a resident of Laverne for over 42 years. I'd like to reiterate the comments of our mayor, city council persons, and citizens. 
The study of the viable locations for the juvenile adult offenders appears to be flawed due to issues with fire, transportation, and location. The uh, Barry J. Needoff and Camp Chilpatrick seem to be the clear options for the relocations and the treatment of these youth and adults. Uh, thank you to the Board of Supervisors for listening to my comments. Thank you. Our next participant is Deborah Johnson. Please state the regular agenda items actually, you are addressing. Actually, op you operator, I'm sorry. Our time for public speakers has ended. We've uh, reached a 90-minute point. Um, so we want to thank all of you who've called in to speak. And if you were unable to provide your comments during our designated uh, 90 minutes, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda. We'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will be part of the official record. Executive Officer, will you please indicate the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting today? The following items are before you, 1D through 7D, 1P and 2P, 1, 5, 7 through 60, 64 and 65. Item 4 will be tabled for later in the meeting. Great. Thank you very much. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Mitchell to approve these items. With the exceptions noted by the executive officer, executive officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Kill. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you. Before we move on, I want to thank all of the members of the public who took their time to call in and participate in today's meeting. We appreciate it. So today we'll begin with set matters, items S1 and S2, then item three, followed by items two and six, which will be taken up together, and finishing with items 61A and 61B, which will also be taken up together. We will begin with uh, item S1. We'll now hear a presentation from Fiji Davenport, the Chief Executive Officer, and Emilio Salas, Executive Director of the LA County Development Authority. Again, this is the presentation, our standing presentation, on the American Rescue Plan funding report. Ms. Davenport. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, Honorable Board of Supervisors. Uh, Ficia Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Today I am joined by Dr. D'Artagnan Scorza, Executive Director of our Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative, as well as Emilio Salas, who is our Executive Director of the LA County um, Development Authority. So today's presentation on the American Rescue Plan will be the second in our series of regular presentations to your board regarding the progress of this initiative. During the first presentation, we spent time setting the stage. We talked about where we have been in terms of developing the phase one ARP spending plan. We talked about standing up our internal infrastructure to document and track the county's performance against both federal and board mandated equity metrics. And we also talked about some of the bumps along the road as we endeavor to develop programs that comply with the complicated ARP funding requirements. We also touched on information about the board's mandate in terms of an equity focused implementation plan. This includes streamlining our solicitation process and ensuring transparency and accountability through public facing dashboards. The information presented in these presentations represent only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the behind the scenes work underway to design, develop, and implement our funded programs and the information associated with that work. We want to ensure that we are providing the information in the most useful way possible during these presentations. So in our future presentations, we will start by addressing issues raised during the last presentation for which the board has requested follow-up. I will provide the board with a general status update on where we are with planning and implementation. And then we will turn the presentation over to a department to take a deeper dive into a particular program or particular set of programs. Can we have the first slide, please? <clears throat> This slide simply shows what we intend to cover today. I will address the follow-up from the prior board meeting. Dr. Scorza will address the items that are listed uh, two through four, 
And then we will close with Emilio Salas, who will discuss uh, rent relief, our past efforts, and providing a historical perspective on our rent relief efforts, and then the current ARP funded efforts. Next slide, please. Now some follow-up from the last board meeting related to ARP, Care First Community Investments, and the current solicitation for a third party administrator. During our last meeting, we talked about the ways that the board approved ARP spending plan intersected with the county's Care First Community Investment Programs. Specifically, your board sought information about our use of a third party administrator to move funding to community-based organizations. Today, I want to describe two important components of that process. First, I wanna talk a little bit about the intersection between the ARP spending plan and the Care First Community Investment Spending Plan, both of which were approved by your board. And then second, I wanna share where we are on the solicitation for a third party administrator to administer these funds. So first, let's talk about the intersection between ARP and funding from the CARE First budget. <clears throat> In 2021, your board approved funding for the CARE First programs, totaling approximately $188 million. Of this amount, 100 million covered programs, which were recommended by the CARE First Advisory Committee and covered by the CARE First budget. The remaining $88 million covered programs which were not recommended by the advisory committee, but which were nonetheless aligned with the Care First model. So that explains the intersection between ARP funding and the Care First budget. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about our solicitation process. Just by way of background, since last summer, my office has taken the lead to solicit a third party administrator to implement various programs funded by the Care First budget and the ARP budget. A core objective of this effort is to ensure that small businesses and CBOs in the communities intended to be served by these Care First and ARP investments will have an opportunity to directly participate in and benefit from the work rather than fund organizations with little or no connection to the communities being served. When we issued the third party administrator solicitation last August, and although we were not required to do so, we added to that solicitation five ARP funded programs totaling $40 million. That means that as originally conceived, the third party administrator solicitation called for the administration of 11 programs totaling $57 million. Six of those programs were recommended by the Care First Advisory Committee totaling 17 million. And then we added an additional five ARP funded programs totaling $40 million programs which were consistent with the Care First model, but once again, funded by ARP. The initial solicitation process resulted in an impasse during negotiations and the solicitation had to be canceled. To address the many lessons learned during that initial solicitation process, last November, my team released a revised solicitation that focused more intentionally on Care First funded efforts and one ARP funded program. Collectively, these programs address core care first principles, including reentry support, career pathways, and supports for youth. Narrowing the scope of the work of a third party administrator will allow a closer, more purpose driven partnership with the third party administrator that will be ultimately selected <clears throat> than the prior solicitation, which covered a wide diversity of programming. So in terms of the solicitation, what will be different? What is changing? As shown on this slide, we are re-soliciting the third party administrator services. Upon successful completion of this process, there will be no change to the number of programs administered by the third party administrator, those programs funded by the Care First budget and which were recommended by the Care First Advisory Committee. So those six programs totaling $17 million will continue to be funded by the third party administrator once selected. The number of ARP funded programs administered by the third party administrator will change from five to one. And so the question is, 
what happens to the remaining four programs. The remaining four programs will be administered by county departments. The county departments will administer the programs and partner with community-based organizations to deploy the funding um, to community-based organizations. At the end of the day, the overall number of programs and the funding will remain the same, but not all of them will be administered by a third party administrator. And as mentioned previously, departments will work directly with CBOs to implement programming. A good example of this is the Trauma Prevention Initiative, which is currently administered by the Department of Public Health. That program will remain with the Department of Public Health the Department of Public Health will coordinate the activities, but the interventionist and the program implementation will in fact occur through a community-based organization. As shown on the slide, proposals are due later this month, and we expect to have a final contract in place next month with funding opportunities for small CBOs and businesses by April. I am aware that questions surfaced about changes to the number of programs to be administered by a third party administrator. I hope this information helps clarify any questions that your board may have had prior to the presentation, as well as any questions that may have surfaced with the CARE First Community Investment Advisory Committee. If there are no questions or comments from your board, Dr. Scorza will continue the presentation, starting off with a discussion of the ARP program requirements. Supervisor Barger, would you like to hold your question until after the full presentation or start now? Yeah, yes, Madam Chair, I'll wait till the whole Thank presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Scorza. Thank you so much, Ms. Davenport, and thank you so much, Madam Chair. Good morning, board. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, this slide is in response to questions the board raised, your board raised regarding the federal requirements and what is needed to comply with ARPA um, funds. Uh, he, here is a summary of federally mandated and strongly reported requirements, strongly re recommended requirements outlined in the state and local fiscal recovery funds compliance and reporting guidance, as well as the board's motion passed on July 13th, 2021. What's important to note is that these requirements necessitate a high level of preparation, planning, and pre work, which takes time. It's an incredible amount of work for our departments, and it is uh, uh, materially different from the CARES Act. Adhering to these requirements also ensures that the county will be able to get resources to communities most highly impacted by the pandemic, as is intended by the funding and by your board's ongoing and increasing equity commitments. This will also allow us to streamline allocation and disbursement of these dollars uh, on the back end. As an important part of this work, CEO is engaged um, uh, in due diligence to ensure that there's alignment between the board's directed program requirements and federal requirements. This also allows us to, to capture the correct data and ensure that information that we're collecting will be populated to the public facing website and dashboard for your directives. Next slide. This week, the Treasury Department released the final rule regarding corona, coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds program under the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and in the final rule, uh, the final rule that was adopted um, uh, is based upon the interim final rule published on May 17th in 2021 with amendments. The provisions in the final rule are effective April 1st, 2022, uh, and amendments made to the interim final rule primarily clarified eligibility and took away some barriers to funding, leading to increased flexibility for funding allocation. Next slide. Now, learning by doing, CEO has been aware of ongoing contracting barriers cited by community-based organizations. These include a lack of awareness of funding opportunities, limited capacity to navigate lengthy application materials and processes, and once awarded, challenges to comply with complex compliance requirements. We also recognize that sometimes CBOs note that fiscal solvency can be threatened by a cost reimbursement payment model and expensive insurance requirements. Your board's approval of the first phase in tranche one of funding was to ensure funding relief and direct investments in businesses, organizations, and residents. As a result, the county is making deep investments in communities hardest hit by the pandemic and focused on getting dollars out of the door and in the hands of those who need it most. 
What's important to note is that to respond to these barriers, we're working very hard to build countywide infrastructure and support to strengthen contracting opportunities, as well as increase notification and visibility of funding opportunities, along with streamlining county contracting processes to ensure agencies success once funded. In response to your board's request to increase notification of available funding opportunities and direct services to small businesses, the CBOs, uh, and, uh, and local uh, nonprofit organizations, County Communications um, is working closely to align uh, its uh, uh, contracting agreements through a, through a detailed communication plan. The plan will heavily feature and partner with local media vendors to reach communities most impacted by um, the pandemic. Interested and potential vendors can also sign up on the ARPA website to receive real-time updates so that they know which funding and services are available for which they are eligible and can apply. We continue to build capacity to leverage social media and other channels to broaden our reach and work and are working on strategies to increase visibility on solicitation opportunities at the subcontractor level. Finally, the Center for Strategic Partnership is exploring opportunities with philanthropy and local nonprofit capacity building providers to offer technical assistance to, to CBOs who would like to contract with the county. We are also exploring the opportunity to set aside dollars in phase two and tranche two to provide technical assistance to CBOs so that they can also access future contracting opportunities. Next slide. Now, this slide provides you with an update on where projects are in the design and development, as well as in the review and approval phases. Artie continues to work closely to provide support with departments to develop and approve project designs that comply with US Treasury's focus on equity, as well as this board's directives, and will ultimately lead to equitable investments in communities hardest hit by the pandemic and at greater risk for a slow recovery. To date, 71 projects are in the design and development phase. This entails a process to clarify the goals and outcomes of the project, its potential impact on reducing disparities caused or exacerbated by the pandemic, and how to measure that impact. One project is currently under ARTI slash County Council review, and a total of 11 projects have been approved for launch and implementation, which is nearly 10% of the total $975 million earmarked for allocation during phase one. Artie anticipates several more projects will be approved for launch in the coming week, uh, and we will continue to support departments and do everything we can to provide the technical assistance needed to accelerate their project design process. At this time, I'd like to hand it off now to Emilio, who will, who will lead uh, the next segment of this presentation. Hello, can everyone hear me okay now? We can, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and Honorable Board of Supervisors, Emilio Salas, Executive Director of the Los Angeles County Development Authority. Uh, and before I begin my brief presentation, uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. I simply wanted to acknowledge and thank Fizia and her team for their incredible support of our emergency relief efforts throughout the entire pandemic and your board for your leadership on, on this important issue. We're proud to have launched over 10 different emergency relief our programs throughout the pandemic. Uh, specifically today, I'm going to be talking about our efforts around residential rent relief uh, and small business rent relief. Uh, but in order to provide context for the most recent efforts, I think it's important to briefly review what has already been deployed. Uh, and to begin with, I really want to acknowledge that there probably wasn't any jurisdiction in the country that had any experience deploying emergency rent relief. Uh, and there certainly wasn't any existing infrastructure to deploy that funding. Uh, so it wasn't a surprise that it was widely reported that many jurisdictions across the country experienced huge challenges in deploying rent relief, and we were no exception. But I have to say that this county has not only deployed more rent relief than any other county, it was also intentional about targeting the neediest households and impacted communities. And that really was no accident because even before the rescue plan mandated the equity lens, this board was very intentional about getting relief to the households that needed it the most. So to begin with, we deployed four separate rent relief programs and paid out over $120 million of rent relief to more than 15,000 households. And with the deployment of each program came a set of lessons that we learned. And I really need to thank your board for being extremely flexible in allowing us to modify our program design in response to what we saw that was happening on the ground. So, for example, we learned early on that tying rent relief to property owner requirements, while very well intentioned, 
really served as a significant barrier to getting property owner participation, so we removed them. We also saw that many renters weren't taking advantage of the full amount of relief because a lot of them had incurred shadow debt because they made paying their rent their number one priority. So we pivoted and allowed for prospective rent to be paid. And while the vast majority of rent relief programs in existence at that time capped the assistance at $3,000, the county provided up to $10,000 to the neediest families, which represented one of the most robust programs in the country at that time. Next slide, please. So fast forward to 2021, with the passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the state decided to create its own rent relief program under SB 91 and really made it very difficult for local jurisdictions to opt out and deploy their own. We were geared up with our own infrastructure to deploy the next round of rent relief, but due to that legislation, we made the difficult decision and your board allowed us to join the state program but in turn, they agreed to give us unique access to their leadership team. And this really was key because we developed a very close knit partnership that really went on to pay huge dividends later on. Now they quickly learned from the lessons that we'd already experienced, such as removing property owner requirements and the importance of making direct to tenant payments. So if you recall, it, their program got off to a very, very slow start and after a few months, um, they changed the design of the program and it immediately took off. So prior to the changes made to the program in June, the state had paid out $27 million in the first four months. In the ensuing six months, they have now paid out over $506 million, which represents by far the largest amount of any California jurisdiction and one of the largest, if not the largest, of any jurisdiction in the country. The state has now assisted over 41,000 households and is still taking applications to this day. Now, the figures that you see here do not include the, the assistance that has been deployed in the city of Los Angeles, the city of Long Beach, and the city of Santa Clarita, all of which received a separate allocation. But as you can see, they've paid out all of the $371 million that the county redirected to the state, and they are now committing additional funds that have been redirected from other jurisdictions within the state. In fact, most recently, they issued a press release announcing the reallocation of $62 million from the U.S. Treasury, and they've requested $1.9 billion in additional funds from the Treasury under ERAP-1, and will undoubtedly make a similar request under ERAP-2. We anticipate that if they receive those funds, a vast majority of those funds will come here to the County of Los Angeles. Now we're now working closely with the state to identify the areas that remain underrepresented and to focus the efforts on reaching those areas, which is really no small task given the numerous challenges that we're up against. So we're trying to uh, navigate language barriers, trust barriers, and a perception that some applicants have that they simply won't qualify based on their set of circumstances. So we're working very closely with DCBA and the State House Delay Coalition to redirect administrative fees that we receive so that they can focus resources within those identified underserved areas and use a similar approach to what was used in the county for the vaccination effort, a real grassroots boots on the ground effort to get those underserved areas to apply for this assistance. Next slide, please. Now, as we transition over to the Small Business Rent Relief Program, in November, we launched this project following your board's approval of $7.4 million to fund this project. And as you can see from the timeline, we began accepting applications within a month of getting the funding approved by your board. Now, whenever you're up against the clock to get money out the door, there are always trade-offs, which I'll review in a minute. But as you can see, we began accepting applications in late November. We've conducted the lotteries based on the tiers of need. And in the second week of December, we began collecting the documentation from selected businesses so that we can determine their eligibility. We're now on target to begin issuing the first round of relief checks next week to those that have, been, that have completed the entire process. And we're gonna continue doing so in earnest to get the entire amount of funding out the door in a matter of weeks. Next slide, please. Now, as Dr. Scorza mentioned, we are uh, one of the first uh, departments to use the RD tool to make sure that the funds are directed to the communities of highest need. 
And I want to thank Dr. Scorza for being flexible with us as we were the first department out the gate to use that tool. Uh, and we identified the communities using the COVID-19 Vulnerability and Recovery Index. And as per the directive of this board, the funding was targeted to each tier based on the following percentages with the highest need areas uh, earmarked to receive the highest proportion of funds. Next slide, please. So finally, this slide represents the applications that were received for this uh, latest project within the target areas. Now, there were a total of 2,153 full applications that were received. But as you can see here, only 310 were from the target unincorporated areas. Now, this really speaks to the importance to have a real robust and intentional marketing campaign that includes grassroots boots on the ground approach. And I really need to acknowledge Supervisor Mitchell and her team. Uh, when we deployed this program and opened the portal during the Thanksgiving weekend, um, she pounded the pavement along with her team and some of the other board offices also assisted in uh, the LACDA team to canvas the small business community. And based on that effort, there were 500 local businesses over that holiday weekend uh, that were contacted to raise awareness. And through those efforts, they doubled the amount of applications that were received in the unincorporated areas. But certainly there is a need to still reach out to this community and increase the number of applications, which we may do if there is in a subsequent round. So this speaks to the huge challenge that exists in reaching these high need businesses in high need areas. Similar to the residential rent relief program, there are issues of trust. And just the fact that most of these small businesses have their nose to the grindstone and really to paraphrase what Supervisor Mitchell had said earlier, some of them don't even have time to look up, let alone apply for a government relief program. So in future iterations of, of, of small business relief, I'm really recommending that there be resources allocated to provide the type of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance that these businesses need, not only to access future grants, but also to take their business to the next level. So I wanna thank your board once again for your leadership and your vision to direct this aid to the communities of most need. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you, Madam Chair and Board of Supervisors. Uh, that includes our presentation uh, for this week's um, board agenda. We would be happy to take uh, questions um, and also uh, take your comments as well for future presentations. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me just very quickly say that I'm going to go to Supervisor Barger first, followed by Supervisor Kuehl. Let me just um, express our appreciation. The standing agenda item is so important given the significance of this very new federal funding source with, I love that chart that showed all of the requirements and all the belts and suspenders that go along with this money. It's not just about new money. We spend it how we want to. I think it's very important that the board stay engaged, that you help us understand, as well as the general public understand. They may read in the press that the county got um, these, you know, billions of dollars from the federal government, but to fundamentally understand um, how the federal government has created regulations, how we have layered on top of that, expectations about how these dollars will be spent. So thank you. I know it takes work to pull all these slides and this data together, but I think in the long run, it really serves us and the county well that you spend the time to make sure we get it. So thank you very much. Let's start with Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And I also want to thank Fizia um, for uh, putting this together with, with an amazing team. And I think it speaks volumes when all three of us were nodding our heads in agreement on many of the things said um, during the presentation. And I want to thank you, uh, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, for putting this on as an agenda item. I do think it's important for us to outline not only um, to uh, the public, but also within our own group in terms of how this money is being allocated, because I think transparency is important. And I think it's a good opportunity for us as a board to maintain ongoing dialogue regarding the American Rescue Plan and our efforts um, and our priorities to ensure this money is equitably distributed throughout the county. And I think with today's presentation, that's exactly what you're seeing. I appreciated the update on the final rules provided by the U.S. Treasury. And I am pleased to hear that we have slightly more options in the types of programs and services that can be funded along with more flexibility, which is something that this board has really pushed as well to meet requirements outlined by the federal government. I'd also like to thank Emilio for his update regarding rent relief. 
Um, I think that that's something that we're going to be discussing moving forward. Um, and, and I do have a few questions that I'd like to ask. Emilio, um, real simple. I mean, with the with regards to the state's rent relief program, what is the comparable amount of rent relief that has been given to similar jurisdictions throughout the state? Do you have that breakdown? Uh, I don't have that breakdown in front of me, but I do know that probably the next highest jurisdiction would be the city of Los Angeles. So between the city and county, I believe we are far and away the highest jurisdiction in terms of money paid out. Okay, and, and do we know how much more funding remains available and how long will the state program remain open? So the state has committed to keeping the program open, keeping the, uh, it, the intake process, because it is yet unknown as to how much will be reallocated to the, to the state. We do know that it, it has the most demand by far of any other jurisdiction. And so the first round, of, they received $62 million in, in the first round of reallocation. So the way the Treasury is uh, prioritizing reallocation is they first want the reallocation to happen within each individual state. Then any uh, funds that are left over from that process can go to other states, depending on the need. Uh, we are the state that has demonstrated the most need, so we expect to get the lion's share of the reallocation. Great. And do we anticipate that the state will take any further action on rent relief moving forward? Um, I haven't heard that they are uh, planning to do anything different other than keeping this particular program moving moving forward. Great. And, and, and then last, but at least I, I, this is more of a statement than a question. And, and that is, you know, um, things like what Supervisor Mitchell did going out to the small business and educating them is vital because we, we are really going to have to push this because I've had uh, people call in that didn't realize that they qualified. Um, and my, my comment was to reach out and put in an application. Um, the worst they can say is no, but more often than not, People will qualify. They just don't think they will. Um, so I think it's important for us to do that really boots on the ground um, outreach to all of our small businesses, but across the board um, to people that that have really suffered, that are in the rears, that feel hopeless in terms of getting out of this hole, that don't realize that they have the ability to, to clear the slate and, and capitalize on funding that is really exactly pinpointed for them. And then Dr. Scorza, I want to thank you as well. I don't want to leave you out. Um, you're doing amazing work as well. And I want to thank you for your presentation. So with that, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thanks so much to uh, CEO Davenport and Dr. Scorza and uh, Director Salas, <clears throat> not only for the presentation, but for the work. Um, T.S. Eliot uh, wrote in one of his uh, poems, uh, between the idea and the action falls the shadow. And sometimes I think that uh, we are at sort of taking a leap of faith on the board when we say this is the way we want the policy to roll out. This is what we want to happen. Here's the football. And you really have to, although I never use sports analogies, I'm going to use one today, you have to run it down the field. Um, and thank you so much for doing that. It's, it's made such a difference in individual lives, uh, in those renters who would have been on the street, in those small businesses, uh, many of whom depleted anything they might have saved up to try to take care of those who had been working with them for so long. And now, of course, there was just no money coming in. Um, I'm also really grateful for the equitable allocation, which does not mean zero at the end of what we identified as sort of the least needy. Because even in areas that are often described as least needy, many of which um, are in my district still, um, uh, it, it's individual owners of the of one-off businesses, restaurants, you know, um, uh, thrift shops, whatever, who really dug into their own personal savings to keep their uh, workers afloat, even if it only meant feeding them uh, in the first part of the pandemic, which was pretty much all anybody could afford to do, even when they were closed. So um, 
in in terms of making this real, that's that's really the the basis of the gratitude I want to express. And then I hope the three of you and your staff know the way we do, because we're out talking to people in our district, how life-saving this has been. Um, to turn money into real help is the greatest challenge of local government. And you have met it really beautifully. Um, I want to say also, uh, this is not over. We need to continue to pay deep attention to our communities and what they continue to need. We need to roll out every lesson that we've learned and make certain that people know how to do this. And um, again, my thanks, my thanks to you, Madam Chair, because you have certainly taken leadership um, even in the short time that you've been chair. And um, uh, my uh, thanks to uh, Supervisor Solis, who also uh, had a good deal to do with this last year and the way we developed uh, the programs. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to express some gratitude. Thank you very much, Supervisor Solis. Appreciate that. Uh, I, I too want to thank you, Mr. Salas, and, and Ms. Uh, Romo of your team at um, LACDA, you know, to stand up uh, in the middle of an emergency a operation within your departments to be able to disperse funds at this level. That, that is no small task. I get it. Um, and the relatively short period of time in which you stood it up, figured out the regulations and pushed it out is to be um, acknowledged. So thank you very, very much. I hear you loud and clear um, with regard to outreach. And, you know, I was, as you were speaking, I, I remember back in the day when I was a county contractor in a past life, when in our county contracts, you, the county or any government funder wouldn't pay for what they called marketing, so we had to switch the language to outreach. But my feeling then, and it remains true today, um, if we can't tell the people who are eligible for these programs that the programs exist and they're here for them to apply, then it's all for naught. And so I agree with you, and I think through, quite frankly, the pandemic, uh, we in government across the board have learned the value and have learned new techniques and strategies, sometimes using technology, sometimes good old-fashioned door knocking, on how we must reach out and into, uh, as Secretary Richardson said, hardly reach communities. And so uh, I agree with you. We, I think we should continue to think about um, how we do um, ground outreach to make sure people understand that the county is here to support them and the, the series of slides you walked us through um, certainly prove that, so I wanna thank you. I got a couple of messages that the slides on the public feed were a little blurry, and so we wanna make sure that the slides are available um, on the county website, so if people weren't able to track some of the small print um, that you can go back and find them. Uh, Dr. Score is a quick question. I know that there are online resources um, for our contracting opportunities. Uh, I want to make sure in our effort to do outreach that community-based organizations know where to find the information for contracting opportunities. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Yes, thank you, Supervisor, for your question. Um, so the county and, and specifically here in CEO, we're ensuring that all relevant updates, resources, and opportunities related to the American Rescue Plan are available via the uh, co.lacounty.gov slash recovery website, which launched early this year uh, and can be viewed. So if, if, if someone just is in the public and you're doing a general Google search, you can put you know, in LA County Recovers uh, and it'll take you to that website. Um, and on that website, individuals and organizations can see details about the spending plan and the county's equity centered ARP approach. They can access contracting opportunities and solicitations as they come online. Uh, and now they can access the public facing dashboard uh, and we'll soon be able to access mapping resources where we can demonstrate where all of the programs are actually providing services throughout the county. What's also exciting about this website supervisor and board is that the page lists contracting and grant opportunities that are available for competitive bidding with ARPA funds. Um, and we're encouraging vendors or potential folk who might be interested to learn more to sign up, there is an open, um, not just a link, but just an open form on the website where folk can submit their interest on that page. 
but that's not all. I think what's important to note um, is that CEO has initiated outreach um, to business networks, and we're excited to share that uh, Kelly Lobianco uh, will help lead a countywide outreach effort detailing contracting opportunities. And so we heard you loud and clear, uh, and CEO is working very closely uh, with Kelly and her team to develop not only outreach materials, but to be, but we've already begun meeting with organizations like the LA Chamber. So um, that, that should at least demonstrate not only our commitment to moving this work forward per your directives, uh, but supervisor offers the public an opportunity to, uh, to know where they can start receiving information. Thank you very much for that. Any other questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd like to say, oh, yes, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, sorry, Madam Chair, I just wanted to add because um, uh, there was a reference to Kelly Lobianco. I wanted to uh, really remind people who are watching that we made a, a pretty significant shift this year in reorganizing what had been a kind of a catch-all department about workforce development and uh, aging services and separated out the workforce and economic development into a new department. And Kelly Lobianco, for those of you who don't know the reference, is the new director of that new department. And I'm happy to hear um, that the focus on those issues of the relationship between workforce development and economic development and what it means in the middle of a pandemic uh, is really, really important. And I'm happy to hear, because we were very impressed, which is why we hired Kelly, uh, happy to hear that that's already beginning to bear some fruit. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to Ms. Davenport, Dr. Scorza and Mr. Salas and all of your teams for uh, the work you're doing each and every day to help us get American Rescue Plan funding out the door into communities, uh, into the, the hands of county residents who need it the most. And so this report is uh, received and filed and with no, seeing no objections, such will be the order. Colleagues, we'll move now into um, Special item number two, our public health order. We'll hear our presentations from Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health, and Dr. Christina Galley, Director of Health Services. Good morning, afternoon, morning. <laughs> uh, good morning, and thank you so much, Supervisor Mitchell, and to the entire Board of Supervisors. Uh, as always, uh, we ex want to express our deep appreciation for your leadership and tireless advocacy, especially as we're facing uh, this most recent surge of COVID-19 across our community. I'm grateful for this opportunity to present to you and the public the latest on the status of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic here in LA County. Uh, this morning, I'll provide an update on our current metrics, including case hospitalization and death rates, along with some data about our progress with vaccinations. And I'll close with strategies for mitigating transmission uh, during a surge. I can take the first slide. Um, as you can see from the numbers on this slide, uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in cases and hospitalizations over the past week, with cases more than doubling and hospitalizations increasing by more than 1,000. Over the past week, an additional 253,000 people became infected with COVID. And our weekly case rate posted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is now 1,768 new cases per 100,000 people. Test positivity has remained essentially steady uh, in the range of 22%, which means that nearly one in four people getting tested are infected. Well, this slide has yesterday's numbers. Uh, today's numbers just came in and it's sad to report 15 additional deaths and uh, almost 35,000 new cases. As always, to everyone mourning a loved one who has passed away from COVID-19, we do wish you healing and peace. Take the next slide. Uh, this slide shows cases, hospitalizations, and deaths between July 1st of last year and January 10th of this year. Cases in green and deaths in blue are presented here by the date they were reported and hospitalizations, which is the orange line, are presented by the date of admission. When you look at this slide, the steep rise in cases is striking. 
increasing by more than 2,000% since December 10. And we've also experienced, as you can see, a significant increase in daily hospitalizations, which is seen in this orange line, with COVID positive hospitalizations increasing by over 500%. It's important to note that while evidence continues to show that for many, infection with Omicron results in mild or moderate illness, there is not enough data to understand the percent of those recently infected who experience long COVID. We also don't have information yet about the likelihood of children infected with Omicron developing MISC weeks after their initial COVID infection. We do know that weeks after last winter surge, we saw a huge increase in MIS cases. So it remains prudent to do everything you can to avoid getting infected. Next slide. One difference in this recent surge when compared to our previous surges is that many vaccinated people are among those infected. In part, this reflects that over 80% of LA County residents 12 and older are now fully vaccinated. And in part, this is due to the ability of Omicron to evade some of the protection offered by the vaccines. This slide uh, shows us how our vaccines are holding up against both Delta and Omicron that were circulating recently. Um, uh, by looking at the data we have on case rates, and we can now do it by three categories of vaccination status. Unvaccinated, which is that line on the top, fully vaccinated without a third additional or booster dose, which is the middle line, and fully vaccinated with a third additional or booster dose. As you can see, while cases have increased rapidly among all three groups, the steepest increase by far is among those unvaccinated. For those unvaccinated, and that's that dotted line, uh, in the week that ended on December 25th, there were 991 cases per 100,000 unvaccinated people. Cases among people who are fully vaccinated but didn't yet receive their boosters, and that's that dashed line, are lower, although they're still trending upward uh, rather rapidly, and they've reached a rate now of 588 new cases per 100,000 people. Meanwhile, the case rate among fully vaccinated and boosted individuals has gone up slightly to 254 new cases per 100,000 individuals. While the rapid spread of Omicron has led to these higher rates of infection among all three groups, the increases are, as you can see, much lower among those who are vaccinated and even lower still among those vaccinated and boosted when compared to those who have not been vaccinated at all. So while it is true that Omicron escapes some vaccine protection, the evasion is not complete and you can see this more clearly on the next slide. Dr. Ferrer, would you speak a little louder, please? Oh, sure. See if that's better. Um, to better quantify how effective the vaccines are, we monitor rate ratios, which compare rates in unvaccinated people to rates in fully vaccinated people. The higher the rate ratio, the more protective the vaccine. We're also able to look at how these ratios change when we compare unvaccinated people with those vaccinated but unboosted or those vaccinated and boosted. The column here on the left compares unvaccinated people to fully vaccinated but unboosted people. Between the weeks ending November 28th and December 25th, as Omicron began circulating more widely, fully vaccinated but unboosted people went from being three and a half times less likely to one and a half times less likely to get infected when compared to unvaccinated people. If you look on the column on the right, as Omicron again began circulating more widely, fully vaccinated and boosted people went from being 19 times less likely to get infected to about four times less likely than unvaccinated individuals to become infected. While the rate ratio decreased significantly for both groups, those vaccinated, and particularly those that are boosted, are still less likely to get infected than those not vaccinated. And this does matter. If more people were vaccinated and boosted, even with Omicron dominating, there would be a very visible and significant reduction in transmission. Next slide. 
We are also tracking the impact of Omicron on hospitalizations. This slide shows the daily average COVID hospitalization census countywide with the orange line over a period from April 20th to January 6th. And above it in the red line, the total countywide hospital census for the same time period. The rise in the orange line now shows the increase in hospitalizations over the past week, which have doubled from about 1,100 on December 30th to 2,600 on January 6th. However, unlike during the last winter surge, which you could see that huge peak, uh, where overall hospital census also increased significantly, overall hospital census this time around has remained more stable, although it's still relatively high. Increases in hospitalizations have also occurred among pediatric patients as Omicron has circulated more widely. By January 1st, there were 79 children hospitalized with COVID, with the largest increase occurring among children under five, all unvaccinated, where hospitalizations in this group jumped from four on December 4th to 58 on January 1st. Next slide. Like the patterns we noted among those most likely to get infected, there are significant differences in hospitalization rates between people based on vaccination status. With the recent increases in hospitalizations, we're now able to look at this metric using the same three categories we just used to look at the case rates. And note, because this third category of boosted individuals contains only a week's worth of data, and there's almost no one in the hospital in this category, the solid orange line that represents the hospitalization rate of these vaccinated and boosted individuals is barely visible. It just looks like an orange blip at the end of the chart. Above this very short line at the bottom of the graph, the dashed orange line representing the hospitalization rate for fully vaccinated but unboosted people also, as you can see, remains very low. And while it's rising slightly, the rate of hospitalization amongst those vaccinated and not yet boosted is six times lower than the rate for those unvaccinated. And their rate is 25 hospitalizations per 100,000 unvaccinated people. And you see that in the dotted line at the top of the slide. Next slide. But we can also look at the hospitalization rate ratios over time. You can see by looking on the column on the left that compared with unvaccinated people, fully vaccinated but unboosted people have very significant protection still from being hospitalized. They are nine times less likely to be hospitalized than unvaccinated people. And this is looking at data uh, at the end of at the end of December. Among people who were vaccinated and boosted, the protection against hospitalization is huge, as they are now 38 times less likely to be hospitalized than those who are unvaccinated. And while the ratios change slightly uh, over the month of December, as Omicron circulated more widely, the vaccines remain very powerful at protecting individuals from severe illness. We can take the next slide. Uh, we're relieved that for the time being, our death rates remain low and have not yet significantly increased. But we do know that deaths are a lagging indicator. And with the rapid increases we're seeing in cases and hospitalizations, we may soon begin to see an increase in deaths. Unfortunately, as you can see on this slide, those deaths are far more likely to be among unvaccinated people who are currently 20 time, 25 times more likely to die than those who are vaccinated. Next slide, we can also do the rate ratios for deaths. Uh, and you can see this is you know, from uh, sort of throughout the month of December. This ratio has not really changed. Uh, we're hopeful that this trend continues as all the data to date indicate that vaccinations provide extraordinary protection against this very worst outcome. However, I do want to note, because it can take many weeks to see deaths rise after a surge in transmission, we do need to watch this ratio over the upcoming weeks. Next slide. Uh, as we note the power of vaccinations against severe illness and death, we've hit an important milestone across the county because we now have 80% of residents 12 and older fully vaccinated. As of January uh, 6, we also have 80% of LA County residents five and older receiving at least one dose and 71% fully vaccinated. 
82% of teens 12 to 17 received at least one dose. And after nearly nine weeks of vaccine eligibility, we've got about 26% of children 5 to 11 uh, having received their first dose of the vaccine. And while we're really grateful for everyone who is getting vaccinated and boosted, I do want to note there's about 2 million eligible residents who have not yet received their first dose of the vaccine. This creates a lot of vulnerability across the county since those unvaccinated, as we just saw, are both more likely to get infected and also much more likely to suffer severe illness from the virus than those who are vaccinated. And while more than 2.6 million LA County residents have received additional or booster doses, regrettably, there are still 3 million residents ages 12 and older who are eligible for boosters that didn't yet receive their additional dose. With skyrocketing transmission and the potent advantage of the booster dose, there's an urgent need for those eligible to get this additional protection as soon as possible. I'll take the next slide. As with the primary series of the vaccine, coverage gaps for boosters by geography are pronounced. This slide shows the percent of people who received additional or booster doses by age group in our lowest resource communities compared to those in our more affluent communities. As you can see here, we have quite a bit of work to do as our hardest hit neighborhoods have not yet received uh, additional or booster doses at the same rates of other county zip codes. As of January 6, 22% of residents five and older living in our hardest hit communities received their additional or booster dose. But you can compare that to 34% of residents that live in the other zip codes. The gap exists also when we look at residents over 65, which is one of the places where we actually have narrowed significantly the gap on that initial series. But here, 48% of residents in hard hit communities received an additional dose compared to 55% of residents 65 and older. I want to note that these percentages are based on total population uh, in this age group, and they are not based on those eligible. So we shouldn't be misled uh, by the smaller percent numbers as much as we should be worrying about the gaps and the differences between folks living in some of our communities compared to folks in other parts of our community. Next slide. Uh, our focus during, sh during surge is to shield the medically vulnerable, protect hospitals and health system functioning, and reduce opportunities for extensive spread. Resources have been realigned during surge to focus on our skilled nursing facilities, K-12 schools, healthcare systems, and work sites. In all settings, our health officer orders and efforts continue to reinforce strategies for protecting workers, including requiring upgraded masks, promoting vaccinations, and in some instances requiring both vaccinations and boosters and improving access to testing. Public health has teams to help manage outbreaks at nursing facilities, pools, and high-risk work sites in an effort to reduce transmission. Case and contact tracing along with quarantine and isolation requirements have been modified to accommodate tests to work and tests to stay in school strategies. With over 1,000 school campuses reporting three or more positive cases this past week, reopening schools after winter break requires continuous effort. And I want to extend my appreciation to the school administrators, teachers, staff, parents, and students who are working so hard uh, to reopen with as much safety as possible while we're in the middle of a surge. And with massive assistance from the state, the county, and the Department of Health Services, there are now expanded testing options across the county. By the end of today, through a partnership with LACO and the Public Health Department, over 1 million test kits procured by the state will have been distributed to 55 school districts and charter schools. By the end of the day tomorrow, the additional 29 districts and charter schools will have all received their test kits. And we're working, uh, we continue to work with all the districts and private and parochial schools to ensure adequate testing capacity at schools so they can manage during this surge. Nonetheless, I want to be honest and say we face continued challenges and disruptions over this next month related to high rates of transmission and the resulting staffing shortages. 
I know that everyone's going to need to do their best to work together to minimize the potential for harm that can accompany a surge of this magnitude. Next slide. And while we're in the surge, we do ask that you exercise more caution, even if you're vaccinated and boosted. One way to reduce transmission is to wear a high quality mask whenever you're around non household members. Given the dominance of a highly infectious Omicron variant, well fitting masks provide a great layer of protection to the wearer and all the folks they're around. And while cloth masks are certainly better than no masks, uh, there's increased evidence that surgical masks provide a more effective barrier and that KN95 masks and N95 masks and respirators provide the most protection. We're also asking that over the next few weeks, we all try to avoid non-essential activities where people are unmasked and in close contact with others. While we know how important getting together with friends is to our well-being, we need to be sure we're able to keep each other safe. The reality is that parties and events, especially those indoors with unvaccinated individuals or those at high risk for severe illness, make it very easy for this virus to spread. Limiting our time with others to those more essential work or related or school related activities is a prudent action for everyone to take whenever it's possible. I know this is not the start to the new year we had all envisioned. With the additional tools we have, particularly easy access to free vaccines, we ought to be able to use different strategies to get us through these challenging times. As always, though, it takes the full cooperation of all of us to move forward with grace and get through this surge. I want to close by thanking our dedicated and exhausted essential workers who once again are making sure that we all have access to the care and support we need to get through this pandemic. Thank you. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferrer. We'll hear from Dr. Galley and take questions at the end. Dr. Galley. Thank you and good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, I'll provide an update today on hospitalizations and the issues that are affecting hospitals. I think my comments apply to both the DHS hospitals as well as what I think a lot of private hospitals are experiencing. I'll also touch on vaccinations, provide an update from the EMS agency, and also talk about community testing. Uh, my comments today and slides today are longer than they've been uh, previously, but I'll try to move through them quickly so that we can get to questions. Uh, can you go to the next slide? And next slide again. So first on the hospitals, this slide shows the current and most recent over the past month COVID-19 admissions. And you'll see that there was a sharp spike up at the end of December and that that continues today. The next slide uh, focuses on the total COVID positive patient census. The previous one was just admissions. Our overall census of COVID positive patients in the four DHS hospitals is uh, running uh, as of today at around 250, it's gone up even significantly since the time that this slide was made. And that's roughly half of what we experienced during the winter 2021 surge. In contrast to the previous surge, there's several differences that we're experiencing in our DHS hospitals and across the county. So first, the share of patients that are admitted for COVID for COVID related conditions and issues is much lower than it was last year. On the next slide, slide five, it shows the admission rate of what we call incidental COVID positive patients. These are patients that were admitted to the hospital for any one of a number of medical or surgical conditions and happened to test COVID positive versus what we call COVID related admissions or an admission that's due to COVID. And you'll see that while both curves are rising and rising at the same rate, the COVID related admissions is lower than the COVID incidental admissions. On the next slide, slide six, it shows the proportion over time. And you can see that it's relatively constant where about 40% of patients are actually uh, there in the hospital for COVID versus just with COVID. And as a result, only 40% of the COVID positive inpatients are actually contributing to an elevated census in the hospitals. Historically, in the last surge, the vast, vast majority of patients, more than 80 or 90 percent, who were diagnosed with COVID on testing on admission were actually there for COVID. And so at that time, virtually every patient who was admitted to the hospital with COVID was an additional patient on the hospital census and thus added a lot more stress to the system. 
We're also seeing that the ICU utilization rate is lower than what we saw last winter by a factor of approximately two. So where last time uh, in the fall, roughly a third or slightly more of patients who were admitted to the hospital ended up being in the ICU and we saw ICU uh, rates of the COVID positive patients in the ICU being half or more than half. This time we're seeing the COVID admission rate to the ICU at only around 10 to 15 percent and 10 to 15 percent or so of the ICU beds are filled with a COVID patient. That means that right now versus the last surge where the rate limiting factor was that ICU bed availability, that's not what we're experiencing this time. And this time the bed shortage and the staffing shortages are much more widespread. In addition, in contrast to last year, uh, patients are not delaying care in the same way that they were previously. We saw drastic declines in ED utilization rates and urgent care utilization rates across the board in the last surge uh, and in the, certainly in the spring of 2020 and summer of 2020. That is not what we're seeing today. Uh, and I think in, to some degree that's good in the sense that people are not delaying care, that they really should not be delaying. And we want people to continue to use emergency rooms and urgent cares and go to their doctor to take care of chronic conditions and also to seek emergency services when needed. But we also need people to preserve emergency rooms for emergencies. I'll also touch on staffing. This is different than in the last surge. Staffing shortages are much more severe in this current surge, and the shortages are due to several factors. So first, there's just a baseline uh, lower number of staff uh, that's available due to a higher number of retirements that we're seeing across the county and across the state and the nation. And, and those, those early retirements or nurses or other staff that were moving to non-hospital uh, locations are felt uh, by hospital systems broadly. We also have a sm very small number of staff that did not comply with the county and state's vaccination mandate and have been transferred to non-patient care areas so that they do not present a danger to staff or patients. The much larger factor that we're facing is the large number of staff that have tested positive and are out on isolation protocols. This number's in the several hundreds and has made it virtually impossible to staff a hospital in line with the state's minimum mandatory staffing ratios or to maintain services that are at a level of care needed to support safe patient care. The numbers are due to the much higher rates of community transmission than what we have experienced at any previous point in this pandemic. There's just a lot more virus out there in the community and healthcare workers, just like anybody else, are getting infected. Finally, this surge has also seen a decrease, sorry, an increase in the degree to which hospitals are being expected by other parts of the healthcare system to manage a variety of care needs for non-acute patients who happen to be COVID positive. Other parts of the healthcare system outside of hospitals in very large numbers are simply refusing to care for COVID positive patients or refusing to accept COVID positive patients until the individual has completed a 10 day isolation period. This is causing a tremendous bottleneck in hospitals in that they are being required to care for patients that don't need a hospital level of care, but where they don't have an acceptable and accepting discharge location. And I'll offer just a, a couple of very brief examples to give you a flavor of what this looks like. Across the board, outpatient dialysis companies are sending patients who need routine dialysis to hospitals if they're COVID positive. They don't, they say they are unable to continue to provide care for dialysis patients who have COVID for the duration of their isolation period. We are greatly appreciative to DPH and their team for their work in messaging to dialysis companies about how uh, uh, inappropriate this action is. Also, subacute and congregate residential facilities, especially those, but not limited to those in the mental health system of care, are refusing to accept patients who are COVID positive. This is causing huge backlogs of patients filling up precious hospital beds. And I'll provide just the stats from one of our hospitals from this morning at LACUSC Medical Center. As of this morning, LACUSC had 38 COVID positive psychiatric patients mixed between its psychiatric emergency room its inpatient unit at Augustus Hawkins and on the medical surgical wards. There's 13 psych patients on the medical surgical wards who are psych patients where we don't have a safe bed to put them. And so they're filling up a med surge bed, which is not an appropriate use of a med surge bed. Over half of these 38 patients are waiting for discharge to a lower level of care placement. 
but because they are COVID positive, again, there's no accepting location for them. And this is just the COVID positive share. We have scores more psychiatric patients who are suitable for discharge, but we can't find them an appropriate discharge location. And this is adding to the stress on the hospitals. It's important to understand that hospitals have a very limited ability to modulate the demand for their services. And I'll help um, illustrate why this is the case. There's two very important laws that are in place to protect the health and safety of patients. These are good laws. Hospitals are governed by EMTALA and they have to care for all patients that present for care to an emergency department. Hospitals also have to make an appropriate and accepting not just discharge a patient uh, without an accepting location. These are good and important laws, but they apply only to hospitals and not to other parts of the healthcare system. And as such, hospitals must take patients from other parts of the healthcare system that don't feel prepared to care for patients, and hospitals have to keep those patients until other parts of the healthcare system feel able to accept the patients. Hospitals also cannot force a patient to leave even when there is an accepting discharge location available that's appropriate for the patient. DHS, just like other private hospitals, we have several patients who have accepting appropriate placements that are waiting for them, but these patients and their families refuse to leave the hospital as they prefer the higher level of care that's provided in the hospital setting. In this setting of limited ability to modulate demand of patients that they care for, hospitals also must comply with state mandated staffing ratios. Most notably, these include nurse staffing ratios. In the prior surge in the winter of 2021, the state quickly waived these ratios. However, the ratios are back in place and the state has not waived them. And DHS and all hospitals across the county must remain in full compliance with these state mandated ratios. So as you can see, this puts immense pressure on hospitals. And in that setting, hospitals must take various steps to maintain staffing levels, which are extremely difficult. And I'll walk through some of the steps that are being taken. Can you go to the next slide? So first, quarantine and isolation sites. Thanks to the support from the county and a number of entities across the county, DHS operates a number of quarantine and isolation sites. At the peak of the winter surge, we operated 11 such sites and we're currently operating four. The census in these sites uh, with a total bed capacity of about 250 runs at about 60%, but we're working to increase admissions to be able to offload hospitals, both public and private. These resources are available for individuals who are medically fragile and need clinical oversight. Staffing though is limited, not just in hospitals, but healthcare workers who are needed to staff these sites more generally. So we have a more limited ability to staff up additional sites than what we experienced earlier in the pandemic. Uh, we're also looking, working uh, with the county and are grateful to CEO and DPH's leadership in this regard for identifying opportunities to establish a motel voucher program that would be able to care, provide quarantine and isolation locations for individuals that don't require a degree of medical oversight. Additionally, DHS is canceling some lower acuity procedures and surgeries. Please note that we have a very limited ability to do this. We don't perform a lot of surgeries that would be considered by many to be elective, and we have a responsibility to continue to provide timely care to our patients to preserve their health. We've also reduced visitors in our facilities uh, in an effort to reduce the, the possibility of hospital transmission from visitors. This includes limiting the hours of visitation, the duration of visitation, and the number of visitors. We have not outright outlawed visitors though, because we feel the need to balance the need of our patients for the emotional support that visitors can provide and that our patients want and need. We are expediting hiring. We're working as quickly as possible to hire and onboard nurses. There's currently 185 nurses in various stages of the onboarding process within DHS. We do have items to work with, but we're also adding additional budgeted items to our budget where we are short. This includes most notably and most recently the critical care staffing package that was approved by the board just prior to the Christmas holiday. The package alone will add almost 200 nurse items to staff our ICUs. We're doing addition and will allow us as a result to expand ICU capacity in the future. We're doing additional staffing supplementations in employee health as well as other units across the hospitals. We are onboarding nurses through registry. We're onboarding nurses that are obtained through the state and over 50 are due to arrive this week, a combination of nurses and uh, respiratory therapists. 
We're also looking to receive federal resources as coordinated through the MOAC. Despite the above steps, we still do not have sufficient staff to safely care for the number of patients arriving for care. And this does not just nursing. It affects physicians, respiratory therapists, radiology techs, lab staffs, the whole gamut of what is needed to run a hospital safely. And in the understanding of the constraints in which our facilities operate, and given the stresses of the pre-hospital system of care, which I'll get to in a few minutes, the state and county departments of public health have offered expanded flexibility to bring staff back who would otherwise be home in quarantine or those who are COVID positive but haven't completed 10 days of isolation. The guidelines are extremely complex and call for different steps to be taken depending on an individual's symptoms, whether they are tested for COVID with an antigen test and when their symptoms started. These actions by the state and the county are necessary. Hospitals cannot care for patients without staff. They are also based on the most recent science of who is at risk for COVID, how and when it is spread, and how to protect individuals from infection. Among the core scientific principles that underlie the latest guidelines, there's a few things that are important to understand. First, good evidence supports that the period of transmissibility is shorter for Omicron than for pre previous dominant variants. 10, 10 days was previously the standard based on a couple of very small studies, but the evidence is very good that shorter periods are acceptable. Second, improvement in symptoms correlates with effective immune response and the reduced likelihood of transmission of disease. Third, vaccination protects people not just against illness, but also against the risk of transmission. And 100% of the staff that work in a DHS clinical facility are vaccinated. We do not permit anyone who is unvaccinated to work in a clinical facility within DHS. There's also no good evidence as to whether or not antigen testing after a positive PCR test correlates with infectivity. It is a step that really provides public reassurance at this point at best based on the data. DHS is currently reviewing the latest guidelines that were put forward by the state on January 8th, and we will be revising our workforce expected practice as needed based on demand for services within our facilities and within the confines that have been put forward by the state and the county. However, to date, no such changes have been made and no staff have been brought back outside of the, the previous policies in place. Shifting now to vaccination, and I'll move quickly through this. If you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, we continue to do our best uh, to vaccinate as many people as possible. The best and safest way out of this pandemic is through vaccination. We provide vaccinations to all of the different cohorts and patients and staff members and individuals that we serve as well as to the public. Can you go to the next slide? We're also working uh, toward compliance with the new state and county mandate that all healthcare workforce must receive a booster shot by February 1st, in addition to working to provide booster doses to our patients. The number here on the blue line of DHS workforce member booster doses is just those provided by DHS. This does not include data on workforce members who have received a booster dose outside of DHS. We've also recently expanded booster shots to kids age 12 plus in line with recent CDC guidance and are doing outreach to all DHS patients who we don't have a record of vaccination for. Next shift to uh, next slide, please, on the EMS update. Uh, so, as you know, uh, the EMS agency governs the pre-hospital system of care in Los Angeles County. Uh, the pre-hospital system of care is experiencing prolonged what we call APOT or ambulance patient offload times and diversion times and longer response times in the 911 system. Private ambulance companies who contract with DHS to provide emergency response through the 911 system have experienced severe staffing shortages and are having difficulty responding to calls in a timely manner. Shortages in hospital EDs, those staff are required for timely offloading of ambulances. Among the ambulance companies, a high number of staff are not vaccinated, and as a result, they are not able to work in line with, with public health orders. And there's also a high number of sick call offs, just as hospitals are experiencing. Diversion can be used by hospitals, but this just puts more stress on the 911 system, and it also generally affects only ALS or advanced life support ambulances. It doesn't avert specialty ambulance traffic or BLS volume. The EMS agency has daily status calls and is actively working with LA County Fire and its contracted ambulance companies, AMR Care and West Bend McCormick, to institute and mitigate measures which may contribute to a delay in response times. 
Uh, and the, some of the steps that they're taken include accepting a notification from a fire ambulance company to place a hospital on ED diversion when ambulances are waiting, even if the hospital has not requested diversion. Working with departments, emergency departments to decrease APOT times by deploying directly EMS staff to monitor patients in emergency departments to be able to get those ambulances back into the field for 911 response. They've identified the 20 most impacted hospitals and already teams have been deployed to the top 10 all private hospitals to be able to help with offloading ambulances and reducing wall time. The next eight are expected to receive some federal resources this week or the following week. Also on January 8th, the state sent an ambulance strike team to augment the 911 ambulance companies themselves. We've requested five. We've received one with one still pending and three TBD. EMS agency is using advanced treat and release protocols, uh, though that is ultimately the discretion of various county and city fire departments. And finally, and importantly, there's public messaging that is really important for people to understand about using the emergency department only for emergencies. It shouldn't be used for COVID testing or for mild illness. Even if these patients don't ultimately end up need to be admitted, which the low acuity ones don't, the volume puts immense strain on hospitals and reduces their ability to provide care for patients uh, with true emergencies. Next slide, EMS agency has also worked with the state to deploy staff to establish three surge units in LA County. The sites are listed here, one at Mission Community Hospital, one at Little Company of St. Mary and San Pedro, and one at Antelope Valley Hospital. These are all open and accepting patients. They're coordinated through the MAC, the Medical Alert System Center, uh, and then they uh, have oversight from the state. Finally, I'll shift to testing and then I will close. Uh, next slide, please. So DHS oversees community testing, as you know, which provides PCR tests for members of the public who are in need of a test. This includes specifically people who have symptoms of COVID or a close contact with someone who is positive. This is not the only place to get tested in the county. Testing is widely available from schools, employers, the health system, private companies, et cetera. All of the results that are um, collected at community testing sites are transmitted to the Department of Public Health for contact tracing and data tracking. On this slide, slide 15, you'll see the trend recently in community, sorry, back, uh, in community testing. Testing volume had fallen to a low of 50,000 per week in the fall, and we've worked uh, to be able to maintain the utilization rate at around or slightly under 50%, which is that split between the blue bar and the yellow bar, to be able to preserve capacity in the setting of rapid spikes in testing, such as what we've seen over the holidays. Also of note, the city of Los Angeles closed all of their testing sites as of early December, which put added stress on the system. Several testing sites have experienced long lines as we saw in surge in testing over the holidays. We have worked with a variety of partners to expand testing capacity and will continue to do so along the steps that I'll describe very briefly on the next few slides. Uh, before I do that, next slide, slide 16, just gives you a visual graphic of where the, the testing sites are currently located and, and we will keep that updated on the website. Next slide, slide 17. Thank you. So we are working to expand hours, days, and lanes of operation at all of the, the, the main county and state operating testing sites. OptumServe, one of the state vendor for testing, uh, began an expansion plan yesterday, January 10th. They have the State National Guard that is assisting with staffing, and this will add at least one lane to each OptumServe site. We have already launched three new fixed sites, one in Lancaster, one at the Ted Watkins Memorial Park in Watts, and one at Obergon Park in East LA. We've also have additional sites planned, and I'll go over a little bit about that in subsequent slides. In addition, the state has added one new OptumServe site, which opened yesterday at the West Los Angeles Church of God on Crenshaw Boulevard in South Los Angeles. And there's 10 additional independent sites that are spread across the county, which we have, which we don't manage or operate, but which we um, have verified that they provide testing in line with our expectations, which include no charging for patients that. Uh, that they can't bill insurance for, and those are posted on the website. There are also two new federal sites that are pending, and those have yet to be cited. We're working with the federal government on that plan. The three of eight, uh, sorry, three of eight, there's a new core sites that are being launched. They're in various phases of being launched. I think one is actually already launched and two more are going live over the next couple of days. The one already launched is in Northridge at Pierce College. And there's additional sites that will open, as I mentioned, over the next couple of days, one in South LA on Imperial Highway, one in Lincoln Park, 
Sun Valley Rec Center, Rio de Los Angeles, South, and another one in South LA Cafe. There's additional sites that are in process but have not yet been cited by CORE. These are large um, independently operated sites by CORE, but they're high volume offering 2000 tests per day. Um, we also are working to get additional messaging out on test availability. And again, that website is a great source of information as well as utilizing our CBOs and cities to get messaging out. On the next slide, um, already uh, as of January 4th, we had increased weekly capacity of testing by 50% and we'll provide updated data uh, in subsequent reports. Next slide. This shows a map. We use a, a data-driven methodology to decide where to site new testing. Uh, the highest priority communities based on unmet need are those that still had unmet need after we already took into account the sites that I just listed, the sites that are being added by core, and the sites that I'll go to in just a minute, which include pickup and drop off locations. So really please take in the totality, all of the additional sites and not just this list right here. Uh, on the next slide, we can walk through what the criteria are for when we look at an equity based framework. We look at the four week case rate and the change in that case rate. We look at the four week percent positivity rate and the change in that percent positivity rate. We look at where there's already sites, where there's accessibility, a site agreement, space, lighting, storage, some of the logistics. And then we always work to enhance capacity at its existing sites before we launch new sites, but then also try to spread them out to provide geographic access for the community. Next slide, and then I will close in just a minute. Uh, as you know, we also relaunched um, our home PCR testing program. We can't just rely on mix, fixed and mobile testing sites. They are heavy. Um, on those sites require a lot of staffing to operate, operate and thus they're really not maximally scalable to the need that uh, testing requires during a surge. We launched that home testing kit program on December 26. Over 25,000 tests have been mailed to date. Just like in the hospital system, I think every industry across the United States is experiencing staffing shortages and that affects the logistics industry just the same. And so because of that, the vendor and their subcontracted vendors were having challenges processing mail and packages in a timely manner. And that required us to first cap the home testing delivery program on um, January 4th at 4,000 and then pause it entirely on January 5th. Our vendor has worked through those challenges and we are planning a relaunch of the home test kit program tomorrow. It will still be capped at least in the short term at the 4,000. Also, um, in a way that doesn't rely on those same mailing and logistics vendors, we've launched a new pickup drop-off test kit program that bypasses some of those challenges. We piloted at a few sites last week and then launched 13 additional sites in total at, that were all live as, as of yesterday. So far, they're going well. We plan to continue to expand this option over the next several days with focus on expanding pickup and drop-off access points at urgent cares, including at both DHS sites, as well as at community clinics that are placed in strategic geographic locations. We're also working with the libraries to be able to offer some at specific libraries. I'm very grateful to uh, the LA County Library System for their assistance. It's important to understand a couple of things about these programs. First, people still need to register for the test. When they come in, they will be asked to register. You can register um, on your own or, or there will be staff that can help register. This is primarily to ensure the ability of the Department of Public Health to do contact tracing and the setting of a positive test. Also, please realize these are all PCR tests. They are not rapid antigen tests. The processing is done in a lab and the results are provided within 24 to 48 hours. Individuals who are awaiting test results are advised to isolate or quarantine until they receive their results. Um, you could close the slides. I'll, I'll close on a, just a different topic just to, to make you aware of a rapidly worsening shortage in the blood supply across Los Angeles County. Throughout the surge, last two years, really blood supply has been tight. The, that's been the, the, the new standard, unfortunately. And that's largely because donations have dropped. However, uh, at the same time earlier in the pandemic, there was also a reduced demand for blood because there was thankfully less trauma cases, less people driving, to some extent less surgeries that might require blood because procedures were being rescheduled and postponed. But now uh, trauma and ED volume is up, surgeries are back up for surgeries that can no longer be safely delay delayed. So the demand for blood is high, but this, the donation volume is still down. Uh, 
25% of blood donations are typically collected on college campuses. That's down as well as donations in the general public. And also the capacity of organizations um, such as but not limited to the American Red Cross to collect blood is limited because of their own staffing challenges in the set of a lot of people being sick across the board. So put all that together and we face a very severe shortage of blood. DPH and DHS are meeting together to review steps that we can take to increase communication to the public and encourage people to donate. And I would encourage anyone listening here to consider donating. You can go to redcrossblood.org and there's multiple sites that do have blood donation available uh, and you can register. They prefer you to register and, and uh, provide, give blood if you're able to. And I would we'll also work on messaging to the hospital systems to conserve blood. Um, we need hospitals to only use blood as the scarce uh, resource that it is. Uh, trauma centers just cannot operate without blood. If there's not blood, they will need to close. And that is not a system, a, a situation that we want to find ourselves in. I will close there and then happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you to both doctors Ferrer and Galley. Um, Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also want to thank you, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Galley, for your leadership. Um, you know, as most of you are aware, I had to navigate the, the system to try to get a testing. Um, and so I firsthand saw the challenges and I even went on today. And as soon as you can get onto a CVS uh, for um, a test is the 24th. So we still have a true need um, out there to get test kits out and available. Um, Regardless of the strain on the system, I want to take a moment to thank and recognize both of you um, and your teams for all the work that you did to build up the test testing system over this last week. But what I would like to ask you is, in terms of differentiating between those that are coming to our testing site, if they're going on to a system like CVS or Walgreens where they can't get tested until the 24th, how are we getting out the word that that is not the only game in town, that in fact, they can go and pick up a test um, kit at one of our uh, county sites or even through community-based organizations. Yeah, Supervisor, thanks for the question. It's, it's a great point, um, and we need to have a lot of messaging out there. We're working to push out press releases on the availability of the pickup and drop-off locations. We'll launch a press release tomorrow about the relaunch of the home testing program. Uh, and we work to keep the website updated about all of the different places that people can go to receive testing. Uh, as mentioned, we utilize over 200 community-based organizations to push out, push out messaging through. And then also really appreciative of all of your offices and your staff, your field deputies, your teams. They've done a phenomenal job of, of uh, connecting people with resources, of making people aware of where different sites are located. Uh, they're a great method of getting the word out and that communication is so important. And Supervisor, uh, this is Barbara. Um, one, of, one of our roles, and I wanna really thank uh, Dr. Galley and her team because it's been remarkable what they've been able, how much they've been able to expand uh, given the demand. As, as I noted earlier this week, you know, we at one point we averaged about 50,000 tests a week. Um, and uh, schools, of, of course, added a lot of capacity, um, but we're well over uh, on an average day, 200,000 tests uh, run across the county. So, um, and while schools maybe uh, account for about half of that, the other half is through all of these partnerships. Uh, DPH's role has really been to provide testing capacity to what we call uh, sort of high risk, high need settings. So for example, we work really closely with uh, folks that are, um, you know, with the organizations that are servicing people experiencing homelessness, with our skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities, with the schools, um, with some community-based organizations serving very high-risk populations to try to make sure that, uh, you know, we are, and always this has been, in, you know, a lot of cooperation from the state, that we are directly getting them access uh, to their own testing solutions. Um, and so that's been our role, which has required, you know, less communication to the public and more building these relationships so that in places where we have highly vulnerable people, uh, we're able to make sure that the testing capacity is there uh, to get us through the surge. So that, that's really been the role we've played. And we too built out a network of about 350 community 
uh, organizations to help us do all of this work. Um, you know, but many are servicing these very uh, targeted populations. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I truly do believe that this has been the perfect storm as it relates to people traveling and wanting to get tested, getting together during the holidays, wanting to get tested. You have the schools mandating testing before you get back to school. And then with Omicron, I think that across the board, um, we were hit. But to your point, Dr. Ferrer, LA County is doing more tests per capita than any other major county in the state, which is a testament to the work that you all are doing. Um, but one of the questions I have is, are testing guidelines still advises people to get tested before and after travel, or if, they, if they're going to an indoor gathering? Um, I think we all remain concerned that those who desperately need a test and cannot get one um, should be at the front of the line. So could you help provide some direction on when people should absolutely get tested and when they shouldn't? I can start unless Dr. Ferrer wants to chime in. Um, so the, the two most important situations in which people really absolutely should get a test is if they have symptoms that are consistent with COVID or they had a close contact with someone who was known to be COVID positive. Those are the two most important. That's not to say that people shouldn't get a test in the other situations. Uh, we do encourage testing. The high testing rate across the county is a good thing, but those two that I mentioned are the highest priority. I think um, I think you know we we've been acknowledging how hard it is uh, for folks to get tested and really prioritizing, as you said, making sure that our systems actually uh, you know increase capacity, particularly for people who are sick and and absolutely need to need to know their status. And then, of course, for all their close contacts um, who also need to know their status. Since uh, you know it's it's really not clear who the that index case is, so um, so you know we agree that you know we need to make sure that that everyone understands. I think um, the, the the situation that we really want to not encourage here is the sort of test to party. You know, I'm going to test every single day. I'm going to use up these resources that right now are are pretty scarce, so that I can do everything I want to do in the middle of the surge. And, you know, that that strategy, A, it's not that effective as many people have learned. Uh, and B, it doesn't help us make sure that we're able to get testing uh, kits out to those people who really need it. So, you know, my strong urging and our messaging has been, you know, the, unfortunately with COVID, it's not a sort of, you know, uh, test. We don't, we don't have capacity for everyone to be testing every day right now. And, and people should recognize that and understand, you know, the safest thing to do right now is curtail some of those non-essential party activities where we're having too much spread um, and and wait uh, while we build up that testing capacity. Yeah, and then that leads me, I, I have um, a motion that I wanted to bring in because one of the things that I'm finding is the harder it is to find a testing site, the more individuals that are predators that are going out and, um, and doing illegal activity with kids that are not even accredited and um, stealing identity of patients. And I wanna commend um, the governor and the state because I know they're going after those companies that are doing price gouging, um, but this is a, a real issue. And so I, I have a motion that says in the, in the past month, demand for COVID-19 testing in LA County and across the country has skyrocketed drastically outpacing supply. Rising cases coupled with holiday events and travel has led to an unprecedented demand for testing in our communities. And this perfect storm has left our residents desperately searching for much needed tests. Unfortunately, this has led to some taking advantage of the situation by distributing and setting up fraudulent COVID-19 tests and testing sites. This last week, the Federal Trade Commission issued a warning on fake COVID-19 tests, stating it is not a surprise that according to the US Food and Drug Administration, fake and unauthorized at-home testing kits are popping up online and opportunistic scammers take advantage of the spike in demand. Additionally, constituents have raised concerns about fraudulent tests or sites and identity theft from these test sites. As the urgent need for testing reaches this crucial point, it is imperative that the board ensure residents can be confident 
that they are receiving an accurate and a legitimate test without risking their private information. This risk mirrors what we've seen last year with fraudulent vaccines. And in response, the Department of Consumer Affairs and Business Affairs has published information and resources on avoiding these scams. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors direct the LA County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs in partnership with the Department of Health Services, Department of Public Health, County Council, and the Sheriff's Department, and the District Attorney's Office to report back in 30 days on the risk of fraudulent COVID-19 tests and home test kits, a public communications plan to educate residents on the threats of fake COVID-19 tests and testing kits, how to identify fraudulent tests and testing sites, and where to find legitimate resources. And third, an enforcement plan to crack down on fraudulent COVID-19 test sites and tests and resources to combat and address identity theft. I just believe now is the time to educate people because again, these are popping up on street corners and we already are concerned about those that have a fear of coming in and giving out their private information. And that is a barrier to getting both vaccinated as well as getting tested. And I think it's important for us to reassure the public that we are um, we are moving forward to um, combat this and and provide legitimate opportunities for them to get tested. Madam Chair, I would second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. And then I'm not going to ask about therapeutics because I, I've taken enough time and I know that Supervisor Kuehl wants to talk, but I think at some point it's important for us to get out the word about therapeutics. I think there's this misconception that we're sitting on a stockpile here at LA County and we're not. Um, and I know I'm getting calls from my cities asking why they're not getting sent out. So at some point, I think we're going to have to do something to educate the public about that. It's not a slam on the state. It's not a slam on the federal government. I think it's just miscommunication. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And we're going to wait and take action on Supervisor Barger's read in motion after all the questions. So Supervisor Kuehl, you're up. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and thanks so much to Dr. Ferrer, Dr. Galley, and all of their staff. Um, I, I think uh, many people know, though I didn't tweet about it, like one of my colleagues, um, I tested positive uh, the day after Christmas, and I had minimal symptoms, and about 11 days later, tested negative, and I used um, a, a lab test for the first test, um, which was really kind of hard to access, uh, but I just did in-home antigen tests, and I wondered, Dr. Ferreira, because I asked you this, if you can distinguish uh, between these two, because I think people think there's something more efficacious about the lab tests and they're harder to get because you make appointments for them and you wait for it to come back, et cetera. Uh, though the county is offering them now on our sites just to go and pick them up and bring them back. Um, the difference between those and the antigen test, because um, it was instructive to me uh, when you uh, described them to me. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Supervisor Kuehl, and, and I'm really glad that both you and Supervisor Barger are, are doing well and, and that you're vaccinated and boosted. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, we, I, I want to start by saying we have a lot of detailed information on the website explaining antigen testing versus molecular testing, PCR testing, uh, NAT testing that it's sometimes called, so NAAT. So, uh, but they're really, they're really, um, they, have, they they both have advantages and they both have, you know, uh, some drawbacks. Um, you know, the advantage of, of these antigen tests is they're rapid uh, and you, you get a result uh, right away. And the result is fairly accurate. No test is 100%, but, and these results are fairly accurate. What they're best at is they can actually uh, tell when you have a significant enough viral load that you're actually likely to be infectious. So it works pretty well for the purpose that many people are using them, which is, you know, I want to know my status before I go and do something, or I've got, um, you know, I've got some uh, activity that I need to do. I'm going on a plane, I'm going somewhere, I, I need to know my status. Um, they're also uh, decent at, like, I don't feel so good. But here's where there's a trade-off. If you want to know whether you've been infected with the virus, not whether how infectious you may be to other people, 
a PCR test is the better test because uh, it detects a lower uh, level of virus uh, that's circulating in your body. So, um, you know, we, we held that up always as the gold standard. Uh, we actually encourage people who have symptoms, use an antigen test, get a negative result uh, to go ahead and then get a PCR test because it's going to be uh, more easily able to pick up uh, smaller amounts of virus that's circulating in your body. Um, but it takes longer. Um, so you don't get the results usually for one to two days. And as you noted, uh, oftentimes uh, you may have to go somewhere uh, to get tested. Now, I want to note that health plans offer those tests as well. And sometimes uh, folks who have a medical provider, their best bet if they have symptoms is to call that medical provider and figure out where they can get in quickly. Because as you noted, there's if you have symptoms, you don't want to wait uh, for a week to be able to find out your status. Um, so I would urge people to also, you know, talk with your provider or your clinic uh, to find out how they've made arrangements for their patients uh, to get those tests when they have symptoms. Um, and, and the other advantage that you have with the antigen test, just like you noted, is it's something you can have at your house if you're lucky enough to have gotten a supply of them. Right now, you know, they're for both the antigen tests and the molecular tests, uh, we have more demand for those tests than we actually have supply. And so it's been harder than it was a month ago uh, to be able to even get those in-home test kits. But we're grateful for all of the distribution and support we got from the state to get those. You know, we're grateful that at our schools, they all got those quick antigen tests. Again, they use those to rapidly determine people's status as they were coming back into the school community. Uh, and that's a good use for that test. But if you get a negative and you don't feel well and you have symptoms, it's always best to either do another antigen test the next day, or if you have access to go ahead, the best thing to do is to try to get a piece of test. So do uh, is my ability to infect other people diminished over the course of time? Because I remember um, the, the, the federal uh, suggestion did not include testing at the end of the fifth day, um, yes. but just masking if you don't have any symptoms or they've resolved, which is a, a word everybody uses. I don't know what that means. Um, but, uh, but the state, and I believe our county, continues to recommend uh, a test, even if you uh, don't have symptoms, at the end of the fifth day of your positiveness, before you go out into the world. Is that still the case in the yes. county? Yes, it is. The state and, and the county, you know, the, the county's aligned with the state, uh, both require for the general public, not healthcare workers, but for the general public, that if you want to leave that isolation period, which is 10 days, if you, if you want to leave it earlier, um, you can only do so if on day five you take a test, and it should be an antigen test, um, that test result is negative, then on day six, assuming you either have no symptoms, that's the best situation, or you have no fever and resolving symptoms, uh, and you can wear a high grade, high quality mask all of the time when you're around other people, you can leave and finish off that isolation period, uh, keeping your mask on and obviously no fever. Uh, hopefully asymptomatic and that negative test. And the reason for that negative test is um, the science, and I think Dr. Galley noted this also, indicates that particularly with Omicron, that infectious period could be shorter, uh, mm -hmm. but could be shorter and is shorter for everyone are, are two very different thresholds. So I think the majority of people who are infected are likely to be most infectious right before they develop their symptoms. Uh, and then for a few days right after. But that's just the majority of people. There's a tail. Uh, and, and many of you know that tail well because you tested yourselves after day five, on day five, and you were still positive. Um, right. Maybe by day seven or day eight or day nine, you actually got that negative test result from an antigen test uh, because you still were likely to have enough of a viral load that you 
may, in the right circumstances, be able to infect other people. But clearly, you're getting better as your symptoms are resolving, um, which is why the CDC, you know, changed the. But we're also test. saying that after ten days, even if you had a positive test at the fifth day. After 10 days, we don't require a test for you to go out. We don't and require any test for people with masks. After 10 days, if they have no fever for 48 hours without using fever, reducing medication, and their symptoms have either completely resolved or are resolving. And the reason for that language, which you're right, it's confusing, is many people lose their taste or their sense of smell, and that could, that could be gone for a while, and it may take a while to get that back. Other people have noted, you know, they feel like they still have a head cold, um, but they're not, you know, they're nowhere near uh, as sick as they were when they got their first diagnosis. It's sort of this resolving, uh, you know, language that nobody's really happy with, um, but they've had no fever um, and they definitely feel better. Um, and well, that, in that case, at, after day 10, you can leave isolation without a, any kind of test threshold. Well, let me get into the the somewhat more difficult question because you said, except for healthcare workers, and I want to ask Dr. Galley not that particular question at first, but to um, review for us briefly the issue of staffing and and the staffing issues. I, were, I guess we're calling them, but really shortages because if people become infected, they stay home. Um, and or they're worried and they stay home or I mean, I, I don't recall the slide that may have shown the actual numbers of um, sort of the daily shortages that we're suffering. But could you give us a, a sort of a brief general picture about staffing shortages as you see them in the four county hospitals and then anything else you know about the other um, private hospitals? Sure, Supervisor, and, and thanks for the question. Um, so we have uh, a couple of hundred staff across all of our hospitals that are unvaccinated that have been reassigned to alternative locations. Uh, they are working in administrative areas doing non-patient care duties. Um, so that that is that is a small subset. the The larger subset is the number of people who are out because of uh, what has been determined to be a high risk exposure requiring quarantine or a number of people, much higher number who are tested as COVID positive um, because of uh, an exposure wherever it, it happened. Um, and that number numbers in the several hundreds. I'm happy to get your staff a, a precise number by facility if you would like it, but there are several hundred staff that are out and that stretches across all types of staff. It's not unique to any, it's not unique to nurses or physician, it's it's everything. And it is really just reflective, as I mentioned, of, of how widespread COVID transmission is at this point. Uh, anyone who spends any time in public, who goes to the grocery store, who goes to the park, who goes anywhere, is running into multiple people per day that are COVID positive. And the transmission is just out there and Omicron is extremely transmissible uh, and it's just very easy to get it. So we have a large number of staff that are COVID positive. There's nothing unique to DHS facilities about that. That is affecting all hospitals, private ones as well. It's affecting clinics, lower level of care facilities, EMTs, the pre-hospital system, as I mentioned, skilled nursing facilities, as well as non-healthcare facilities. There's just a lot of staff that are sick and that's causing supply staffing shortages across the board. Um, we uh, have done everything we can. I walked through some of the steps in my comments to bring in additional staffing, hiring staff, registry, state, federal resources. We have uh, reassigned some staff from who typically don't work, for example, in the ICU or the medical surgical area, but possess the appropriate skill set to mm -hmm. go back to work in those areas. At this point, they are voluntary redeployments. We have canceled some elective procedures where possible, though, as I mentioned, I think we really have a quite limited ability to do so to reduce demand. But even after all of those steps and other steps that have been taken, we don't have the number of staff that are required to operate the number of beds that we need to operate. And we have uh, uh, over 100, probably closer to 200 beds that are closed at any one time in the DHS hospitals. 
because we don't have the staff to operate them in line with the nurse staffing ratios that are required by the state. And as you know, those ratios have not been waived this surge. So in the absence of this ratios being waived in the absence of being able to onboard additional staff or bring in additional staff from some other location, we can't open up the beds. And then the patients sit in the emergency department um, or the psychiatric emergency department where possible we discharge them to various locations, quarantine and isolation. But as I mentioned, there's a lot of bottlenecks there. Um, and, and this is why the EDs are so impacted and that backs up into the pre-hospital system of care. There's a variety of solutions to this problem. Um, but one of the solutions among many is the ability to bring staff back earlier than what otherwise would be done based on the, pub, the orders for the general public. Um, and I do believe that while those might not be choices that anyone would make under nor normal circumstances, they are low risk choices. Uh, as I mentioned, 100% of staff in DHS facil facilities, clinical facilities are vaccinated. We do not allow anybody who is not vaccinated, regardless of reason, to work in a clinical facility. And that's not just for their own safety. It's for the safety of their colleagues and their patients because they then are at much reduced risk of getting infected or transmitting a virus to others. Uh, we have N95s that are broadly available that are available they're required in certain areas for certain procedures, but they're available to any staff member that wants one. Um, and we believe that those steps that the state and the county have put in place as options for a hospital to use are low risk options that should be used on an as needed basis when needed to care for the patients that are presenting for care. I hope that answers your question, but let me know if you have any follow ups. Um, it does. And as the author of the nurse to patient staffing ratio bill, as you know, um, uh, we go back and forth about the uh, waiving, you, you know, the uh, the staffing ratios. But I'll tell you, from uh, everything I hear, not only in public testimony, but just everybody letting me know, people are so exhausted that I don't know whether waiving the ratios would work really for the staff because it's kind of like saying, okay, you're a nurse, you're fine, you have eight patients, but you're going to have twenty. You know, I mean. I, I just don't think that it really adds to patient safety. So um, I, I've been ambivalent about it and I was quite steeped in it a while ago, as you know. So yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I would not waive those ratios myself. Yeah, and, and Supervisor, I, I, I agree with you. I think at this point, um, the the step that can be taken before, it's, all, it's all a stepwise progression of, of actions that can be taken depending on the situation we're in. But I think at this point, the actions that have been taken by the public health authorities to allow healthcare workers to return sooner than they would have otherwise in certain days post symptoms or post um, uh, identification of a positive test um, with or without an antigen test, which there's very little data on the utility of, um, I think are, are relatively low risk safe ways to do this, especially in the context of 100% vaccinated workforce and the widespread use of masks and availability of N95s. And I think that is a safer step to take than waiving the nurse staffing ratios. I hope we don't get to the point where we also need to waive nurse staffing ratios. I think staff are exhausted and I think that step comes with its own risks, in part because staff are being deployed to areas where they don't necessarily have the full set of training. Um, but right now, the steps that were taken, I think, are the most conservative steps that still allow hospitals to maintain the staffing that they need to maintain to be able to care for patients. Well, I think the state would have to waive the ratios anyway, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. But of course, the press is now very interested in our saying that healthcare workers can go to work while they, uh, if they're not ex experiencing symptoms, but they've been exposed or et cetera. Um, so I, I think uh, it's important for us to be supportive of the science rather than just the, you know, the media blow up um, that this is not a high risk issue for the staff necessarily or for the patients they're serving. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Absolutely. Anything Thank else you want to say, of course. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Supervisor Hahn. I wanted to give you the opportunity if you have questions for either Dr. Uh, Ferrer or Galley. 
Thank you. Uh, it's good to be with all of you. Uh, no, I, I'm sure you guys have uh, pretty much asked everything. I I, I know I, I was concerned, but I think I heard uh, Dr. Galley re refer to it. I was concerned about our ambulance service and um, the short staffing in our hospitals um, and wanted to make sure that our hospital workers and our ambulance uh, services had uh, adequate um, access to testing. Um, and I don't know if you covered that or not, um, but that, that was something I was concerned about. And I just feel like, I, you know, it's all about testing right now. And I, I'm just really hoping that we can meet the moment and uh, meet the demand of uh, testing. And I've uh, suggested that we use our county libraries or our county facilities, uh, protect, particularly for these um, self, I'm calling them self-swabbing uh, uh, test kits as opposed to the in-home test kits. So uh, I pretty, like I said, I'm pretty sure you've gone over that, but those were some concerns that I had um, in terms of staffing shortages. Thanks, Supervisor, and we love the idea of libraries as well. They're accessible, they're available, yeah. uh, and we're looking forward to launching those, um, so hopefully starting the first couple and, and, and work out the process this week and, and excited to launch other locations as well. Great. And I know I talked to Sky Patrick, our wonderful librarian, and she's, of course, you know, our libraries have been so uh, uh, willing to step up to the plate, whether it's putting um, voting drop boxes at, at their facilities, she just always wants to make sure that some staffing comes along with uh, the use of the facility so that her librarians um, aren't necessarily checking out books and checking out kits at the same time. So, um, and I know those, that's some of the stuff that you're, you're gonna work out. Thank you. Yeah, we'll work out the process there and we, we may need to look to the county for disaster service workers to assist um, and then absolutely Good. provide training. It's, it's a pretty um, low staffing model. Uh, which is why mm -hmm. we think it's, it's more scalable and so happy to partner with the libraries on that. Yes, great, because I also thought it was a time to reinvigorate uh, our disaster service workers uh, also for, for particularly for this, because everybody I talk to, it's all about testing. Everybody, where can I get a test? Um, you know, the, the long lines uh, that have been related to, to getting a test. So that's been what's come back from my neighbors, my constituents, everybody, really wants to get tested, which I appreciate, you know, that uh, people really do uh, want to get tested. They're doing it uh, to protect their own, you know, health and their loved ones and their workplace and school kids need to get tested. So really, it feels like it's all about testing right now. So anything you can do uh, to help us kind of meet that demand uh, out there would be greatly appreciated, I'm sure, by all the residents of LA County. Thank you. Thanks, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Um, just very quickly, I first of all, I want to thank Dr. Ferrer for you know making the declarative statement that we should pro we should postpone non-essential gatherings. I know there were several members of the public who call every other week, uh, telling us that it's time for us to come back. And I think Dr. Ferrer's point today um, is that it's not appropriate. Um, that we don't want to put ourselves, county staff, or members of the general public. Uh, we are still meeting. The public still has access to the agenda and has access to call in and provide public comment. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Ferrer for making that declarative statement about non-essential indoor gatherings um, very, you know, should be postponed. Um, secondly, I thank you for your clarification on circumstances in which we should test, because I agree with you, Supervisor Hahn, everybody, testing is the new name of the game. But acknowledging that we have limited supply, um, we should all also all be clear about circumstances under which we should test. And it's not, as Dr. Ferrer said, test to party. I love that and we will be quoting you regularly, Dr. Ferrer. Um, it's not about testing so I can go out and engage in high risk behavior. Um, so thank you for clarifying the circumstances and the situations in which we should prioritize testing. I have a question um, because, well, first of all, Dr. Galley, I understood from the mayor last week that the city was going to reopen three city sites, testing sites. Do you know if that's happened? I know it's a drop in the bucket, but if they reopen three, that's three more than we didn't have. I don't know, but I will check with my testing team and I will get back to you. Okay, Here's excellent. He, he made that commitment, and so I'm, I'm hoping that... Um, that they've been able to stand up those testing sites again. 
So my question is, I, I looked at the map. I've seen the testing sites per supervisorial district. And I have a concern, and I'm not sure if looking at the county-only map is really the best way to judge. And I have a concern about the equity of the distribution of the sites. When I look at the second supervisorial districts, we have, according to your data, we have eight county sites, and yet we've got, you know, 30% of the um, positive tests. You know, compared to other districts, District 1 has 16 sites um, with about 27% positive, um, positivity rate. District 3, 10 sites, 4, 10 sites, District 5, 12 sites. Um, and District 4 and District 2 have the highest test positivity rates. So it's not about trying to take sites away from other districts. It's about making sure that we are open, opening sites where they are needed the most based on test positivity rates. So is there a map where we can see not only the county test sites, the state city test sites, but also all of the private pop-ups to really get a sense of coverage and the equity of testing sites across the entire county? Yes, Supervisor, thanks for that question. Uh, it's a great question. I'm not sure which map you were looking at, but the map that is in, for example, the slide presentation that I presented on slide 16 does include all of those additional sites, um, including the ones that are operated by the private partners in, over and above the state operated sites and county operated sites. That map that I that I showed there is a little outdated. We're in the process of updating a new one. Um, I, I ran through very quickly in my comments. Um, there's a number of sites that are being added, and it's changing. I kid you not on it on a daily, hourly basis. In between the additional Optum Serve sites, the additional core sites, the additional sites the county is launching, the new pickup and drop off location sites. Uh, as well as other sites that are launched by by private testing partners on top of the federal sites that we don't have cited yet. So we will update that map. We're also happy to uh, put together some additional analyses that look at it by supervisorial district and that look at it by some of the criteria that have been put out there by testing for testing need, looking at test positivity rates and case rates and do some analyses that are by supervisorial district uh, and happy to share those with your team and obviously with all of the other uh, offices as well. Uh, we want to increase testing. I mean, you mentioned this and I just want to wholeheartedly agree. This isn't about shifting resources. This is about adding and yes. adding resources where they're most needed. And I think you'll find that the, the new maps, once we can put them together, provide a more updated picture of where the capacity is, but then we'll keep your staff uh, in the loop on where we are continuously citing those new resources. And then also on top of the 13 pickup and drop off locations that started yes, that, that were live yesterday. And we think, again, this is a model that really could be much more scalable. Uh, and so using whether it's DHS sites or FQHCs or libraries that are located uh, more broadly in a distributed fashion across the county could also really provide more capacity for those areas that have more demonstrated need. And, and I agree, there's a number of them. South LA is one, it's not the only one, but it's it's certainly an area where we want to ramp up additional capacity. I appreciate that. And as we expand sites, I think we've got to expand tests. So for example, at Ted Watkins in my district today, People queued up at 7.30 a.m. and by 9 a.m. all the test kits were gone. Um, yeah. I, think, I think 300 were allocated per day. And so it's not only expanding access, but making sure we've got enough supply per site to meet the needs of the people who are showing up. I'm, I'm sure that's very frustrating to queue up and then to, to walk away with nothing. And so uh, yeah. where are we in terms of expanding the number of kits available per site? So we're working, so those pick up and drop off locations will will typically have about 500 kits per day right now. We are looking to add to that um, it, as much as the vendor can can manage. I will say, you know, vendors across the board are are getting tight on, on test kits, but we are looking to ramp those up. They have already committed an additional volume to us, which will allow us to add either more kits per site or more sites, depending on which way we want to do that. And we'll continue those conversations with your offices. Uh, we're also looking at executing contracts with additional vendors. 
Uh, there's a lot of logistics involved in setting up these vendor agreements and site agreements, but we um, have made connections with additional vendors that we believe have the availability of large volumes of test kits that can run in operation uh, along the magnitude that we need it. And so that will also help. And then finally, once we can launch again, the home testing program, that will just be another resource that's available. Even though it's capped, it will provide another resource that's available. I'm sorry to anyone that that went out to a site and, and had to experience it not getting a kit. That would be extremely frustrating. It's not something that we want anyone to experience. And we will work to ramp up capacity and the geographic access points just as fast as possible. Thank you. And one last question for me. I perhaps naively assumed when we were talking about sending home kits that they were the same as home testing kits <laughs> where you, you know, 15 minutes later got your own results. And so I didn't realize until recently that they were the kits that you have to mail in or now you're creating the drop up site. So the question is, how many days is it taking now as you relaunch that program um, uh, with the pickup sites January 12th, how many days will it take before uh, uh, a resident can expect to get their results back? Uh, the vendor is committed to 24 to 48 hours um, for a turnaround time. And people who are seeking testing because of symptoms or because of their close contact of a confirmed positive really should be staying at home and quarantining or isolating. Um, uh, if they're in another classification based on workforce, they can receive separate testing through their employer. So for the purposes of community testing, those individuals should be able to re remain home for the duration of the time in which they're awaiting their test result. But, but 24 to 48 hours is what the lab vendor has promised. Thank you and appreciate the two of you as always. Uh, really wanna encourage the public to look at the website because we're clear that this is changing sometimes by the day. So in terms of finding a test site location and understanding the quarantine uh, rules, under seeing and being familiar with the most current health um, uh, officer order is really important. So queuing into those websites are important. Any other questions before we wrap this presentation up, colleagues? Okay, seeing none. The report is received and filed and Supervisor Barger's motion is before us. It's been moved and seconded. The second was by Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, Supervisor Barger moved her own motion to approve this item. Again, that was a read-in motion, Supervisor Hahn. Mute. Executive Officer, please call the roll. I'm present, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm thank you, Supervisor Solis. I didn't see you. Okay. I know, my, I'm just adjusting. Thank Got you. it, that's all right. Well, we're glad to know you're here. And so the Executive Officer will include you in the roll call. Please call the roll. Supervisor Barger's motion is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. That item carries. We will move on to Agenda item three, addressing recreational vehicle encampments during COVID. And I ask that the item be held. And um, we've heard from constituents, providers, and law enforcement regarding the increase in RVs within the unincorporated areas of the county, in particularly these past 24 months. And I want to thank really everybody uh, who called in today and gave feedback on this important motion and recognize that we heard your calls to include fire, the fire department, as they are often our first responders to emergencies. So we also recognize the importance of fire being a part of the conversation. So I wanna propose an amendment, colleagues, to the first and second directive to add the fire department. Within the homeless system, RV encampments require a tailored approach because people are sheltered However, our residential and commercial neighborhoods are not set up to have RVs parked and occupied permanently. In 2018, this board received a report on RV encampments and recommendations for addressing them. We are all painfully aware that the world around us has changed tremendously since then with COVID-19 um, and the rate at which Angelinas are finding themselves unhoused um, and the public call to address it. 
With absolute urgency, the Board of Supervisors, I believe, must receive an updated report to better understand the problem we're facing, its scope, and magnitude. Our unhoused constituents living in these RVs find themselves in a situation where they have nowhere to go. The county does not have locations for the functioning RVs to be parked, which is why I included revisiting RV safe parking sites in this motion. Currently, people living in RVs have limited options to keep their shelter. Either they stay in their current conditions or give up their RVs and end up very likely in tents on the streets. Another dynamic we're seeing is an entirely new underground economy emerging on our streets where people um, are illegally obtaining RVs from tow yards or neighboring states and rent them out to our unhoused residents, many of whom uh, either suffer from mental health issues or disabilities um, or fear uh, around accepting housing services that might complicate or call into question their documentation status. So many of these groups of people fall victim to these unscrupulous, if you will, RV, RV landlords, to use that term loosely. We continue to see RVs being set on fire when people living in them are unable to pay their rent to the RV owners. The amount of crime that has increased around RV encampments is unprecedented. The Sheriff's Department reported a 68% increase in calls to their stations regarding crime within and around RV encampments. This is really an entirely new crisis that we need to address with absolute urgency for the health and safety of all of our residents, those who live in around RV encampments and the residents in the encampments themselves. I want to stress that the goal of the motion is to collect the data and identify funding sources to make sure the county has an RV encampment program that ultimately will lead to housing and supportive services for the people who are staying in these uninhabitable, dilapidated RVs and eliminates the recirculation of these RVs by towing and dismantling them. We will not simply tow away and displace encampments or move RVs from one area to the other. We have to solve for the core problem. I currently fund the Vehicular Homeless Outreach Program in the 2nd District. This program is operated by St. Joseph Center, one of the county's leading homeless service providers. They have reported that approximately 40% of the RVs on our streets are currently inoperable with uninhabitable living conditions. With this motion, the county can build on the learnings of the VHOP program and improve our overall engagement and cleanup process. I ask for your support of this motion. Any members who have questions or want to make comments? Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for authoring this motion and bringing it before the board today. Many of these proposals address issues that occur within the 5th District, theft of RVs and trailers, the resale of junk RVs, and increased crime reported around RV encampments. Additionally, my district has been facing issues surrounding illegal RV dwellings and unauthorized RV sewage disposal for some time, even when we provide free services for them to do the um, dumping. Most of our RV encampments are on vacant parcels in the desert or rural areas, at the edges of Lancaster, Palmdale, and in Santa Clarita. I'm especially saddened that we've seen an increase in abuse and exploitation against the individuals living in and renting these RVs. I do agree with you that the June 2018 report needs to be reevaluated and brought current to reflect and address these realities. However, I do wanna share my concerns and I'm gonna support the motion today, but I just wanna share my concerns regarding the second directive to explore and pilot safe RV parking lots um, on county parcels. The county and many of the agencies highlighted here are currently experiencing staffing challenges, which have been causing delays when addressing homelessness issues that are currently in play. Not to mention many of our service providers and outreach staff are facing ad additional bandwidth challenges in the wake of the new COVID surge. My district has experienced this firsthand with most recently in the Castaic area where we have, have we, we've had challenges responding to community concerns around growing people experiencing homeless populations and encampments that have popped up. Because of this, I am hesitant to commit the county and our already limited resources toward a countywide RV safe parking program without the proper infrastructure and staffing to ensure it is run efficiently, effectively, and really um, with outcomes that, that are what we want to achieve. Haphazardly run government pilots and programs only fuel the frustration of our constituents 
and the people experiencing homelessness populations that we did that we have designed to help. Additionally, many of the county parcels in my district and the surrounding rural communities that I believe should have input on this process. I would like to suggest, and I'm going to do it, um, that we consider approaching our neighborhood councils. I've inherited some new neighborhood councils, but also town councils to solicit their feedback before pursuing a safe parking site on nearby parcels. This community in, 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 coupled with evaluation and centralized safe RV parking within specified regions may be a more productive pathway to explore. By re re regionalizing the effort, we may be able to minimize the challenges of numerous RV sites spread throughout the county. This effort could be strengthened by a county ordinance that prohibits RV parking except in these designated locations. I'm looking forward to the report back in this motion as it aims to address some very, very serious concerns that have been happening within my district. I just ask that we be thoughtful about how we move forward once the recommendations have been submitted. Um, and I'm not saying that we're not going to, I'm just putting that on the record. Um, but I wanna thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for bringing this motion forward. I think it's an important motion that's gonna impact um, people experiencing homelessness, but I think it's gonna be a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Solis, followed by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I also want to uh, join you in supporting this motion uh, that you're putting forward today. This has been an issue that uh, we have seen grow uh, tremendously in the first district and especially throughout the course of the pandemic. In particular, we've seen an increase in illegal parked RVs in East Los Angeles, the unincorporated areas, as well as city terrace. In my district alone, we know that there are many parked vehicles that are across the street from schools that raise concerns around children. And also uh, with respect to um, neighborhoods where we find that some of the RV owners will allow for their waste to fall into our sewage and, and human waste as well. That has been a big problem now for a couple of years. So I'm very happy that we're beginning to go down this road. It, it continues to be of concern because when the city of LA begins to move people out of the city in RVs, typically they come into unincorporated areas. And we've seen that exacerbated even around the Edelman courthouse right below that in the city terrace area. We, we need to make sure that LASA and our homeless initiative uh, does sufficient outreach to those individuals that uh, can help uh, them identify better solutions that'll be beneficial for those people that are also living in those RVs because in many ways that is their home. And we do need to uh, find uh, assistance, wraparound services, and really get our host teams as well as the sheriff more engaged in this. So I applaud your efforts. I look forward to working with the CEO, Homeless Initiative and the Department of Public Works, the Department of Regional Planning, and of course, uh, obviously all our other county partners. So uh, I intend on supporting this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm also supportive of the motion. Uh, I may have a slightly different take, though, about safe parking. We have um, instituted a couple of safe parking places. This was not for RVs, but for families living in their cars, and we're not really safe on the street, and found that it, um, although, yes, we did have to provide additional services, uh, we contracted with some um, community-based organizations to provide uh, outreach and counseling and seeing if there was some way to find some housing for people. And it was a very good way to have them on site to get that counseling rather than having to find them all over the city. Uh, we also did sanitation um, uh, concerns and uh, security. Uh, it wasn't a big investment, but it was very, very useful. And I think that um, if it's possible, perhaps we can help our constituents and neighbors understand that it's really safer for them in a way to have safe parking areas rather than people just scattered all over the streets around their neighborhoods because there are services, there's sanitation provided and security. And I think that that's what we will find as we look to establish some of these. So, um, you know, this is a really good step for exploring uh, a better way to do it. And um, 
I do believe in asking our constituents how they feel about these things. But just as we saw with a lot of the testimony today about don't bring those terrible young juvenile offenders into my neighborhood um, where they've been all along anyway, um, people are often much more likely to say, no, I don't want it, don't do it here. We've seen it with housing, we've seen it with affordable housing, we've seen it with, you know, uh, services for homeless people. I don't say that people are not righteously afraid, but I think that their propensity often is to say, please just don't do it anywhere near me. Um, and that's the hard part, I think, of public policy is having to find the solution to keep everyone around people safe, but to help people get services. And I do think that in many ways, the safe parking approach uh, is a positive one and a win-win. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing uh, no one else who wishes to be recognized and see no other, hear no other comments, item three is before us. I will make the motion and ask that it be seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve this item as amended. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item three is as amended is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next two items that we're presenting together. Item two, response to the Carson sewage incidents in coordination with the LA County Sanitation Districts. And item six, assessing the LA County Consolidation, Consolidated Sewer Maintenance District. We'll start with uh, item two, colleagues. Today I'm introducing a motion in response to the Sanitation District sewage spill in Carson over the New Year's uh, holiday week. I'd like to thank Supervisor Hahn for co offering this motion with me. We've worked side by side to try to help the residents of Carson and the neighboring area. Uh, uh, in the last several months. So first to the residents of Carson whose homes were impacted by the spillage, I want you to know that we will continue to do everything we can to help you recover. The last three months have been unacceptable for your community after the Dominguez Channel odor emergency and now 8 million gallons of sewage that spilled on your front yards. It's important that you know that we have demanded that the Sanitation District, the Department of Public Works, and all our partner agencies take extra precautions in recovery efforts so that we may avoid compromising the recovery efforts of the odor emergency. Our partners have assured me this is top of mind and today's motion helps us keep a close eye on that progress. Colleagues, this incident occurred as a result of a sewer pipe failure managed by the sanitation districts, which as you all know, the Board of Supervisors does not directly oversee. However, Supervisor Hahn and I have been working closely with the sanitation district staff. We've requested the sanitation districts perform an investigation into the exact cause of this incident. We've also asked the districts to provide details on their response to the incident as an opportunity to learn from this incident and plan accordingly in the future. During public comment uh, earlier today, someone commented that these kind of incidents happen all the time, and I just really want to correct that. Before sewer lines were regulated by the federal EPA, sewage spills were much more common. Now, both the state and federal government oversee strict guidelines of regular inspections and maintenance, and sewage spills occur much less frequently. We also know that the sanitation district actually conducted a routine video inspection of the pipeline on December 1st of last year, just weeks before it failed, and were given no cause for immediate action as a result of that inspection. So I'm anxious to hear from the sanitation districts what our routine inspection might have missed and how we can learn for the future, which is why in a letter to the sanitation districts that Supervisor Han and I um, last week, we've asked the executive director of the sanitation districts to appear before this board with their initial findings of the investigation. I want to thank our county departments um, for their swift work to aid in the response to this incident. With today's motion, we will direct our county departments to aid in the sanitation district's investigation 
and any resulting impacts that the incident may have, let, may have had on our residents. I ask for your I vote in this motion. Since we're hearing them together, Supervisor Hahn, I'll punt to you um, for you to go ahead and present, either speak to motion item two, and then go ahead and present item six. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you for asking me to co-author uh, item two, this motion with you. Uh, it, it's unbelievable that a spill um, of this magnitude, I mean, you just can't believe it, right? Eight million gallons uh, of sewage was uh, leaked, and some of those photos coming from uh, Carson were just so disgusting. Uh, seeing what the residents uh, could actually point to this brown liquid flowing, uh, you know, by their curbside. I, I mean, it, it's unacceptable, but it's also dangerous. Um, and it, this spill not only caused an undue burden on the already overburdened residents of Carson, uh, but we had to close down many beaches in my district, including Long Beach, San Pedro, Rancho Palos Verdes, Neighboring beaches in Orange County also had to be closed because of the high bacteria levels. Um, normally, uh, it's hard to believe, but I actually do participate in the annual polar bear plunge on New Year's Day here in San Pedro. Uh, but it, I've been doing it now for over 20 years, but that event had to be canceled um, as a result of the spill. Personally, I was not that sad that I didn't have to don a bathing suit. Uh, on January 1st, but uh, there are a lot of people that look forward to that event every year. There's over 500 people um, that usually flock down to the beach to take that uh, first of the year dive into the ocean. Uh, Supervisor Mitchell and I, as she said, uh, sent a letter Monday to the sanitation districts asking them to uh, report back uh, to this board as well as to the uh, board of the sanitation districts. Uh, so uh, we can understand uh, what happened. And we want to make sure there are no issues in our Dominguez Channel. And uh, that's why I think it's important that public works and public health are included in that investigation. And this is a good time for not only the sanitation districts to address their aging infrastructure, but for us as a county um, as well. And that's why I authored uh, item six, along with Supervisor Barger, directing our Department of Public Works to report back to us in 30 days with an update to the conditions assessment of our consolidated sewer maintenance district. The district maintains 4,600 miles of mainline sewer within the unincorporated area and 37 cities across the county. And it's important that we are aware of any needed repairs that can help avoid a major spill. Uh, has less I feel like somebody needs to be muted. Um, could everyone please mute their mics with the exception of Supervisor Hahn? If all could mute their mics. Sorry, Supervisor Hahn, um, go ahead. Thank you. Um, this report, uh, and you know, uh, that we can be aware of any needed repairs that can help avoid a major spill in the future. And this report back will include a list of currently scheduled repair projects and a clear schedule for completion. Uh, and that's, I think, important. I think that's what we're gonna find out about the sanitation spill. Uh, you know, they, uh, they were sort of gambling at the amount of time it was gonna take to make the needed uh, repairs and, and they unfortunately ran out of time and we don't want that to happen anywhere else in the county. Um, we're also asking our department to perform routine inspections of these critical projects. Federal government, as you know, just passed this infrastructure bill. So we need our consolidated sewer maintenance district and our sanitation districts to be prepared to apply for and obtain some of the funding. And I've also made that clear. Uh, so I look forward to hearing the results of the investigation of the Carson incident and the report back about our own county infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn, are you okay with a, um... I want to get my terminology right, that the report backs come together for the two motions. Are you okay with that? You know, I think there's, I mean, I, I, 
I, I'm wondering if that's uh, what the departments want, because they really are kind of two different issues. One is specifically about the incident, and the other one is more broad uh, about our whole infrastructure in the county. So um, I don't think they need to come back together. And, uh, you know, maybe the departments can focus on one and then focus on the other, because they're they're related, but not really. They're, they're two separate, in my opinion, um, uh, requests that we're making. Supervisor Barker. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for allowing me to co-author this motion with you. You know, while the news of the Carson um, spill made the news, and it definitely was um, not only a health risk, but for the residents of Carson, I can only imagine. Um, I was notified about a situation in Glendale um, that while not as large as Carson, um, it impacted um, an area within Glendale and ended up going into our uh, flood control channels. And so that tells me that this is an issue that, that this board needs to look at um, moving forward, even with the inspections of those that we know are already in need of repair. Um, you know, these two examples um, demonstrate the potential significant impacts of sewer infrastructure failure and the impacts to all of our communities. Um, an audit of the county's consolidated sewer maintenance district system management program released in January of 2021 indicated that over 54% of sewer overflow events reached surface waters. Between January 2015 and December 2019, roots, grease, and debris accounted for 307 sanitary system overflow events alone. These statistics highlight the need to continually monitor and proactively maintain our infrastructure. A recent report card developed by the American Society of Civil Engineers for California's infrastructure graded wastewater systems at a C plus. And so I think that that, that is something that our sanitation district needs to look at as well. One of their key recommendations was the need for risk assessment through a set asset management programs. This motion, motion focuses on proactive maintenance and monitoring to ensure incidents like the one in Carson do not occur within the county's system. In addition, we need to proactively fund and build necessary capital improvements and to fight to bring state and federal resources to the county to address our aging and decaying infrastructure. I know that is something near and dear to all my colleagues on this board. And so, you know, one of the lessons learned I had was that the sanitation district, while they maintain that part of it, we in this county have a very active sewage system that we are directly responsible for as well. And so, again, thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for letting me co-author this motion with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other comments on items two or six? Seeing none, hearing no other comments, uh, I'll move item two. Ask that it be seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item two is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item six, colleagues, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item six is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Moving on to items 61A and 61B, establishment of a nuisance abatement ordinance for illegal cannabis operations and county code title eight, consumer protection, business and wage regulations, division two, business regulations amendment. We'll now move on to these two items, which were held by Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Barger. I'm gonna make this short and sweet because it has been a long morning. Um, I wanna thank my colleague, Supervisor Kuehl for co-authoring with me on this motion. In addition, I wanna acknowledge Cerise Steele in County Council who assisted significantly with this motion 
And I know we are all very familiar with her because she truly has been on the front line of addressing the illegal cannabis industry in L.A. County with the dispensaries that have gone up. So I want to publicly thank um, Rod. Uh, you've got a gem in Surrey. I have seen the impact of illegal cannabis grows, which has led to um, which is which has really led to serious concerns in the Antelope Valley and what it has done not only for the community in terms of public safety, but also from an environmental standpoint. We have clearly documented the impacts to the existing water systems at certain communities where these illegal operations are popping up. Illegal growths, though, are not just occurring in the open spaces of the Antelope Valley. Homes are being gutted and converted to indoor grows to grow hundreds of plants. Not only does this completely destroy the inside of the property, the chemicals and electricity needed to accommodate any indoor grow can be damaging to the environment and have the capability to cause an electrical fire. The chemicals used in an unregulated cannabis cultivation are dangerous to consumers. These products are not being sold in the black market. They are being distributed to dispensaries across California. My intention with this motion is to highlight the importance of working within the law. This motion is not about making cannabis illegal. This motion is about protecting the consumer and the community from the unforeseen impact of illegal cannabis cultivation. This is also about creating the administrative penalties to ensure that we deter the illegal operators with penalties that will make an impact. Under the current frameworks, the penalties are not um, under the current framework. The penalties are not severe enough to stop new grows and dispensaries from reopening their operations right down the street. And we've seen it up in the Antelope Valley firsthand. While we um, need to address potential for regulating cannabis, we must also take a strong stance against the black market of illegal operators who continue to flout our laws and create nuisances in our community. So I would ask for an aye vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, followed by Supervisor Solis. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank Supervisor Barger for bringing this important motion and allowing me to co-author it with her. I'm very, very supportive of efforts to enforce these laws that make the cultivation and the sale of commercial cannabis illegal uh, in terms of where they don't conform or where they have not followed our guidelines <clears throat> in unincorporated Los Angeles County. Uh, Large-scale illegal cannabis operations cause a huge public safety and environmental safety concerns. I want to particularly underscore how they dangerously threaten our water system because uh, it includes uh, water theft, uh, damage to our fire hydrants, just stealing water to make this happen. And this water is a great loss to our communities that are imminently threatened by wildfires, not only the water for their own use, but it's a high wildfire area. So regulation of these uh, operations is complex. And I realize the board recently committed to revisiting the 2017 recommendations on cannabis policy, but we have to continue to prioritize enforcement of our existing laws around commercial cannabis for the safety and the environmental concerns for our unincorporated communities. So thank you so much, and I ask for your I vote. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, Supervisor Barger and Kuehl for bringing this forward. It's such an important issue, and I really am appreciative because of the fact that we have 30-plus illegal dispensaries operating in the unincorporated area of East Los Angeles alone. So I am very happy that we are, are looking at this and going to take some very proactive uh, stance on it. So I wanna thank you and I know our residents are gonna be, are gonna be thrilled uh, to finally have some teeth in this uh, enforcement. So thank you and I support uh, the measure. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, thank you uh, for bringing this forward because certainly uh, illegal cannabis farms, dispensaries are definitely a problem. I know my office hears regularly from constituents who are very concerned about the unregulated uh, businesses in their neighborhoods. And I do know, Supervisor Barg, it's a big problem uh, out in Antelope Valley. We talked about that earlier uh, last year uh, about the, the, the stealing of the water. Um, 
And I, I realize that we really need to find a way to, you know, get serious and prevent these illegal businesses uh, from operating. I hope we don't uh, look at going back to harsh criminal penalties uh, that we saw in the past as it relates to this. Uh, but I do support uh, the ordinance that you're proposing today. Uh, but I do know that uh, providing a legal pathway uh, for people to grow, uh, produce, sell cannabis um, can help in some way to tackle the illegal market uh, by uh, making sure that we give legal options that will be safe and will be regulated uh, and maybe even taxed uh, by the county. Uh, but right now that doesn't exist. But I do know that uh, Supervisor Solis and I um, authored a motion directing our Office of Cannabis Management to give our board an updated recommendations for uh, legal cannabis retail growth regulation and enforcement in our unincorporated uh, areas. We just got that report back in December. And so I, next, I know the next steps for us are to next steps for us are to look at it and see if we want to create a pathway going forward. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I know that this uh, illegal uh, cannabis is a huge problem. And I know it's important for us to um, really address that together. Um, I wish we could have moved forward with both of those at the same time, cracking down on illegal while offering the pathway forward. But that's um, not the case. So. Uh, I'm definitely supportive of doing this because, again, I know the urgency of this issue, um, particularly for you, Catherine. Uh, so um, I will support this motion today. And then hopefully uh, we're going to be voting soon on uh, the idea of legally uh, providing options for cannabis businesses in unincorporated county. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to align my comments with uh, Supervisor Hahn. I agree. I think that uh, the county's lack of a uh, legal enforceable option has helped to breed a uh, uh, situation that this um, motion attempts to address. Uh, these are complex issues that continue to merit our full and careful deliberation and consideration. And when we get to that space after reviewing the report, um, that has been developed. Um, I certainly hope that uh, what policies we bring forward will be grounded uh, in equity and address the disparate impacts experienced by some of our communities with regard to the cannabis industry. I think um, a number of municipalities across the state, uh, some have done that well, some not so much. So hopefully by us working now to develop um, whatever the county policy will be, we will take advantage of um, learning what worked and what didn't work. So with that, again, looking forward to that ongoing conversation. Uh, I'm happy to support today, recognizing that soon we will come back with a broader motion to address the more complex issues of the cannabis regulation. Seeing no further comments or questions, item 61A, and 61B are before us. So we'll vote on 61A first. Supervisor Barg, you don't want to present separately on 61B. We can take them together. Your comments relate to them both? Yeah, the comments relate to them both. You're good with that? So let's go ahead yes. and take our first vote, first vote in 61A. It's before us, moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. 61A is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries, five to zero. Uh, now we'll take our vote on 61B. It's been moved by Barger, seconded by um, Solis to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 61B is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Perfect. Motions carry. We'll return to item four, sanitation appointments made by the chair of the Board of Supervisors. 
Um, Executive Officer, please state the abstentions. On item four, Supervisor Hahn will abstain from voting on the appointment for Sanitation District Number Nine, and Supervisor Barger will abstain from voting on the san on the appointment for Sanitation District Number Seventeen. Item four is before us is revised. Uh, I'll move, seconded by Supervisor Solis, to approve this item, with the exceptions noted. Executive Officer, please call roll. Item four is revised. It's before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries, five to zero. I move to bifurcate the appointment to Sanitation District 7. Oh, we don't need to do that because we just did it. All right, how about that? We'll move on to specials. At this time, it would be appropriate to hear from supervisors on items not on the posted agenda. Supervisor Kuhl? You have a read-in motion for us? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to read this motion in for us to consider and uh, vote on at our next regular board meeting on the 25th. Um, the title of the motion is Restricting Outside Employment for Members of the Board of Supervisors. And here's the preamble. Uh, democracies at all levels of government depend on public confidence to maintain their legitimacy. It is a basic principle that public office is a public trust, which must not be endangered by self-interest overriding the public good. In that sense, ethics and democracy are intertwined and ethics make democracy work. So there can be a safe debate on the substance of public policy. Although California's Political Reform Act establishes statewide conflict of interest standards and general financial disclosure requirements, many other ethical issues are regulated at the local level. An effective ethics infrastructure requires political commitment and an effective legal framework. A crucial element of an effective legal framework is regulating earned income from outside employment. Such regulation addresses the incompatibility of government work with other compensated employment self-interest from an outside employment, which could differ from the public interest, and outside employment, which could take away time and effort at the expense of government work. As the largest county by population in the state, we have to do everything to reverse declining public confidence in all governmental institutions. The county would do well to follow the lead of other local governments, like the city of Los Angeles, and restrict elected officials' ability to earn outside income. In doing so, we must define ethical lines to allow for clear interpretation and enforcement. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors instruct County Council to report back within 14 days on options to restrict the Board of Supervisors from earning compensation from any outside employment. Thank you, Madam Chair. That will be on the agenda for uh, January 25th board meeting. Thank you very much, Supervisor Kuhl. At this time, it would be appropriate to hear adjournments. And the order today will be Supervisorial Districts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 1. And so I'll begin by asking that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Helen Elaine Saunders McKnight. Mrs. McKnight, a dedicated and passionate educator, was born on Ju June 24, 1928, in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., and tragically, painfully passed away this December 21st at the lovely age of 93 here in her um, home of Los Angeles. At an early age, she realized that she wanted to become a teacher when she grew up, and to fulfill that dream, she attended Miners Teachers College and began teaching in Washington, D.C., she there met and married her soulmate, James W. McKnight, who was a Tuskegee Airman, and they had two sons, Byron and James. After relocating to Los Angeles, she continued to pursue her education and began teaching for LAUSD. Throughout her illustrious career, she would promote to school administrator, vice principal, and principal at LaSalle Avenue Elementary School. She also received numerous distingu distinguished awards, including Teacher of the Year and Principal of the Year. She will be remembered as a fearless leader who worked tirelessly 
so that her students realize the power and importance of education as a tool for attaining success and accomplishing their goals. She was a proud lifetime member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, as well as a member of the California Retired Teachers Association, Associated Administrators of Los Angeles, and the Congregational Church of Christian Fellowship, which is pastored by her son, James. He leaves behind to cherish her memory her two sons, daughter-in-law Denise, granddaughters Jade and Rachel, siblings Juanita and Frederick, and a host of extended family, friends, her proud sorors, all who will miss her dearly. We'll move on to Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I uh, apologize to my colleagues. I actually have 11 uh, adjournments today. We've lost some really amazing people. Um, but I want to start with the hardest one for me, um, Dwayne Hickman. Uh, everybody knows, I think, that Zelda loves Dobie. And frankly, here I am 70 years later, and I still love him. Uh, and I'm, I'm really hit by this loss. Although he was 87, he had Parkinson's, you know, you, you kind of expect it, but it doesn't help. Uh, Dwayne was an actor, a great straight man, um, producer, a, t a television director. Uh, I first met him when he actually had a guest shot on the Stu Irwin show, which was my the first series that I was on. I probably was 11 years old, uh, and he had a guest shot on the show. And then a few years later, when he was doing the Bob Cummings show, I had two guest shots on that show. So by the time I showed up for my interview... Uh, for the part of Zelda Gilroy in the brand new series that hadn't even gone on the air yet, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, uh, both Dwayne and Rod Amato, who directed Bob Cummings' show, knew me. So it was not that hard to get the part. Um, I want to say about Dwayne, you know, he read all of his credits uh, in the paper, I hope. Um, he uh, was in movies as a kid. Uh, he was including the Grapes of Wrath, where he was an extra because his older brother, Daryl, had a part in it. Uh, but in 1959, when he got the part uh, in Dobie Gillis, he became kind of an iconic uh, first time sort of teenage star in a show that was about what it was like to be a young person. All of the comedies before that, you know, Father Knows Best and Ozzie and Harry, it was really all about the parents and, oh, the kids were secondary, but this was a show about us, about Dobie and Zelda and Maynard and um, uh, Chatsworth Osborne Jr. and all of us who were so different from each other. And it was extraordinary in the way it approached our friendships because we would have wacky and silly adventures all through the show, but then at the end, it was always the friendship that counted. Um, I, I, I want to tell just one story. Dwayne and I worked together on that show for four years. We loved each other so much and never had a fight except once. Uh, late in the like the third season, there was starting to be talk maybe about Dobie and Zelda thinking about marriage. Uh, they were in junior college and, you know, it was time. Uh, of course, Zelda was the only one thinking about it, not Dobie. And Dobie and Maynard took a job on a ship, like a cruise ship, and Zelda um, stowed herself away on board in order to trick Dobie into marrying her so that, because the captain of the ship could do the marriage, right? So I won't tell you how, but she, she kind of tricked him into proposing. And then just before the ceremony, they're you know all dressed up, and she says to him, I, I can't do this, which was sort of the way our show was. We had to be honest with each other at the end. I tricked you. I don't feel right about this. So we were rehearsing the scene, and I was being very serious about it. And Dwayne said to me, you're going to play it like that? So serious? It's a comedy show. And I said, yeah, I'm going to play it that way. It's serious about our lives. So we had this fight, and for the only time in my life ever, I stomped off the set. So I went to my dressing room, and 15 minutes later, there's a knock on my door. I open the door and it's Dwayne standing there with a dozen red roses. Now, where do you get a dozen red roses in 15 minutes? I have no idea. But it's like, send everybody out and find roses. 
And he uh, said, I'm really sorry, you're right. Actually, you're only sort of right. Can we kind of have it be serious, but not like creepy? So we agreed, we went back and we did the scene, but you know, I'll never forget his generosity as an actor. He gave us all the laughs. He played straight man and gave us all the laughs, but he was a great star and a great friend and a wonderful, wonderful man. So rather than read all of his credits, that's what I want to say about my friend, Dwayne Hickman. Uh, and I think uh, Supervisor Solis, you asked to join in, but I, I wonder if you'd all join in because yes. it's like family, you know. Yeah. I, we grew I, up. <laughs> anybody want to say anything about Dwayne? Don't have to. I love I love your picture, Sheila, with you and him, uh, and you know all the memories and um, you know what's his name Gil Gil Gilligan's Island. Oh my God, I can't. I'm just cracking up, just cracking up watching all that because I know I was a little kid watching that. So. Thank you, and um, God blessed him. He was a very talented individual. Thank you. Yes, he, he's uh, survived by his wife, Joan, and their wife, Albert, and uh, Dwayne actually had a son by a previous marriage, John, so our, you know, as we say, our hearts go out to them. Um, yes, second, thank you. I want to join. Thank you for letting us join. Um, I, I texted yesterday and said, boy, I mean, I love the many loves of Dobie Gillis and you being the greatest of, of those loves. You were both lucky to work with each other. Uh, and your stories that you told today were just what, fantastic. Thank you. We uh, May he rest in peace. You know, he was also a great painter. Uh, of uh, like uh, county estates. He started doing that for a while. He, uh, he's collected in various museums and uh, just, I don't know. It was just his kindness though. You know, you just, I don't know. Um, I also ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, there's gonna be a real entertainment theme going through this. He died on January 6th. Um, and his very first introduction to movies started when he was eight years old because his father took him to see silent movies at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, even by the age of 80, he was in love with movies, sound and silent alike. And from the age of 12 until about 30, he actually kept a file of index cards in the old days when you would write out index cards, one per picture, evaluating from the age of eight every movie that he saw. Uh, and in the end, he put together 5,000 cards. His directing career began at the age of 20. He directed an off-Broadway revival of The Big Knife, starring Carol O'Connor. And around this time, he began writing about film uh, for publications like Esquire and the Saturday Evening Post and the French magazine, Cahiers du Cinéma. He helped uh, program Golden Age Pictures for the New Yorker Theater, which was a Manhattan revival house, as well as for MoMA. But in 1964, he left New York, who wants to produce films in New York. No, where do you go? California, Hollywood, where he was hired as a second unit director and rewriter by Roger Corman. And in 1968, he directed his first feature, Targets, for Roger Corman, which drew very wide critical praise. And this triumph led him to be hired to direct The Last Picture Show, which I think is the time when all of us started to really be familiar with his name. It got eight Oscar nominations and catapulted him into the first rank of Hollywood directors. He's most known for directing uh, wildly successful movies like What's Up Doc with uh, Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill, uh, Bringing Up Baby, Paper Moon. Um, he survived by his sister Anna and his two daughters, Antonia and Alexandra. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory and honor of Richard Charles Carson, who died on uh, December 19th. As a student at the University of Nebraska, he acted in productions on campus and in the community theater in Lincoln. Graduated in 52, having majored in speech and radio and was named best announcer by his national honorary radio fraternity. Did a summer internship at KGOR in Lincoln, was a program director for the University of Nebraska radio station. After he graduated college, he joined the Navy became a lieutenant, was assigned to the USS Romulus as operations and communications officer and left the Navy in 1956, served in the reserve on inactive duty as a lieutenant, 
uh, for an additional 11 years and then was transferred to the retired reserve. His naval uh, service was always a great source of pride to him. After that service ended, he began to work not in radio, but in television. At San Diego television station, KOGO TV, the local NBC affiliate, he first worked as a floor man for local programming and then began directing commercials and local news and sports shows. When a summer job opportunity as a stage manager and associate director for ABC in LA became available in 1960, he commuted to fill it and within months took a permanent position directing children's programs, including Chucko the Birthday Clown, later moved on to directing the Soupy Sales Show. Who remembers Soupy Sales? We all do. So he got a call in 1962 regarding a possible job on the New York-based Tonight Show, went on an interview knowing that he'd been suggested by a young man who would soon be, but was not yet, the star of the show, who nobody'd heard of, named Johnny Carson. His credits were largely unknown by the interviewer, who, as a courtesy to Johnny, had agreed to have a chat with the performer's younger brother, Richard, found that the young man had some actual good directing experience and was willing to relocate to New York, begin a new job before Johnny himself started a long career on the show. So Richard directed a lot of celebrity guest hosts during the weeks before Johnny was free to begin his tenure and proved himself to be creative and professional and skilled at directing musical talent and showing artists at their best. Uh, he directed guest authors and actors and politicians, even animal acts, um, and all of the comedy sketches that Johnny himself did. For seven years, directed The Tonight Show, came back to California to direct The Don Rickles Variety Show, did freelance work directing episodes of Arthur Godfrey's Your All-American College Show, an award-winning episode of Get Smart, and The Sammy Davis Show. He was hired as a director on the Merv Griffin Show in 72 and continued that until 86 when Merv retired. He also began directing Griffin's popular Wheel of Fortune game show, which he did for 22 years. So his 43 long career, including directing thousands of television shows, he received five Emmy Awards. He survived by his wife, Carlin, and their three children, Douglas, Christopher, and Kathleen. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Dr. Conwell Carter, who received an MD from Howard University College of Medicine in 67, began his residency at the U.S. Naval Hospital in San Diego, where he was medical officer on the USS Jason. He was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Commander, practiced medicine at Camp Pendleton, and in 75, began his private practice by joining the staff of Cedar sinai eventually became an associate clinical chief of obstetrics and gynecology, specializing in gynecologic surgery and high-risk obstetrics. He concluded his career as chief of obstetrics and gynecology at Cornell Scott Hill Health Center in Connecticut. Throughout his 40 years of practice, Dr. Carter advocated for the holistic patient care of women. He was a diplomat at the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology and a fellow of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He served as an official, uh, in an official capacity as teacher to interns and residents and informally as a mentor to his younger colleagues. He never sought formal recognition for his work with patients and students, but he still received numerous patient satisfaction awards, including the 2009 Patient's Choice Award from Cedar sinais Hospital, in addition to several medical students' core clerkship teaching awards. He was a lifelong champion of a woman's right to make decisions regarding her own health and well-being. He founded a family planning center in San Diego early in his career. He supported Planned Parenthood with his professional expertise and financially. And even though he practiced in a large metropolitan area, he remained a community-oriented doctor. During the years that he and his wife lived on Howland Canal in Venice, neighbors knew that they could count on his skills and his compassion. He survived by his wife, Evelyn, and their three children, Kristen, Kaya, and Caleb. 
And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of David Epstein, a lawyer, a political staffer, a philanthropist. After graduating UCLA Law School, he specialized in sports law, representing clients like world heavyweight champion Ken Norton, LA Rams and Indianapolis Colts record-setting running back Eric Dickerson, among others. Subsequently, David went to Sacramento to work on Jerry Brown's campaigns. He also worked with Gray Davis in the State of California Controller's Office, where he created the program to help the state enforce its unclaimed property law. As a result of the audit program he designed, the state increased its collection of unclaimed property from $2 million to over $100 million in one year. David founded the Unclaimed Property Clearinghouse, advised many states on the enactments of their laws on unclaimed properties. He authored Escheat and Abandoned Property Laws Survey and Analysis, which is distributed to every major public corporation in the nation. He also authored Unclaimed Property Law and Reporting Forms, a seven-volume treatise that covers state escheat laws. UCLA Law School was one of the many beneficiaries of his philosophy where, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of his philanthropy, where the David J. Epstein program in public interest law was named after him. He survived by his wife, Jane, his son, Matthew, and his twin brother, Dan. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Marie Humphreys, who throughout her life was active in business and philanthropy. After marrying her husband, Bob, she started and ran a public relations firm and a jewelry business and was instrumental in advising her husband in his role as CEO of Gray West. She was also involved with a number of charity organizations on the board of the Children's Bureau, the League for Children, and the National Arcs Foundation. Along with her two best friends, she founded a new chapter of Arcs, and her talent in PR helped the chapter to flourish. She'll be remembered as an avid traveler her whole life, sometimes leaving to explore the world for four months at a time. She also loved gardening, history, and animals. And she's survived by her two daughters, Dina and Gia. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of a great man and a great talent, Sidney Poitier. He was a trailblazing actor, but also an amazing civil rights activist. He was the son of a Bahamian uh, tomato farmer and the youngest of nine children. He spent the first part of his uh, childhood on Cat Island in the Bahamas, where he grew up in a home with no electricity, wore clothes made from flour sacks, never saw a car, never looked in a mirror, and had never tasted ice cream. To help support his family, he quit school at the age of 12 and became a water boy for a crew of pick and shovel laborers. His parents started to get worried about his increasing involvement in mischief, so at the age of 14, he moved to Miami and lived with his brother. He'd known nothing of segregation growing up on Cat Island, so the rules governing American black people in the South came as a big shock to him when he moved to Miami. It was all over the place, like barbed wire, he later said of American racism. And I kept running into it and lacerating myself. In less than a year, he fled Miami for New York, arriving with $3 in his pocket, took jobs washing dishes and working as a ditch digger, as a waterfront laborer, as a delivery boy in the garment district. In 1945, he was looking in the Amsterdam News for a dishwasher job, and he noticed an ad looking for actors in the American Negro Theater. He went there, he was handed a script, and told to go out on the stage. Uh, he had never seen a play, actually, in his whole life. He could barely read. He stumbled through his lines in a thick Caribbean accent, and the director marched him to the door. Bye-bye. Undeterred, he bought a radio. He practiced speaking English as he heard it from a variety of announcers. A fellow worker at the restaurant where he washed dishes helped him with his reading, and he finally won a place in the theater's acting school, but only after he volunteered to work as a janitor without pay. His lucky break came when another actor at that theater, Harry Belafonte, didn't show up for a rehearsal, which was being attended by a Broadway producer. Sidney took the stage instead and was given a part 
in an all black production of Lisa Strada in 1946. Unfortunately, it was panned by the critics, but it did lead with a job uh, to a job with the road production of Anna Lucasta. In 1950, he broke out on the screen in No Way Out and went on to star, as we all know, in Blackboard Jungle, The Defiant Ones, To Sir With Love, In the Heat of the Night, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and Lilies of the Field. His role in Lilies of the Field led him to become the first black actor ever to win an Academy Award for Best Lead Performance and the first to be a really big top box office draw. He transformed the way black individuals were performed, portrayed on the screen and opened the door to future generations. Few movie stars, black or white, had such an influence. Before him, no black actor had a sustained career as a lead performer or could get a film produced on his own star power. Of course, you can read in many books, but especially Harry Belafonte's autobiography, about Sidney's work in the civil rights movement and how he and uh, Harry Belafonte smuggled money into the South in order to support much of the movement that was going on, early civil rights movement. An extraordinary man, an extraordinary actor, uh, survived by his five daughters and by his wife, Joanna. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of another wonderful actor and comedian Bob Saget, who died on January 9th. He was at Temple University in Philly and he studied film. Uh, and the year of graduation, he got a Student Academy Award for documentary uh, merit for his film, Through Adam's Eyes, about a nephew of his who'd had facial reconstructive surgery. He wanted a career in comedy and he moved to LA, quickly made himself uh, a constant presence presence at the comedy store. And after a brief stint on the CBS show, The Morning Program, he appeared in a 1987 Richard Pryor film, Critical Condition, got offered a part on a TV show called Full House, Game Changer. On Full House, he played a widowed father who shared his house with his three daughters, his brother-in-law and his best friend, and became known as America's Dad. The show, which aired from 87 to 95, launched Bob and his co-stars uh, into the realm of household names. He earned his squeaky clean image on Full House and as the host of America's Funniest Home Videos. He directed a TV movie, For Hope, that fictionalized the story of how his sister, Gay, grew ill and died. He later became a board member of the Scleroderma Research Foundation and directed a comedy starring Norm MacDonald and uh, Artie Lang, Dirty Work. Returning to the comedy circuit, mocking his wholesome TV alter ego, he developed a cult following as a comedian, performing raunchy, profanity-laden stand-up routines, some of the best. In 2010, he hosted a documentary series in which he spent time with pro wrestlers and bikers and Bigfoot hunters, a really extraordinary talent. He survived by his wife, Kelly, and his three daughters, Aubrey, Lara, and Jennifer. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Kara Schneider, an LA uh, native product of Unified, LA Unified School District schools, graduated from Fairfax, went to UCLA, and wanted to teach in the city where she grew up, began working with LA Unified in 1987 as a bilingual teacher at Cherimoya Avenue elementary school in Hollywood. And after teaching for several years, he rose through the ranks, became an assistant principal, a principal, and eventually a director in local district Northwest. And along the way, she supported dozens of teachers and principals in their classrooms, guided several of them into a path of school administration, helped teachers secure the resources they needed to help their students thrive. In her last role at the district, she was an administrator of the Monroe Community of Schools, leading 20 schools in North Hills, Panorama City, and Northridge East. She was passionate about connecting with immigrant students and their parents and learned Spanish to help them with translations and connecting them with resources. When she considered becoming an assistant principal, she hesitated because she loved working directly with students. 
but she also knew she could further advocate for her students by taking a higher position. She was the principal of Noble Avenue Elementary School in North Hills, and her job, she said, was to instill joy in her students. So at the start of every week, before kicking off her morning announcements, she played Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles over the intercom. She'll be remembered as a teacher and administrator who spent all day finding solutions to problems so schools and kids could thrive. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of one of the greats, Betty White, television's golden girl, Betty White, who died on New Year's Eve. Her love for acting started in high school. She was a student at Beverly Hills High, and she appeared in several student productions and even wrote her class's graduation play in which, of course, she had the lead role. During World War II, she served in the American Women's Voluntary Services and drove a PX truck, which delivered soap, toothpaste, and candy to soldiers manning the gun emplacements the government had established in the hills of the Santa Monica Mountains and Hollywood. Did you know about those gun emplacements? Toward the end of the war, she was involved in the Bliss Hayden Little Theater, run by two Hollywood character actors, Leela Bliss and Harry Hayden. Look up their IMDb. They were wonderful too. It was designed to give young people a chance to perform in front of an audience. And her first performance there was in the comedy, Dear Ruth. And it was seen by an actor, uh, Lane Allen, who turned agent and encouraged her to pursue an acting career. So she broke into TV in 1949 and a local talk show called Al Jarvis's Hollywood on television, and then succeeded him as host. She had a few TV shows of her own in the 50s, including two sitcoms and a variety show, which she produced herself, but they were live shows. Um, none of those shows stayed on the air for long, but by the early 60s, she was best known as a very busy freelance guest uh, on game shows and then appeared on you know, Tell the Truth, I've Got a Secret, The Match Game, What's My Line, and Password. But she's best known for creating two of the most memorable characters in sitcom history, Sue Ann Nivens on the Mary Tyler Moore Show and Rose Nyland on the Golden Girls. Um, after the Golden Girls ended its seven year run in 92, she was a familiar and welcome presence on television, reprised the role of Rose Nyland on a short lived spinoff and made guest appearances. Um, from 2006 to 2009, had a recurring role on the daytime soap opera the Bold and the Beautiful, and was inducted into the TV Academy Hall of Fame in 95 and continued acting on television well into her 90s. But the most surprising and high profile role she played in her later years was when she hosted Saturday Night Live, a booking that came about because of a social media campaign where everybody kept trying to get Saturday Night Live to get her to be the host. She gleefully participated in sketches and I don't know if you saw it a week ago, it was shown again, but they were raunchy. She was amazing and gave SNL its highest ratings it had had like for years. That same year, she also returned to primetime series television as one of the stars of the TV land sitcom, Hot in Cleveland. And her performance on that show as a feisty caretaker got her yet another Emmy nomination. So in 2012, Betty White's Off Their Rockers a hidden camera show in which older people play pranks on younger people made its debut. She was executive producer. She kept working, she kept working, and she kept working. Thank goodness, because everything she did was golden. She had a long standing interest in animal welfare and in the early 70s participated and starred and produced the pet set. She devoted time and money to organizations like the American Humane Association and um, people are calling on us on her birthday, on January 17th, to call in and make a donation to pet shelter, to you know pet rescue hospitals, to anything having to do with animals. And I'm going to do it for sure. I thank you. Oh, I have one more. I'm sorry, I just got this for Marilyn Bergman. I'd like to, uh, can I also uh, uh, join you on Betty White? And I just wanted to add that she was such a friend of the city of Los Angeles, particularly of our zoo. 
And, um, you know, zoos are controversial. Some celebrities uh, claim, uh, you know, that all the animals should be in the sanctuary. But Betty really believed in her heart that a zoo was a way to educate the next generation on the importance of preserving and conserving um, animals, um, uh, you know, around the world. And she would always come to the zoo's annual fundraiser. Um, and I met her a couple of times at the zoo uh, where she was just unabashedly a fan of animals and the LA Zoo. She did more for that organization than I think anybody. Uh, so we will all, I, it's a great suggestion on her birthday to do something for the Humane Society. And I'd like you. to say on behalf of people like me who are old, that I'm very pleased that she was such a potty mouth all the way into her 90s and just was, it was like, I can talk about sex. I don't care how old I am. And I just, I don't know how appropriate it is to say so, but I just think that's a great thing. I loved her. I mean, she was just an amazing, funny, resilient talent. Uh, so I, I just found out and I wanted to adjourn uh, as my last adjournment in memory of Marilyn Bergman. I don't know whether people really recognize the name, but you sure as heck are gonna recognize her, what she did. She was a prolific lyricist. She was half of a songwriting duo with her husband, Alan Bergman, and they wrote the words for dozens of widely interpreted songs, including The Windmills of Your Mind, What Do You Do in the Rest of Your Life, Where Do You Start, and the Oscar-winning theme from The Way We Were. She was a member of the Songwriters Hall of Fame, best known for her songs about romance that always had striking visual imagery and also posed existential philosophical questions about romantic relationships. But she also vividly addressed other topics too, like in the windmills of your mind, a trippy conjuring of a bank robber's frazzled mental state and in the heat of the night with its stark vision of American racial strife. Her career stretched more than 50 years and she and Alan worked frequently with Legrand and Jones, uh, Henry Mancini, Marvin Hamlish. Uh, songs were recorded by virtually everybody you ever heard of. Streisand, Sinatra, Johnny Mathis, Tony Bennett, Diana Ross, Lionel Richie, Dusty Springfield, Sting, Gladys Knight. I mean, how'd you like to have that list of people singing your songs? And in addition to winning an Oscar, they won four Emmys, two Golden Globes, and two Grammys, including the coveted Song of the Year Award for The Way We Were. Outside of her career, she was deeply devoted to various organizations. She was the first female president of the performance rights organization, ASCAP, and held that position for 15 years. She was also a founding member of the Hollywood Women's Political Committee, which raised money for Democratic political candidates. Thanks, thanks. In 1993, she and her husband wrote material for President Clinton's first inauguration. She's survived by Alan and by their daughter, Julie. Uh, colleagues, I'm sorry this was so long and I'm sorry we lost so many people, but I thank you for your patience and ask um, that you join me in honoring these people. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Supervisor Kulin. If you would allow me to join you in the adjournment in memory of Sidney Poitier, I would be greatly honored. Absolutely, I would, I would love that. Anyone that wants to join in on any folks, Kathy? No, I, I agree. I, I, I do. First of all, Sheila, thank you for your adjournments. I mean, the way you tell the stories, um, Dwayne and then Sydney, I mean, it, it's truly um, amazing. And last week, since I had so, had so much time on my hands, I did, I watched, Lilies of the Field, um, to serve with love, which made me cry, um, and um, and was able to sit and just watch a bunch of his movies. And um, what an amazing man! His life, wow! So thank you, thank you for your adjournments. Thank you, Sheila. I, I too want to join you on uh, Sydney Portier, uh, and also uh, Betty White, and um, also with uh, David Epstein. I remember him and Marilyn Bergman, uh, all outstanding. Thank you so much for your poetic, <laughs> how could I say, description. Hey, and, I'm a trans beautiful. beautiful, can I tell you? <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you all colleagues and thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, and thank you for allowing us to join you. We'll move on to District 4, Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I would like to start uh, asking that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Jonathan Flagler, who was our LA County firefighter who tragically lost his life in the line of duty on Thursday, uh, January 6th, while fighting a house fire in Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, Jonathan was a 21-year veteran of the fire service, uh, serving 19 years with the city of Vernon Fire Department. And then when our county uh, fire took over that department, he spent the last two years as a Los Angeles County uh, firefighter. Um, he was the first firefighter to die in the line of duty while actively fighting a fire since 2009. So uh, it doesn't happen that much. And when it does, it's tragic. Uh, you know, we're still trying to find out uh, the circumstances of the fire. The residents who were in the house did get out safely, uh, which is our county firefighters first priority is always to save human life. And then people don't realize that their second priority is to save the structure. Uh, save, save the house. And that is tragically what he was attempting to do uh, when he lost his life. He survived by his parents, uh, whom I met uh, at the hospital last week, as well as his wife, who I met. And then he has two uh, teenage sons uh, who were 13 and 15. But listening to his family talk about him, it's clear he was you know, not just a firefighter, he was a great family member, he was a great dad. Uh, they spoke of how uh, when he wasn't on duty, he was obviously at uh, his son's uh, sporting events and their home was one where uh, all of his son's friends would come. Uh, it's a huge loss. Um, and I, it's amazing how our county family comes together. I know, uh, Supervisor Barger, you experienced that uh, with the loss of life at one of your stations. Um, from Dave Gelati on, uh, they really come together. I mean, within hours of him uh, being pronounced, um, they had the processional that went from uh, Harbor UCLA Hospital all the way to our coroner's office and to see how quickly they worked with the highway patrol and other cities, uh, closing down roads, uh, seeing the fire um, engines on our overpasses. I mean, it's clear that they were going to um, escort him uh, from the hospital all the way to the coroner's office. And they stand watch of one of their colleagues from the beginning to the end. Uh, it was very moving, um, but may he rest in peace and uh, we'll keep you all updated on when those services are. I'm assuming that since he was an LA County firefighter, we would all like to uh, be on this adjournment yeah. together. Please, I Supervisor do. Han. Yes, Madam please. Chair, can I just say, I, you know, I went to the candlelight vigil last night and Supervisor Han, you um, talking to his wife and his son Brody and Jack, yeah. and, um, her father or his father-in-law, Dwight, um, this is someone that truly was going places. Um, he was so committed to being a firefighter and committed to his community, and he was able to balance it all. And um, and I, my heart bleeds for his family, both mm -hmm. um, uh, Jenny and his kids, but also for our county family, because he was genuinely loved within the department as well. And I have to do a shout out to Acting Chief Maroney, who with Dave Jolotti yes. last night gave remarks on behalf of the board, by the way, acknowledged that the board um, uh, set their condolences, but um, he has truly stepped up and been a true leader during very difficult times. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Dennis. Yeah, and it's a good reminder for all of us that every one of our first responders, whether they're in law enforcement or uh, in uh, county fire, uh, really are dedicated and committed. And when that call goes out and they roll out, uh, they never know uh, what they're going to find or what's going to happen. And this was an example of, uh, you know, tragically 
um, doing doing their job, doing their duty, but unfortunately resulted in his um, his death. So we do mourn with his family on this. And Supervisor Hahn, if we could uh, just add that we made sure that uh, flags were flown at half staff at every county building in his honor. So just wanted to make sure we included thank that you. in the adjournment. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Station 83, where he was stationed, is in Rancho Palos Verdes. And it is a very beloved station. The, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes just adopted it. Like, that's our station. And you saw, you still see um, many fan, uh, community members showing up at the station with food, with flowers, uh, just wanting to, to let the other uh, firefighters who are there know uh, how important they all are to the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and how they they mourn along with them. It's been a great outpouring of support for that station. Supervisor Hahn, I just wanted to mention that I believe I met him in Vernon before that turnover to LA County because there was a whole ceremony and it was just incredible the camaraderie amongst these men and women there at the Vernon station as they were now becoming part of our county family. And I believe we have pictures of, of all that ceremony, but I just wanted to oh. tell you, his face was so familiar. So my heart goes out to, to him and his family. Thank you for everything that you've done. And I, I really appreciate our fire chief and, and of course, um, Gelati too, Dave Gelati. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Our interim chief, uh, Tony Maroney, was was unbelievable at the hospital. And again, this is when the county, we do have a county family. That is a real thing. Uh, we hear about it. We talk about it. It's a real thing, the county family. And the doctors and nurses at Harbor uh, worked valiantly to try to save his life when he was brought in. And again, they felt a part of the county uh, family. It's a county hospital. Those are county doctors, county nurses. And they felt it even, I think, uh, more deeply, the fact that they were working uh, on saving the life of one of our county firefighters. So it, it's a real thing, and it, it's a, a, a blessing uh, in, in times of need. Okay, thank you for that. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Carmen Martinez, uh, who was 90 when she passed away. Uh, she moved to Paramount in 1959, where she raised her family and instilled in them the importance of service to the community. Uh, she was a homemaker, uh, but after her children finished high school, she returned to the workforce as a teacher's assistant for Paramount Unified. And she enjoyed gardening, USC football, and was an active member of Our Lady of the Rosary Catholic Church. She's survived by her two daughters. Diane Martinez is a former Paramount City Council member and is now a member of the Paramount Unified School District Board of Education and has become a good friend of mine. And Annette uh, Delgadillo, her other daughter, who is currently a member of the Paramount Public Safety Commission. It's clearly a family uh, that believes in a family and church and public service. And... Um, I'm happy to adjourn for Carmen today. I also move that when we adjourn uh, today, we adjourn in the memory of Greg Stewart, who was 68 when he passed away. Um, he graduated from SC with a degree in business. Uh, Greg worked tirelessly to grow his family's commercial fishing business. And he is survived by his wife, Mary, daughter, Haley, and son, uh, Colin. And Greg was a friend of uh, Jody Bubica, who is a good friend of mine, grew up here in San Pedro, and she um, asked me to adjourn in his memory today. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Monty McDermott, uh, who was 53 when he passed away. Monty was a graduate of St. John Bosco High School in Bellflower and had worked at the school for 29 years, including the last 19 years as the director of athletics. As a senior in high school, he set a national record uh, versus Don Bosco Tech, hitting three home runs, two of them grand slams with 14 RBIs, which remains the state record. Monty returned to St. John Bosco in 1992 as a PE teacher, baseball and football coach. His tenure as athletic director was unrivaled under his leadership. Bosco won 52 varsity league titles, 79 CIF titles, 26 state championships, and 11 national titles. He is survived by his wife, Dolores, and their son, 
Monty Jr. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn the memory of Samuel Reese, who was born and raised in Wilmington, 69 when he passed away. He was the student body president at Banning High School and excelled at football and baseball. He attended Claremont Men's College and graduated with a BA in literature and earned his Juris Doctorate from, US, from UC Berkeley School of Law. His desire to promote student diversity kept him involved with Claremont Men's College throughout his life. Samuel was inducted into the college's Hall of Fame in 1996. He is survived by his wife, Judith, their three children, Justin, Sarah, and Morgan, and his grandson, Peter. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Vincent Perosi, who was 80 when he passed away. After graduating from Mary Starr High School, Vincent joined the U.S. Army Reserves and honorably served his country for six years. In his retirement, he loved gardening and teaching his grandchildren how to make his famous meatballs. He survived by his loving wife, Joyce Ann, his children, Vince and Lisa, and five grandchildren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my improvements. Thank you very much. And we'll proceed to District 5. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of John Campbell. John Campbell was a longtime team member of the California Club who recently passed away on December 28th. John was born in Charleston, South Carolina, the eldest of three children. He attended Johnson and Wales University where he studied hotel, motel, and restaurant management. He relocated to Los Angeles area and began working at the California Club in 2008. There, he was always a smiling face that worked in various roles, including captain, wine expert, and he began as a server. He was a loving brother to his sisters, Dana and Sandra, and his nephew, Jackson Cole. He was always proud to say that he was the number one Cowboys fan and never let you forget that that was a team he was going to root for. He will be missed by those whose lives he touched, especially my families. I also move that we adjourn in memory of Patricia Irene Carmody, a longtime resident of Saugus who passed away at the age of 89. She was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. She moved with her husband to Saugus in 1968, and she worked for William S. Hart Union School District as a library and teacher's aide for many years. After earning her teaching credential in 1980, she taught special ed at Placerita Junior High School and retired in 1991. She was active in the local Catholic church and the LA Catholic worker. Patty is survived by her children, Michelle, Matt, Jim, Liz, Pat, and her brother, John. Also that we adjourn to memory of Lee Cameron McDonald, a resident of Claremont since the late 1940s, who died December 29th, 2021 of natural causes at the age of 96. Lee was born in Salem, Oregon on February 25th, 1925. He was the only child of Lehman McDonald, a rural mail carrier for the U.S. Postal Service, and Mabel Duncan McDonald, an elementary school teacher. Lee and his wife, Claire, raised five children in Claremont. They celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary on August of last year. Lee McDonald was a professor of government and political theory at Pomona College from 1952 to 1990. He was dean of Pomona College from 1970 to 1975 and taught graduate seminars at the Claremont Graduate School, now Claremont Graduate University, until 2000. Professor McDonald won the Pomona College Whig Distinguished Professor Award twice in 1968 and 1989. The Whig Award is the highest honor bestowed on Pomona faculty and recognizes exceptional teaching, concern for students, and service to the college and to the community. After he retired, he and Mrs. McDonald both won Pomona College Alumni Service Award in 2009, recognizing their commitment and ongoing volunteer service to the school. He wrote a textbook, Western Political Theory, publishing the first part of it in 1962, later following with a complete text covering political philosophers from ancient to modern in 1968. He also published many articles over the years in academic journals. His topics included myth, religion, politics, private ethics, and civic virtue. Lee and his wife, Claire, were founding members of the Claremont Presbyterian Church in the mid-1950s. 
There he served in the church session several times and sang in the church choir for many years. He survived by his wife, Claire, daughter, Mary, and son-in-law, Jack, daughter, Allison, and daughter-in-law, Sandy, son, Paul, and daughter-in-law, Susan, five grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. Also, we're going to adjourn in memory of Barbara Joyce Musella, a longtime resident of Westchester who passed away at the age of 75. She was a beloved mother of Valencia businessman John Musella. She was born in Oregon. She graduated from Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane, Washington, and earned a degree in economics from the Washington State University in 1968. She moved to Los Angeles to accept a position with Security Pacific National Bank in their management training program. She was one of the first women to be admitted to the bank's program. She had a passion for helping others and helping her community. She served as the executive director of the Bob Hope USO and was made an honorary Rotarian and recognized as the Rotary Paul Harris Fellow for her contributions to Rotarians fighting human trafficking. She served as the Westchester Streetscape Improvement Association Board of Directors, where she helped secure millions of dollars for landscape improvement. She also served on the Washington University Southern California Leadership Council. She and her husband endowed a scholarship in their name to help provide financial support to WSU freshman students from California. Barbara survived by her husband, Richard, her daughter, Stephanie, her son, John, her sister, Arlene, and four grandchildren. Also that we adjourn in memory of Michael Parks, former editor of the Los Angeles Times and Pulitzer Prize winner who recently passed away at the age of 78. Michael was born in Detroit and worked as a reporter for the Detroit News while concurrently pursuing his degree from the University of Windsor in Ontario, Canada. Michael served as a foreign correspondent for the Los Angeles Times and the Baltimore Sun where he covered some of the major events of the 20th century. For 15 years, he served as a Times Bureau Chief in Beijing, Johannesburg, Moscow, and in Jerusalem. He was awarded the 1987 Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting for his coverage of South Africa. He was named editor of the LA Times in 1997. He taught at USC's Annenberg School of Communications for two decades and also served as director of the journalism school. John is survived by his wife, Linda, sons Christopher and Matthew, four grandchildren, and four siblings. Those are my adjournments, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Madam Chair, I don't have any adjournments. This is the uh, first district. Thank you very much, Supervisor Solis. And we're going to add you on to the ones that you requested earlier. So we thank you. Thank you. We'll thank take um, all the motions as seconded. And if there are no objections to a unanimous vote, that will be the action. At this time, this will conclude today's meeting. The next meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be a special closed session which will be held today uh, at 3 p.m. And a special closed session that will be held on January 18th, 2022. The next regular meeting of the board will be held on January 25th, 2022. Thank you very much for your participation in today's meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair.